All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, just a little bit more background. I did my PhD in clinical psychology in the mid and late 80s, and my program was, uh, was primarily focused on CBT and family systems therapy. And uh, when I graduated and went into, or when I went on to my internship, that's when I found out about Jung, a guy named Rich Patterson, who was a clinical psychologist, former Army psychologist. I did my internship in the Army and uh, was a recovering alcoholic, and he spoke quite eloquently about how Jung's writings uh, and Jung's interactions with Bill W. affected his recovery. And that's where I got interested in Jung, so that would have been about 1987-88. And uh, then I moved up to New York and was stationed at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point as the staff psychologist there and was able to start taking classes at the New York Jung Institute and uh, did a year with uh, Don Kalsch had, had an independent uh, program up there called the Professional Enrichment Program for Analytical Psychology. And I did a year there before deciding to enter uh, the Jungian training formally. Um, so I do have... Uh, other backgrounds that I come from, and this is this presentation comes out of uh, a presentation I wish I had received when I was in training. Uh, the, the notion of the analytic attitude is implicit throughout Jung's writings, but he never really makes many formal statements about what an analytic attitude is. And so, as we get through go through, so hopefully it'll become apparent why I think it's important. Uh, so I express it as a uh, unitary idea, the analytic attitude, but it's not really. In certain ways, it does feel as though it functions with a certain organic wholeness to me. However, as we'll see today, it's a plurality, a composite of many characteristics and values and ways of being. And the idea here isn't to take my idea about what an analytic attitude is and try to apply it, the idea is, hopefully, to, for it to stimulate your thoughts about what an analytic idea might be, what, how you might orient your practices, uh, your activities uh, around an analytic attitude. And I think it's something that actually goes beyond the therapy room. It's something that can be applied to life almost like uh, one would apply the notion of mindfulness, for example. Uh, so we won't have time to cover all the facets of the analytic attitude today. Uh, we'll be doing an abbreviated version of uh, this presentation that usually I give over a full day or sometimes two days. Uh, but we'll, we'll cover a number of the central factors that make up the analytic attitude. So just for my reference, how many people here are practicing therapists of some kind? Okay, the majority. And what the people who aren't, what, what fields do you come from that who, if you're not a practicing therapist? Okay. Okay, interesting. What draws you to Jungian thought from coaching? Okay, all right. All right. Well, hopefully there's some ideas here. It was interesting. I gave this same talk uh, in at the Houston Jung Center, uh, and uh, interestingly, the majority, probably maybe 50% of the people in the audience were practicing therapists. Uh, the majority were uh, teachers, administrators of social organizations, and actually they were the ones in, some, in many ways that got the most excited about this material, uh, even more so than the therapists. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's just good for me to know who who the audience is. Uh, so if there's, I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, if you've got questions along the way, even if it means we don't get through all of the presentation, it's. I think the nuance of it and uh, the importance of it actually comes out in the dialogue about things rather than the, the formal presentation. So I want to start with some questions. And at this point, uh, 
there are questions to begin to hold in your mind uh, as we go through this presentation. Like, what is analysis or analytic therapy? What makes it different from other psychotherapies or counseling? Is it different? What's the role of the analytic therapist in the process? What's your philosophy of analytic therapy? What's transformative in therapy? It's interesting, these are questions like what's transformative that everybody knows in the background and they have some idea about, but often there's not a point where you're forced to sit down and like put it on paper, for example. Try to put it on paper. On NPR, there was a series they did uh, on, several years ago, and they've stopped now on Friday mornings. They had a series called This I Believe. And the idea was that listeners would write in completing that sentence. This I Believe. And it, they could, it could be about anything, but it was really fascinating when you got to hear people sit down and articulate in writing, which were then read aloud, what they believed and why they believed it, how it became an orienting thing. Interesting, when I present this talk often, people don't have well-formed ideas about what's transformative in the therapy process, even though they may have been practicing therapy for 20 or 30 years. Are there identifiable goals for analysis and that we can agree upon across psychoanalytic disciplines? What are the aims or goals of Jungian analysis? Is analysis an art, a science, or both? What's the difference between a symbolic attitude and an analytic attitude? Is there such a thing as an analytic patient? What's the place of wanting to help the patient? What's the difference between what a patient says they want and what they need? What role does technique play in analytic therapy? Now, we tend to think in sometimes about Jungian analysis in terms of the things that are done in analysis, the activities. Dream interpretation, active imagination, picture interpretation, sand tray or sand play, studying patterns of comparative religion, myths, fairy tales, and alchemy. This is kind of the heady stuff that uh, Mike was uh, talking about at Zurich. Zurich tends to focus on a lot of that content, and it's wonderful content. Uh, but sometimes the, the candidates feel they don't know what to do with that content once they're in the consulting room. They have a whole repertoire of wonderful, rich, archetypal amplifications, but then they're not quite sure what to do with them in the consulting room. We have theories of analytical psychology, diagnosis, the understanding of psychopathology, the use of interpretation in the analytic in interaction. And yet, none of these things constitute, I would argue, what analysis is. Engaging in these activities doesn't make it analytic, necessarily. We need something to hold all of those things together. A roadmap, a philosophy. And that's what I think the analytic attitude is. It's the mortar that holds all of these pieces together. So, cultivating an analytic attitude is the most fundal, fundamental acquisition in becoming an analyst or an analytic therapist. And I think there are many therapists that practice analytically, whether they have the analytic certification or not. Most other psychotherapies, I would contend, CBT, EMDR, family systems, ACT, DBT, whatever set of initials you'd like, can be practiced primarily via the application of theory and technique alone. Okay, There may be some general philosophy of what a counselor or a therapist should be doing, 
but that philosophy doesn't necessarily orient the application of the technique and the theory. It's, and I think this is one of the fundamental things, whether you're coming from a psychoanalytic perspective or a Jungian analytic perspective, this is the thing, one of the characteristics that makes Jung's work and the descendants of Freud's work fundamentally different than other forms of psychotherapy. Now, you could say perhaps if somebody is a humanistic psychologist or an existential psychologist, they too have a philosophy. But I would say it's still not yet at the same center of the activity as much as it is in psychoanalytic theory and Jungian theory. And feel free to disagree with me, too. Those discussions will be interesting if you disagree with something I'm saying. So, Jung talks about it in implicit terms. He doesn't use the term analytic attitude, but I think it's there when he says the analyst must believe implicitly in the significance and value of conscious realization whereby hitherto unconscious parts of the personality are brought to light and subjected to conscious discrimination and criticism. It is a process that requires the patient to face his problems and ta that taxes his powers of conscious judgment and decision. It is nothing less than a direct challenge to his ethical sense, a call to arms that must be answered with the whole personality. Now, that's a, that's a philosophical statement. It's not a statement about how to do something. It's about the attitude with which something is done, both for the patient and the analyst. My background, um, just briefly, it, there, there's three primary schools of thought in Jungian therapy. Uh, there's the what's now called the classical school that Zurich was built up around with Jung and Mary Louise von Franz as the primary architects of that school. There is James Hillman's archetypal psychology that focuses much more on image and the interaction with image. And then there's what's called the developmental school or previously was called the London school uh, that was built up around my, a guy named Michael Fordham, and he focused on integrating Jung's theory with other psychoanalytic theories, particularly the theories of Melanie Klein, um, and also some of the techniques that they use. My background was very influenced by that school of thought, the developmental school, so throughout the presentation you'll find as many references to psychoanalytic authors as you will to Jung or other Jungians. So Fred Wolkenfield said, the psychoanalytic education, particularly supervision, has as its main objective not the teaching of technique or theory, critical as they are, but rather the ever-increasing refinement of the supervisee's psychoanalytic mode of listening the enhancement of him or herself as instrument, the internalization of the psychoanalytic attitude. Without the development of this foundation to our work, analytical psychology, or I would say any form of psychoanalytic work, becomes just another psychotherapy. This presentation is a part of my ongoing evolving effort to come to terms with what I do and who I am as an analyst. For those begin near the beginning of this process, I hope to provide an outline by which you might begin your own examination of what the analytic process is, and in particular, the analytic attitude. For those further into the journey, I hope to broaden your vision to make it more inclusive, varied, and differentiated. Above all, I hope we engage in an ongoing reflective dialogue, both today and continuing forward with yourself and your own practices. I choose the term cultivating in the title because it implies an ongoing cyclical process rather than a fixed destination or state. Etymologically, cultivate is derived from the medieval Latin cultivatus, meaning to prepare 
or prepare and use for the raising of crops, something that's growing, to loosen or breaking up the soil around plants, to foster growth, to improve by labor, care, or study, to refine, to further, or to encourage. We might also define what we mean when we say attitude. The formal definition of attitude is a complex mental state involving beliefs and feelings and values and dispositions to act in certain ways. Jung's definition of attitude is a readiness of the psyche to react in a certain way. So the attitude for the analyst as well as the patient conveys something of readiness. We're moving towards readiness. Analysis must be about what we do and how we do it. But most importantly, the practice of analysis must reflect a living process within ourselves. As Wilfred Bion, a British psychoanalyst, said, the way I do psychoanalysis is of no importance to anybody excepting myself. But it may give you some idea of how you do analysis, and that is important. So this seminar is not about drawing hard and fast conclusions. It's really about seeing the subtle and nuanced implications of undertake, undertaking an analytic path. If we are to call what we do analysis or analytic therapy, holding it out as a unique endeavor, which we participate in, or define it as a unique professional identity, uh, then we should be able to explain, justify, or satisfactorily articulate what we do and why we do it, or at least make a very bold attempt to, toward such an explanation. So why the compass of Hermes? As you're probably aware, and as Mike alluded to, Hermes did not possess a compass. Yet I adopt his name for the title of this lecture because of the characteristics attributed to Hermes. Carl Carigne referred to him as the guide of the souls, the navigator between life and death, a messenger for the gods and the inventor of language. According to Carigne, meeting and finding are revelations of Hermes' essence. And that's kind of a, an essential characteristic of what we do in analytic therapy is to meet, to have an, a relational experience, and to find, to find what's hidden, what's hidden from the patient's own view. Both the field of hermeneutics and Hermes, the revered square pillars, or erms rather, the revered square pillars placed at crossroads crossroads throughout ancient Greece to oversee our journeys are named for him. His activity is most often associated with the night, the time in which it is most difficult to find our way and are most in need of a compass to guide us. Hence, it seems fitting to associate Hermes with the direction required for maintaining our bearings during the analytic process. So I think of the analytic attitude is our compass, our basic orienting tool in the analytic process. And everything we do should emerge from our analytic attitude. The analytic framework, our relationship to theory, what we attend to in sessions, what we say to patients, how we are as we sit with our patients, how we greet them, what we think about while we're in sessions, on some level should all emerge from and be organized by this analytic attitude. So any th thoughts that are coming up at this point? I have some uh, experience recently with a client who is seeing a dark form mm -hmm. appear in a room that's happened twice. Mm -hmm. And as I think about that, and my response to that is to say, I'm open to her experience. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a part of my mm -hmm. attitude. Yes. 
Uh, I also draw on my union study mm -hmm. and use the image and the concept of shadow mm -hmm. try to try to help her begin to realize that there's more to her than she realizes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that fits with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let's, there'll be a, so do you have a sense of what the dark form is about? I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just my conjecture. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just turned 80, and she, five years ago, she lost her job at the Catholic University Library. And that was devastating. And she's tried to do her somewhat traditional Catholic understanding of who she is to mm -hmm. um, get through the last part of her life. Mm -hmm. And I, my guess is she's still holding too rigid. Mm -hmm. okay. Something else is trying to come up. Okay. Okay, fair enough. And my attitude is, I would say, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And stay open to the okay. possibility. Yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, so Arnold Rothstein says, what is essential in analytic technique is the analyst's attitude. Other features of the analytic situation, such as frequency of sessions, the use of the couch, though important, are not always and absolutely essential. So again, it's the focus on what's the analyst's attitude, not what is the analyst doing that's more important, more essential. So the main point here is that it, it isn't defined by specific activities such as dream work or active imagination or specific techniques such as interpretation, but rather the guiding attitude and personality of the analyst. So let's try to find a definition of this analytic attitude. And the first one I came across as I was studying about this initially was a guy named Roy Schaefer who wrote a book in 1983 called The Analytic Attitude. And Schaefer says, a desirable degree of subordination of personality will be evident in the analyst remaining curious, eager to find out, and open to surprise. So that speaks a little bit to what you were just saying. It will be also be evident in the analyst taking nothing for granted. If somebody shows up 10 minutes late, three sessions in a row, that probably means something. Uh, if they forget to bring their checkbook several payment periods in a row. That probably means something. If they use their father's name or their mother's name instead of your name, that probably means something. <laughs> that sort of thing of holding even the most nuanced gesture as potentially meaningful. And remaining ready to con revise conjectures or conclusions already arrived at. So we've got, in your example, an initial conjecture or conclusion that it's the shadow is that's this dark shape. So Schaefer would say it's important to be ready to cast aside that conjecture of the shadow, to consider other possibilities as new experience emerges. To tolerate ambiguity or incomplete closure over extended periods of time, accepting alternative points of view, and bear and contain the experiences of helplessness, confusion, and aloneness that not infrequently mark periods of analytic work with each analysand. So that's one definition. Nancy McWilliams, who's written several uh, very good books on psychoanalytic process, says she defines it in terms of a number of characteristics, some of which overlap with Schaefer. Curiosity, awe, which is a word that often comes up in Jungian circles, 
uh, most often in terms of the phrase the numinous, complexity, capacity for identification, and, then, and what she means by that is the capacity to identify with what the patient is experiencing, empathy, which is the capacity to feel something about what the patient is feeling, subjectivity, which means having an awareness of your own presence in the analytic space, an attunement to emotion or affect, the capacity to form attachment, and faith. Now, she's not talking about traditional religious faith. She's talking about faith in a process. Edward Edinger, in a book called Vision of Consciousness, which is probably the best 120-page summary of Jung's main mission uh, that I've read. And he kind of boils it down to this. He says, essentially says, consciousness is Jung's myth for modern man. And he draws this from a phrase in Jung's writing where Jung says, the purpose of human life is the creation of consciousness, period. So if you applied that to the notion of an analytic attitude, it would come into the room as, am I moving towards consciousness with this patient or away from consciousness, period. Are the things I'm doing, are the ways I'm interacting with this patient moving them helping them move towards consciousness or not. There's many ways it's easy for people to uh, collude, for the therapist to collude with avoiding consciousness. When we reassure people prematurely, don't worry, you're going to get through this, that actually blocks consciousness rather than opens consciousness. Yeah, this is something that, um, I don't know if it actually bothers me, but it comes to my mind frequently that what is meant by consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand it in the notion of reflection mm -hmm. as being a specific agency of consciousness. <clears throat> it isn't to say that people are fundamentally unconscious by nature, and they develop the capacity for consciousness. But it seems to me like it's a specific type of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And your term reflection is an important part of that, the capacity to reflect. Yeah, if I went up to the average person on the street and said, are you conscious? They'd say, of course I'm conscious. But yeah, Jung means something more specific than that. And what he means is consciousness of unconscious activity. Uh, as fully as one is able to do that. It's never an, uh, an accomplished task because the unconscious is always changing and shifting. So it's never an accomplished task, but it is consciousness is about bringing unconsciousness and Jung would say the collective, un the activity of the collective unconscious into awareness and having an actual living relationship to that. Reflection, the capacity for reflection, or what Jung calls reflexio, using the, the, the Latin version of that, is an important piece of that. So if somebody comes in and sits down in my office and says, I'm angry, this guy's a jerk, I'm going to punch him, he's obviously conscious of something, but he's not reflecting on it. He doesn't have anything to regulate the emotion he doesn't have an observing point to observe what's going on with him. He's not able to stand back and say, oh, I wonder why I'm angry with him. I wonder why this has come up so suddenly. I wonder if there's anything about this guy that's like other people I've encountered in my life. Like my father, who was domineering and abusive to me, for example. 
I wonder what are the ramifications that's going to occur for me and for this other individual if I do end up punching him. These are all capacity to step outside ex one's experience while remaining connected to it and make observations, pose questions to oneself. That is what I think Jung believes consciousness is. So, Mark, would you say that there's various degrees and levels? In Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and consciousness or the reflective capacity is an ongoing skill. Uh, and I'm certainly at a different place, uh, both individually and in my work as a therapist, in terms of that capacity than I was 30 years ago. Uh, you know, and it, it, I mean, it just makes sense uh, that it, uh, at one point I did some research on uh, chess, chess playing. Uh, and they've done actually quite a lot of cognitive research on chess players. Beginning players are, who are just getting oriented to the game can see one move deep, okay? And they re refer to the, the, the number of levels you can go down as plies, P-L-Y. So a beginning player is a one-ply player. They can only see the board one move ahead. And so they can't see with a more advanced player who's planning three, four, five moves ahead, they don't see the implication of their move. Now, a medium-rated player is going to see four, five, six, seven moves deep. A grandmaster can see the board almost an infinite number of combinations into the future in an instant because they've studied so many patterns that they're pattern recognizers. And so they, they see somebody move a pawn, and they're thinking 30 moves down the road. It's really astonishing when you see the, the, the vast difference between a beginning chess player or even an intermediate chess player and a grandmaster. And that's where I think what Jung is aspiring for all of us to move in terms of our own unconscious processes when we wake up in the morning and we've got a hangover from a particular dream that we immediately begin to think about what that hangover is about. Why is this dream? What is unique, specific about this dream that's hanging over with me? You know, and immediately to launch into that reflective space of the interaction between inner and outer life, between conscious and unconscious life. So I think there's some archetypal roles uh, that underlie the analyst or analytic therapist role, roles that the objective psyche provides uh, that form the, uh, the structural foundation for our role, physician, the wounded healer, the magician, the philosopher, the sage, the seer, the confessor, the clairvoyant, the priest, the prophet, the hierophant, or the alchemist. Naturally, the role of the analyst also has a shadow side, which is pr prominently displayed in the archetypal image of the charlatan, who relies on manipulation to gain power. The important thing is that the analysts not ident overly identify with any of these roles because they are all, in addition to the charlatan, all very seductive for the therapist. However, the analyst role is also sui generis, meaning of its own kind or genus or unique in its characteristics. In other words, when if we become reductive with these archetypal things, for example, the wounded healer, and think, begin to think it's part of our identity, oh, I'm the wounded healer, well, then we've lost the objective relationship to it. Mark, can yeah. I sure, go ahead. In listening to you, you know, talk about the analytic attitude, a particular way of, uh, you know, listening, being present to the patient, I find myself uh, thinking of myself as uh, 
noticing the moments when I might lose my analytic attitude with the patient. Mm -hmm. It slips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For example, let's say I have this attitude of trying to listen and be patient, and listen to the meaning of what their experience is, they're presenting. It. Let's say I have a client who's very anxious and who's anxious about resolving a particular situation. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for me to help them get that resolved pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So I may find my analytic attitude slip a bit, but suddenly I slip into the pressure to help them fix this situation mm -hmm. and come up with a response that's going to satisfy them. And at that point, <clears throat> I may find myself actually uh, doing uh, you know, behavioral change. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I've noticed that happening, and the vast majority of the time it doesn't go so well. Right. But I think it's, it's interesting as I listen to you that noticing how we may have a general attitude of way of being, but it can slip on us, and maybe some of our own complex material gets activated. Um, and now I want to meet the other person's expectations so much that I, I lose my hold on Right. I think that's a, uh, an important point. It's not something, you know, it's something that we're, it, it, it's an ephemeral thing, the analytic attitude. And if we're tired on a particular day, if we're stressed by something in our own life that's going on, it's easy to slip out of the analytic attitude. It's not something that we ever have an iron grip on, nor would we ever really want to, because that's part of what makes it a human endeavor. Uh, so, yeah, it's easy to fall in, into these things, and what I would call, when, when we're responding to the patient's anxieties, uh, actually colluding with their complex that's activated at the time. The complex wants there to be a short, quick solution so that they, the anxiety can ease rather than deepening sometimes the anxiety, helping them go into it less fearfully so that some sort of meaning can emerge around the anxiety. Um, could you um, follow up what you're saying and what came from the perspective of are there times when the analytic attitude includes an understanding and use of other psychotherapeutic stances like CBT or so that a problem-solving approach in a situation may be one that is appropriate. And it's not used necessarily because you've fallen out of your analytic attitude, but that you, I, I use this word sort of hesitantly, consciously are, are using another piece that you know and have the sense from your being with the patient, mm -hmm. that's the thing to do in the moment. Well, I, I don't hold that view. Uh, I, I yeah. Uh, what I think that that does, and, and there's people who write about this, is it actually, because it cultivates an expectation, because whatever's happening at that point is is compelling you to shift, even if you have, feel like you've got good intentions for the shift. And that cultivates a certain expectation in the patient. You know, on some level, we are doing certain kinds of behavioral reinforcement. So if we reinforce a certain expectation based on that shift, then aren't they going to come to expect that shift to occur again in the future? And that often prevents then going deeper at some later point in time. Now, most of the times when I want to do that, I'm not saying that urge doesn't come up, and I'm not saying I never uh, give in to that urge. It does sometimes happen, but I try to avoid it. And usually the way I avoid it in my mind is I try to think, now, most of what I would suggest doing is something that any ordinary person on the street could come up with, okay? Often it's common sense stuff, like, well, why don't you say this to your husband? Let's say uh, it's something as simple as this. 
Now I'm thinking, now why can't my patient, my client, come up with that on their own? And then that leads me to an understanding of the obstacle in their own mind to doing that. And that's what I want to engage is the obstacle to doing that. So I might change, I might actually slip in a bit of suggestion of how to do it, but the focus is on working with the obstacle. So I might say, you know, it's strange to me. It occurs to me that what you could say in this situation is this, but it's interesting, isn't it, that that doesn't occur to you? And then we're focused on why that relatively simple thing hasn't occurred to them. Or why, or I might say, it occurs to me that you could say this, but for some reason that seems to be a very difficult thing for you to imagine saying, and then we're into their fear about saying it. Something like that. Uh, this, this seems to me somewhat related to the phenomenon of resistance. Mm -hmm. well, it could be part of resistance, yes. Therefore, well, I, you can, the way I read even Freud, or mm -hmm. you know, either one, uh, that that's the fundamental cause of psychopathology. Right. Is resistance. So the question is how do we get past that? And the way I hear this question is that uh, can we take on the role of one of those archetypal features uh, as a sage, seer, um, and or technician of some kind, and um, and give the patient what they think they want, and at the same time nurture the analytic attitude. Mm -hmm. And now I I recognize that in some cases people don't want the analytic attitude. Mm -hmm. They resisted fundamentally in their life. They don't want to go deeper. I've had patients even tell me, you want me to get into my parents mm -hmm. and talk about my parents, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> and that's the last time I see them. <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, in some cases, if you do help them with their anxiety, the complexes show up over time mm -hmm. with greater clarity, and then they can work more in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and again, this is one of those things that there's not a hard and fast rule. I can say why I think you don't do those sorts, of, include those sorts of interventions, and you might have very good reasons for including them. Uh, can I flip okay. just a little yeah. example? Sure. Short, uh, take one. Thinking of a recent interaction with a patient client <clears throat> in her 70s, 76, and we've seen her a few times. Uh, with a mother, her mother was highly successful. She's largely depressed uh, because here at 76, she lives by herself and says, I'm just not doing anything, I'm not getting anything done. For a lot of this pressure, just do more, accomplish more, get more involved. <clears throat> As I'm listening, what I'm thinking is, okay, I hear a lot of the pressure from the mother complex She's always felt inferior mm -hmm. to the mother, in spite of having a fairly successful life. So, um, I test that a little bit, saying, uh, gee, it sounds like you're feeling a lot of pressure. She does not really hear that. So, then I say, well, what are the kinds of things you, you, you think you might like to be doing? <clears throat> then she spins out a list of about eight things, you know. I start a program in our community to help the aged live in their home. Uh, some pretty ambitious things and some other things, you know, set up a program for reading to people who uh, uh, can't read anymore or something like that. So I'm listening. And so then I find myself, maybe this gets into what you're talking about, Julie, from talking about how might you proceed to do some of those things. Like this, this next week, how might you talk to some other people in your faith community in which you're very active mm -hmm. and try to start some of these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of moving toward coming up with uh, suggestions, strategies for doing some of these things she wants. In the back of my mind, I'm imagining, okay, I'm probably now feeding a little bit this complex, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm waiting to see what happens when she comes back the next time. But I certainly found myself moving into more strategy for taking action and behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And moving away from more depth reflection on 
where does that pressure come from that she feels so much? Or another question would be, how can she imagine all of these activities, but why is she unable to imagine herself into doing those activities? What's that block internally? And that may be related to the same complex, or it may be related to a different complex. Often complexes are not unitary monolithic things. They're often in relationship in a network of complexes. If we have a child complex, somewhere in the picture is also a mother and a father complex because the child never is in isolation. If there is um, an ego complex, which everyone has, that's also in relationship to the persona complex and the shadow complex. Those sorts of things. There's always a network that these are embedded in. So I, I don't know if you know, I find myself making those different moves, um, and then waiting to see now, now what happens as she comes back the next time, and, and how did that go? And, you know, why did it not go anywhere if it did not go anywhere? And then you talk about that. Right. That's the point is we're going to get, this is the point from your earlier question about is not to hold the analytic attitude with this iron grip, but to recognize the ebb and flow of it when you lose your analytic attitude, figuring out how to recover it, how it's going to be reintroduced into the dialogue. So let's assume that this suggestion of, well, why don't you go to your faith community and do this, is advice on some level. So let's say that's the abandonment of the analytic attitude temporarily. She comes back the next week and says, and you ask, well, how did that go? And she says, yeah, that didn't, I didn't do any of that. Then that's the opportunity for the analytic attitude to resume of, well, let's take a look at what got in the way of doing that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's usually not practical things. It's usually internal things. In this particular moment, I, I found myself, uh, I guess I might say not totally abandoning the analytic attitude, mm -hmm. but, but making a move that's a little different from inviting her into depth, mm -hmm. more kind of making a move to support her needing to try something and see, see what happens mm -hmm. uh, in a way that it did look like I was coming up right. with suggestions based on what she had previously said about how involved she was in her church. Yeah. But it's a question of then waiting, waiting to see what happens with the psyche and then we take it from there. So if we can hear what the complex is, one of the pieces of advice that I picked up from a New York analyst named Nathan Schwartz Salon from one of his lectures was, he said, always lean into the pathology. Always lean into the complex. If you have a choice, lean into the thing that's complexed. Uh, Does that mean inviting the uh, patient to sort of lean into it as well? Yeah, it's like you lean in, the patient can lean away from your leaning in, they can lean in with you. There's all sorts of possible responses, but that we have a responsibility to figure out whether we're leaning, we're staying neutral, whether we're leaning into the problem or whether we're leaning away from the problem. So if a patient has an addiction or an addictive tendency, maybe they call it addictive, or maybe I think it's addictive, mm -hmm. my first move is not to try to stop the addiction. Right. But to understand what are the things that support and reinforce the addiction, keep it going. You know, it, it can be really unconscious stuff. Uh, when I was in my second analysis, uh, and I was interested in this developmental school of thought and using the analytic couch as a big part of that. And so my analyst, my second analyst didn't use the couch, but I said, uh, would you mind, can I, can I, you, he had a sofa, so can I lay down on the sofa? And he said, sure, yeah, I haven't had any experience with that. He op was open about that. And he, acknowledged it, and, but we'll give it a try and see what happens. Uh, so the next session, I come in, and his briefcase and his hat are on the couch. 
<laughs> so I'm thinking, well, he probably just forgot that I wanted to use the couch. So I move the briefcase and the hat while he's off in the restroom. I come back, you know, have the session. And this goes on about five or six sessions. Every time I come in, the briefcase and the hat are on the couch, occupying, obviously, the space that I've requested to use. So my analyst had an unconscious resistance to my, my being in that position of relationship. He couldn't, he was uncomfortable with it for whatever reason. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't confront him about that, and he didn't inquire about why I chose to begin sitting up again. Now, I have some responsibility in that, but I think my analyst had more responsibility to hold that up. Why did you decide to sit up again? You've been laying down for half a dozen sessions now. You know, there wasn't any movement towards that. So, Jung doesn't use analytic attitude, but he does use a term, the symbolic attitude, uh, which he says is a definite view of the world which assigns meaning to events and attaches to this meaning a greater value than to bare facts. In other words, always reading between the lines, always reading underneath the surface. Ellen Siegelman, who wrote a book on metaphor in 1990, says that the symbolic attitude is generally one that asks, what larger meaning is at work here? What else is this besides what it appears to be? So if somebody comes in and they're telling me about the awful traffic that was out on the road or how they couldn't find a parking spot, I try not to dismiss that in my mind. I try to listen for what else are they telling me about by telling me about this other than the frustration with the traffic. A patient of mine who's also a psychologist came in and was telling me one day about this predicament she felt she was in around Facebook. And she had, uh, before, uh, when she was a master's level therapist, she had worked in a clinic treating children and adolescents. And the mother of one of her patients there had friended her on Facebook and she had accepted the invitation. So there's a bit of a boundary violation there, which she wasn't thinking about at the time. Later, the child, who's now an adolescent, friends her on Facebook as well. And she comes in in this predicament. And she said, I just don't know what to do. I'm afraid about, uh, I know I shouldn't have accepted the invitation. I probably need to unfriend him. I don't know what to do. I don't, and I, so I began to explore, well, what do you imagine would happen if you unfriended him? Well, I'm afraid that he'll feel rejected and that he'll want to get in or need to get in contact with, with me in some point in the future, maybe resume therapy, whatever. And I don't want to close the door, but I know I should based on boundary issues. Now, interestingly, she's not thinking, she's thinking about the boundary issues with the child adolescent, but she isn't thinking about the boundary issue with the child's mother. She hasn't brought that into the equation. Now, I also know that this patient has a pretty, has had a pretty strong transference to me and for about a year and a half was an intensely erotic transference to me. And this is in the post erotic, the, the erotic transference kind of resolved and we worked through that and came to an understanding of what that was about and the intensity of the emotion around that dissipated but I know that she's still very attached to me. So I'm thinking about what is she telling me about our relationship in telling me about this Facebook predicament. So after a moment, or several moments, I shift gears and I say, I think you're worried about what happens at the end of our relationship and how you'll... I think you're worried about being able to feel, continue to feel a connection to me after we stop our work together. 
And so she starts tearing up and she said, yeah, that's sad for me to think about. I don't like to think about that. So that's one of those things of listening beneath the surface. There is a surface, an important surface content for that, but the unconscious was also prompting her to talk about it because she needed to also recognize her fears about what happens when we stop seeing each other. So, going back to the issue of consciousness, not everything that appears as an image to a patient or a client is a symbol. Okay? Not everything that appears in their dreams is a symbol. Because Jung says, and I think he's right about this, whether or not something is a symbol depends primarily on the attitude of the consciousness that contemplates it. So we have to have a receptivity in our waking consciousness in order for a symbol to have its full impact on us. We get bombarded both in our own dreams and in daily life with things that are potentially symbolic, but we don't pick all of those up and utilize them in our symbolic process to move our individuation forward, to move forward the resolution of particular complexes. Doesn't that say, though, that uh, uh, anything could be a symbol depending upon the attitude of the consciousness? Right. Right. So one patient had a dream about her father. Actually, it wasn't her father. She was leaving a building, and a man in a dark suit stops her and says, you can't leave, you haven't followed the rules, and he points up to this big plaque on the wall of like 10 or 12 rules, and he says, she hasn't, you haven't followed the rules. And so I ask her about her associations to the dream, and we come to the dark suit. And I asked, well, what, what associations do you have to a dark suit? And she said, oh, my father worked for the airline industry, and that's all he wore was dark gray suits, dark blue suits, dark brown suits. He had a whole closet full, and she had a very conflictual but also deeply connected relationship to her father. She loved, she said, I loved the smell of those suits. Okay? Now, her consciousness was receptive to utilizing that image as a symbol. So from that day forward, we rarely referred to her father complex. When she, and sometimes her father complex would be constellated with me in the sessions. And when she would get anxious about, often it was anxiety, about something I would say or do, uh, and I could see the anxiety building, I would say it feels as though the man in the dark suit has just come into the room. And then she would go to a deeper level with it. Then if I had just said, oh, it seems as though your father has come into the room, or it seems like your father... I rarely use any... I try not to use any jargon, any jargony terms with my patients. I never say complex unless they introduce it. I never say shadow unless they already are familiar with the term. I'll find some other way to put it in ordinary, everyday terms that says something like the concept of shadow. So instead of saying shadow, for example, I'll say something like the part of you that you have disowned. Now that's what part of the definition of shadow is. So I'll, I'll, I'll almost always try to find an operational definition that's in everyday language that anybody on the street could understand. Okay. So what is analysis, analytic therapy, or depth psychology? This is who we are, what we do, what we think, how we feel, how do we speak. But we first have to have some definition of it. Jonathan Lear makes a very concise statement about this. He says, if one is to have a clear sense of what of why one is doing what one is doing in an analytic moment, one needs to have a sense of what psychoanalysis is for. Conversely, one cannot have a textured sense of what psychoanalysis is all about unless one also understands how the overall conception of its value filters down and informs the analytic moment. 
So we're speaking about the value in these, these phrases like consciousness, reflective capacity. That's the value of it, is it's a process uniquely geared towards building consciousness, building reflective function. You know, in this day and age of uh, quick fixes and uh, insurance companies, emphasis and institutional emphasis often like in university counseling programs places like that there's a lot of emphasis on short-term therapy interestingly most short-term therapy or cbt for example which is the most studied form of short-term therapy it has a pretty good effect when you aggregate uh, a number of studies about cbt and you measure the effect size. Effect size is something uh, like a universal, like one is very good, 0.5 is still good. When you get down around 0.3, it's still a substantial effect, but uh, it's not that great. For example, what would you imagine the effect size, given that range of 0 to 1, the effect size of an antidepressant to be? The average antidepressant again, across all spectrums of depression. Close. 0 0.32. 0 0.32. What's, what do you imagine the effect size of, point, of uh, CBT is? 0 to 1. Okay, it's 0.68. That's, that's a pretty sizable effect. What do you imagine the effect size of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, regardless of whether it's short-term or long-term? Aggregate across all forms of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. 0 0.97 to 1.01. Now, when it, when it, where it gets interesting, is when you begin to look at it after termination. With medication for depression and CBT combined, which you would think would have more of an effect than either of those in isolation, the return to baseline functioning, in other words, where they were functioning before they started therapy, if you discontinue the medication and you discontinue the CBT therapy, the time to base back to baseline functioning is 3.6 months. These are confirmed over huge studies. In Sweden, they implemented CBT as their only intervention for anxiety and depression in all national health services. They provided services over a four-year period to 40,000 patients that were suffering from anxiety or depression invested five, the equivalent of $500 million in this project. And then they hired the top university in Sweden to evaluate the effectiveness of the program. And they said it's essentially zero. Not because they, there wasn't an effect while the treatment was going on, but when you study the effectiveness of it, did it did they return to their previous levels of anxiety and depression? Essentially, they spent $500 million and got zero for it. Everybody in the program eventually returned to their same previous level of anxiety and depression. What happens in psychoanalytic psychotherapies, which Jungian therapy is one type of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, it's a school of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and there's been specific research done on that. Nine months after treatment is terminated, the treatment effect size has increased from about 1.0 to 1.41. It's grown. And it continues to grow. They did one study where they did an intensive outpatient program for borderline personality disorder in England that lasted for about nine months based on a particular type of psychoanalytic psychotherapy called mentalization therapy that was developed by a pe guy named Peter Fonagay that's very focused on the reflective function. 
that in fact these are synonymous words, reflection and mentalization, which is the capacity to think about one's experience. At eight years, with no further treatment, their treatment effect size had grown to 2.21. So there's something unique about psychoanalytic psychotherapies, and I think it's this reflective capacity that's built in, and that that skill continues to, or that capacity grows over time as you continue to utilize it. Where is that research to be found? If, if you'll... If um, I'll put back up the first slide when we end. If you'll email me, I'll write. I'll send you a paper I've written about this that has all of the references. Yeah. So anybody who wants to email me, or I can email it to Mike, and he can send it out either way. Uh, it's really fascinating stuff, and you know, it's like we're under a little bushel basket or something, hiding our light and. There's this amazing research that's, I mean, we're talking about research that uh, involves thousands and thousands of people. These are not small studies we're looking at, not like 12 patient studies. Can I say something? Yeah. You mentioned the excitement of teachers that you were encountering. Yeah. I know uh, from my practice work in personal relationships with teachers, hospice workers, who've gone from regimes where they had a lot of opportunity to cultivate a receiving, reflecting function with the people they interact with, right. their children, patients, families. And they're going under regimes where they're having to account for every minute, every outcome, supervisory, people breathing down their necks. Some of them leave. Mm -hmm. they, they don't feel it's a calling anymore. They feel it's changed. It's changed everything. And some of the best people that leave their homes. Yeah. That it just seems like a complementary process to what you're describing, and then instead of the one on one effects, it's having massive effects. Yeah, absolutely. I hear the same thing from people that I work with that are teachers, and uh, all of the uh, Im improvisational quality, all of the uh, all of the intuition that goes into teaching is. Uh, both at uh, the K through 12 level, but also at the often at the university level now, as uh, all of the funding issues and uh, requirements that are being implemented at the university level, uh, yeah, it's really a tragic thing. And why it's so important for there to be these little pockets of opportunities. Not everybody's going to have the opportunity, but we can do our part by creating these little pockets of uh, where there is a place to reflect. And I think of it as kind of like the movie Fahrenheit 451, where you know these individuals memorize a book and they become the book and they become the repository of knowledge for the future. And except what we're talking about is the repository of a certain way of being. We're not just treating symptoms. We're cultivating a way of being in the world and being with ourselves. Can I ask a question? Yeah. It seems to me that it's not just the analytic attitude, but it's also the target, meaning the capacity to reflect, not just on anything, but what is the fundamental truth that is within the psyche mm -hmm. that needs to emerge. Right. So we're really dealing with, in her hermeneutics, we're dealing with not just the attitude that allows us to see, mm -hmm. others, but what it is that we're looking at. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't think we always, you know, to go back to Jonathan Lear's thing, I don't think we always know what's going on. Often we don't know what's going on. But hopefully, even when we don't know what's going on, if at some point looking out the rearview mirror, we come to an understanding of, oh, that's why that was going on then. Oh, that's what we were bumping up against then. You know, like your patient who, uh, you know, kind of slipping into the pattern of, well, why don't you do this? And at some point, coming to an awareness, oh, 
okay, we were doing that, but what was behind that was this. Uh, but we don't always know that when it's going on, but if we're reflecting on both what's happening in the moment and what's happened in the past, hopefully we're also doing some retrospective self-analysis about our work with particular patients. Okay, this is an old school definition of what psychoanalysis or analysis is. This is by a prominent guy named Merton Gill. Psychoanalysis is that technique which employed by a neutral analyst results in the development of a regressive transference neuroses and the ultimate resolution of this neuroses by techniques of interpretation alone. I wouldn't want to practice in that way, but that was a that was actually a very prominent sort of perspective back in the 50s. I think of it more in terms this is the thing that I orient more to uh, by a woman named Muriel Demon. She says the psychoanalytic session is a chance to say the unspeakable and to think the unthinkable, to imagine what does not yet exist. And it's that last sentence that's very Jungian. She's not a Jungian, but it's very Jungian of her because there's this prospective, this forward-looking aspect of the psyche that Jung was the, is really the, the first originator of thinking about the teleological aspect of psyche. Where is it moving? And when she says to imagine what does not yet exist, that's imagining where psyche is moving us. Another woman named Paula Gorlitz says, when reduced to its essence, psychoanalytic therapy is about experiments and intimacy and the recovery of lost feelings. You could say recovery of the lost parts of ourselves. Okay. I'm going to go for a few more minutes and then we'll take a short break. So what is analysis? Analysis says that we're often unaware of the factors that determine our emotions and behaviors. That is, they're unconscious. Psychoanalytic treatment explores how these unconscious factors affect our current relationships, patterns of thought, emotion, and behavior. The treatment traces these patterns back to their historical origins and considers how they've changed or developed over time and helps the individual to cope better with the realities of their current life situation. Analysis is an intimate partnership in the course of which the patient becomes aware of the underlying sources of his or her difficulties, not simply intellectually, but emotionally as well, in part by re-experiencing them with the analyst, what we call the transference. And the patient and the analyst work together to build up a safe and trusting relationship that enables the patient to experience aspects of his or her inner life that have been hidden because they are painful, embarrassing, or guilt-provoking. Now, actually, this is the definition of analysis from the American Psychoanalytic Association. Not a union. Most unions, I would say, would agree with everything that's on here, but they wouldn't say it's sufficient alone. The things I think that a Jungian would add are that analytical psychology attempts to discern and explore the influence of the collective elements of the psyche, the archetypes on the life of the individual, that in addition to historical origins, analytical psychology attempts to discern how psyche is attempting to move forward, what Jung refers to as the transcendent or perspective aspect of the psyche, and which is related to the final goal of analytical psychology, individuation, a coming into the wholeness of one's own being. Mark, I have a question. Yeah. I heard you use that red two words. Psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. And the psychology mm -hmm. reverse, mm -hmm. reverse. Sometimes I see it as written as including all of psychodynamics. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it seems to be used, analytical psychology is used more to refer to meaning. Right, right. 
I think of I think of Jungian work as a subset of psychoanalytic work, and sometimes I am using psychoanalytic to refer to something that's theoretically not Jungian, and I use analytical psychology exclusively when I'm talking only about Jung and not others. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I would prefer that we didn't have these distinctions. Uh, I think there's many schools of thought that have useful uh, ways of looking at psyche, uh, and of which one, Jung, is an important part of my basis of framework, but it's not my only basis of uh, framework. And in fact, Jung says himself in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, sometimes I can be heard talking like a Freudian, and sometimes I can be heard talking like an Adlerian, and sometimes I'm I talk like me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jung's, he doesn't give many good definitions of what, it, what is analysis, and perhaps intentionally so. He says, analysis is a process of quickened maturation. And I'll skip this next phrase. He does say that analysis, he thinks, has four parts. Catharsis, which is the bringing up the unconscious secret, confession, or initiation. Explanation or elucidation, which he thought of as the Freudian aspect of things. The reductive analysis back to the past, which he never uh, repudiated. He said that's often important and necessary, particularly for people in the first half of life and often at the beginning of any analysis. Then what he called the educational phase, which he saw as more Adlerian. So those were the three primary schools of thought in his day, Freudian, Jungian, or Adlerian. And then the unique thing that he felt he added, which is the notion of transformation. I think of it a lot like Francis Burton Burnett's book, children's book, The Secret Garden, and that psyche is really like a, a secret garden. And we may have different doorways in, and each theoretical system may delineate a different part of psyche, but oh, I'm getting a cramp in my leg. So I'll just stand up a minute. What does that mean? Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure. Actually, actually, it means I had back surgery in uh, June, and sometimes I get these funny... Uh, unpredictable cramps. So I take a lot of ideas from Heinz Kohut, Winnicott, Klein, Freud, but my fundamental basis is still Jung. And we may be delineating different aspects of psyche, but some of these systems have a better way of languaging certain experiences than Jung does. There are certain concepts that are in these other systems of thought that allow you to get at something that you couldn't get at if you were just using Jung's perspective. Kohut's got this idea of the self-object, and Jung really doesn't have a, a concept that's quite like that. He has an idea, self-objects in Kohut's language are the idea that somebody else serves a function for you in the development of your own self-structure that you can't provide for yourself. Now, Jung talks about the necessity of the analyst carrying the image of the self for the patient for a period of time until they're capable of carrying it themselves, but it's not quite the same thing that Kohut's talking about. So there's little places like that throughout the analytic literature where somebody else just happens to have articulated something that Jung alludes to, but hasn't ever had time to flesh out. I mean, he produced you know, 20 volumes in the collected works, and then another 10 or so supplemental volumes that have been published since then. He only had so much time, it's amazing he wrote as much as he did. So the first part of the analytic attitude, I think, is the analytic frame, which is the physical and behavioral manifestation of the analytic attitude. 
just as ritual is mythology brought into action. So when you think of ritual in the church setting, for example, that's the that's a mythology brought into an act. You know, like taking communion is an act that has a symbolic function that's related to the mythology of Christianity. Well, our how we can how we create our space in the analytic setting is our equivalent to that. These were all actually articulated by Freud in 1904 and 1913. And they really haven't deviated much, not because they're rules, but because they've been proven over time to be effective at it creating a circumstance for unconscious material to emerge. You know, back when radios had a dial and... Uh, Oh, they were, I think the term is a rheostat, uh, that you were tuning in and you could actually hear whether you were on point for a particular radio station or whether you were a little bit off. And the more off you got, the weaker the signal got and the more static you heard, the more static there was in the system. When we have a weak frame, okay, when we're kind of lax about when somebody pays, what time the session's going to be from week to week, how long it's going to last, whether you're going to hug at the end or shake hands at the end, whether you're going to exchange pleasantries about your vacations or not. All of these things are about the frame. And the looser the frame is, the more static that gets into the system, the weaker the signal is. It's, it's not that it's, these are horrible, bad things. It's that it's harder to tell what's going on when all of those things are held rather loosely. So what are those things? Whether somebody's going to use the couch or the chair. The use of the fundamental rule of free association, which I hold, it's important, but I remind people at the beginning of therapy, and uh, I point out when they're not doing it, of try to say whatever comes into your mind. Okay? Try not to censor things, even if it's uncomfortable for you to speak them. That's free association, basically. The idea of saying whatever comes into your mind. Not pre-censoring what you're going to say out loud in a therapy session. The use of the setting a frequency, time, and duration of session. Establishing how the fees and method of payment are going to take place whether somebody else is going to be paying for them for their therapy, and then how does that get in, uh, come into play? Like if, you're seeing, if you see children, for example, and the parent pays the bill, then, and the parent decides they don't want to pay the bill, then how does that influence the therapy with the child? Or let's say you're seeing a spouse of somebody and the other spouse is paying the bill and then they get frustrated with the types of changes that are occurring in the therapy. Okay, Having an understanding about these things are what keep it possible to understand what's going on in the analysis. They're not rules, they're guidelines that help keep things clearer. How vacations are going to be handled. In the East Coast, for example, it's not uncommon for, still to this day, for analysts to take off the entire month of August and for them to expect their patients to take their vacation at the same time. Now, I don't do that because I don't take my vacation in that way. But it's an important to have an understanding of how these things are going to come into play. Guidelines for contact between sessions. Is it going to be okay for the patient to text you? Is it going to be okay for the patient to email you? Is it okay for them to call between sessions? All of these things in some way hopefully get discussed to some degree in the initial few sessions. And then discussed again when there's deviations from them. Deviations meaning like the patient begins to cancel appointments and they do it with an adequate amount of time ahead, like I've got a 24-hour policy, 
if you don't notify me of a missed session, regardless of the reason, before 24 hours, before that session, you pay for the session. Okay? Now, let's say they start, they're canceling in time, but they stop telling me why they've canceled. Well, then that becomes a, an object of the analysis, a focus of the analysis. Then the physical setup of the consulting room. Do you have physical picture or, or personal pictures out, for example, that tell the patient something about your personal life, which some patients will handle fine and other patients will have an issue with in one way or another. Like it's difficult. Some patients need to develop, for example, an erotic attraction or an, uh, an, uh, an affectionate connection to you a uh, husband-wife type of feeling. Now, if you've got a photograph out of yourself and your wife, that's going to be hard for that patient to develop those fantasies about you when they've got something else confronting them that that fantasy isn't possible. That sort of thing. Can I ask that? How do you feel about <clears throat> having a number of issues spelled out in black and white in disclosure statement and presented at the beginning of analysis and even sometimes having a person sign those. Uh, I have some thoughts about that myself, but I'm interested in yours. Well, I'll say mine and then you can say yours. Um, I, I try to, uh, I don't spell it out. I don't spell all of these things out. I do have a pamphlet that I give out to every patient that says, Here's some things about how to utilize the kind of therapy that I do. So it's simple things like uh, if you have dreams, uh, it's often useful to write those down. Some people find it helpful to keep a journal while they're in this process. It's important in our sessions to say everything that comes to your mind, even if it's uncomfortable, including feelings about me. So I, in a sense, I think of it as giving them permission that it's okay to talk about them and I. Uh, I'll, then I'll state explicitly my policies about cancellations, uh, things like that. I don't put anything in black and white like about you can or can't text me, you can or can't call me, you can or can't hug me, you can or can't uh, shake my hand. At the, those things that are more interactional I want them to come out in the process of the analysis. So there's, to answer your question, there's a few things I address directly, and the other parts of this I don't address directly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. You know, my sense is in the uh, American psychotherapeutic world, <clears throat> even according to, uh, you know, ethical requirements and suggestions, there's a lot of encouragement to have a lot put in a disclosure. Mm -hmm sign and there's value to that right uh, but as with anything else there's potential disvalue to that. right yeah so i do the minimum in that regard of adhering to uh legal requirements and i do have a disclosure about confidentiality and you know that these are the situations that i would have to violate your confidentiality and i do have them sign that but that's the only thing the pamphlet i just give them uh often they don't read it um but I feel that I've done what I can do to cultivate this part of giving the pamphlet and giving them something to think about helps them think about what kind of process am I entering into. And there's elements of the pamphlet that I'll do verbally in that first session. Uh, you know, and I'll say, this is in the pamphlet, but I want to uh, briefly go over this. If you're going to cancel a session, I need to have 24 hours notice. If not, You'll be charged for the full amount of the session. No, I can't file your insurance for missed sessions, uh, that sort of thing. Um, basically, that, and then I encourage them to say whatever comes into your mind. And if you have feelings about me that are coming up, it's important to talk about those. That's basically my little pitch. Shall we take 10 minutes and go to the bathroom, get coffee, that sort of thing? All right. Symbolize instant.
It could. It could symbolize a number of things. The alchemists would have very specific ideas about what each of those images represented. They didn't just arbitrarily pick things. They introduced things in their diagrams very specifically. So each of them had very particular meanings, but often Jung would interpret them more generally from within his theoretical framework. And that's part of what we'll be getting into tomorrow is the notion of metaphor. It's simply the translation of one language into another language or using something else to articulate an aspect of what's uh, being expressed in one way and then articulating it in a different language or a different viewpoint. And actually, the metaphor is very much a part of being able to listen on a metaphorical level is a central part of analytical psychology and a central part of this analytic attitude. When it, going back to that Seligman quote that asks, uh, what else might this mean? It's this, essentially the same thing as saying, what else might this be a metaphor for? So Lionel Corbett, in his book, The Sacred Cauldron, talk, uses the sacred cauldron as the metaphor for the container of the analytic setting. So a frame is both boundaried and receptive. It allows something in, but it also keeps other things out. So just the symbolic nature of my inner door in my office. It's locked from the outside, but it's unlocked from the inside. People can leave, but other people, intruders, can't come in during that space. It's the, the setting is a ritual. It's a lens to look through. It's an incubator or a gestational process. It provides a womb or a crib. So the frame may take on different symbolic aspects depending on who's in the frame, who you're in the frame with, and what role you're in for that person. When we think about the analytic, char the characteristics of the analytic therapist, we listen closely. Hopefully, we attempt to understand. There's empathy. Sometimes we're explaining to the patient what's happening to them or between them and us. We try to be consistent, reliable, that we show we're actually at the, the appointment time when they show up. Uh, we're reliable. Uh, the needs of the patient are placed above the needs of the therapist. There's a setting of limits of, no, you can't hit me and I'm not going to hit you. Um, there's no retaliation, hopefully, in the face of aggression. All of these things, in a sense, are identical to what we think of when we think of a good parent. We're not parenting our patients but the characteristics that make up a good analytic stance are also the same characteristics that make up a good parent. All sorts of dramas get played out in the analytic frame. The fear of abandonment and the fear of engulfment. In other words, these are always configured in Jung's model as tensions of opposites. So where there's fear of abandonment, the opposite pole of that is a fear of engulfment. Autonomy versus dependence, secrecy and confession, safety and claustrophobia, love and hate, destruction, restoration, desire for change, fear of change, living and dying. All of these dramas can take place in any particular analytic framework. So I want to shift now to the state of mind that I think is useful in maintaining an analytic stance in the session and is the hallmark of deeper analytic experiences. Now, Jung doesn't actually use this term either. It's the term reverie. Reverie, uh, now what's meant by reverie? Ogden says, Thomas Ogden says, reverie is an experience that takes the most mundane and yet most personal of shapes. They are ruminations, daydreams, fantasies, bodily sensations, fleeting perceptions, images emerging from states of half sleep, tunes and phrases that run through our minds, and so on. 
So Ogden sees reverie as both a personal private event that each, both the patient and the analyst may engage in, and but an intersubjective one, something that they engage in together. Or the analyst might be in reverie and the patient not. But reverie is kind of a almost a dreamy waking state where you're not trying to figure out something, you're trying to let something occur to you. You know, it's like putting the ladle down deep in the stew bowl and pulling it up and seeing what floats to the surface as opposed to thinking, I'm going to dig down there and get a potato. So it's kind of like watching the clouds. You know, when you're lying on your back in a nice, you know, grassy knoll and you're looking up at the clouds, maybe there's a friend with you and you're uninhibited and you're not worried about what your friend is thinking about what you're thinking. And you say, oh, I see a dragon there. Oh, and the friend says, oh, I don't see a dragon, I see an elephant. And there's no purpose to it whatsoever, <laughs> right? There's no outcome that you're trying to arrive at by watching the clouds. And reverie is somewhat like that. It's an experience without direct purpose. And reverie is ideally what we hope to achieve in an analytic setting. Instead of trying to figure out what the complex is, attempting to be in a dreamy enough state that what the complex is begins to come into your thoughts, emerges into something. But we have to be in a receptive enough, open enough space to let that happen. And like the analytic attitude, this is part of it, we can't always get there. Sometimes we're too tired, sometimes we're distracted, sometimes we get caught up in trying to figure something out, but this is the baseline I'm always trying to reach for in my work with patients. Does this um, at all relate to Hillman's use of, I think it's called metaxi? I'm not familiar with Hillman's term. It's a type of participation on mystique, uh, but participation on mystique is something that uh, Jung would see as occurring primarily on an unconscious level, that it happens without our awareness, and reverie is kind of trying to... In it, is, it does involve kind of a blurring of boundaries that happens in participation on mystique, like everybody files into a football stadium. They're all wearing the same jerseys, the same colors, or half the stadium's wearing one. They've begun to form an identification with one another, and they're all cheering, and they're looking around at each other, and they're in a tribe all of a sudden that they didn't know they belonged to until they walked into that stadium. And when they walk out, they're no longer in the tribe as much. That's participation on mystique. And there's positive and negative aspects to that. Here we're trying to harness that blurring between me and the patient, between me and my own unconscious, between me and my patient's unconscious, and letting those blurries bound, blur, those boundaries blur intentionally so that we can see what's happening in that field. So it gets more creative. Exactly, creative and less ego-driven. Uh, so I want, if you would indulge me, I'm going to read you a, a statement about reverie from a French philosopher named Raphael Entoven. And if you would just close your eyes and just try to let the words sink in and try to enter into a reverie with Raphael. Reverie is contemplation from within, letting the person who gives way to it feel change. Born of the desire and not the need to be directly involved in our surroundings, reverie strips the world of its utility. It borrows the power of narration from wakefulness and the power of divination from sleep and keeps them vying to suspend the alternation of day and night. Reverie is how one arrives at immediacy. 
Between the sweetness of being and the pain of thinking, between sleep that is opaque to itself and the blindness of one who can't see the stars because of the daylight, lies the talent to glimpse what escapes us, the equivalent of the dawn that threatens at every instant to evaporate into dream or condense into knowing, but in that interval replaces something impenetrable with something immaterial and reveals the imaginary foundations of reality. Reverie never rests. Thought, Bachelard says, is referee brought to a center. Reverie is thought turned loose. One of the lessons of reverie is that you have to sleep with your eyes open occasionally so that knowledge can find the path hearts take. For reverie is not an artifice of hidden meaning, but instead works to squeeze every last drop from appearances. Its grail is not truth, but the merging of types. Because it generously accords the world the absent-mindedness it deserves, reverie is light years distant from being a distraction, which does reality the considerable honor of turning its back on it. In fact, reverie celebrates the rediscovery of understanding and imagination, sets free the secret of disinterest, which because it lets you see beauty without your consent and see nature without ego, invests the world with great intense interest. So how many psychologists do we hear talking in that sort of language? But it's such a beautiful capture of an experience and how words turn on other words to reveal things about experience that we couldn't think of from our own egocentric standpoint. For example, Reverie is light years distant from being a distraction, which does reality the considerable honor of turning its back on it. How often have we thought about turning our back on reality? It's pretty tough when you have 10 sessions. Yes. <laughs> right. And so on some level there is the action of closing the door and trying to put those out of one's mind. Because the only thing we could say that's real is what's happening in that room at that moment. And if we can stick as closely as possible to what's happening in that room, most other things will take care of themselves. Yeah. It also seems like love is at the heart of the action. It is. The, the difference, I would say, and I go into some of this actually in my chapter in Shared Realities, I talk about reverie and participation on mystique and active imagination. The difference is the way Jung conceived it, active, ag active imagination as a, as a one-person event. It was something he thought of as you didn't teach it to everyone, you didn't teach it to initial analysands. He saw it as a process of dialogue with the unconscious that the analysand learned towards the end of therapy so that they could carry the therapeutic process on with themselves after analysis ended. So he had a very specific use in mind for active imagination, and he goes into this in the article The Transcendent Function that he first wrote in 1916. Reverie can be that sort of experience, a one-person experience, but it was originally conceived by Wilfred Bion as being a two-person experience, and he conceived of it through the idea of the mother's receptiveness to the infant's emergent mind. So from the beginning, reverie was thought of as between mother and infant, and that that relationship had implications for the analytic relationship. Who was the author of what you read? Uh, that was, did we bring the copies of that? Uh, they'll be here shortly. Okay. I, 
I printed, I had Mike print off some copies and it'll have the link. It's actually, it was an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, back in like 2010. I don't even remember how I stumbled on that, but it was, I thought, one of the most beautiful things. And actually, I, I read an abbreviated version. The whole thing is on this printout. So reverie is a two-person thing, and uh, even if the patient isn't aware of being able to be in that state, you know, some patients are very connected to their narrative, and they have trouble moving out of their narrative. They're very cued into the social cues of, is the analyst smiling, frowning, looks bored, looks whatever, and they have trouble entering into that reverie state. Patients who can kind of look off and look around, they're looking at the ceiling, but they have kind of a distant look in their eyes, those patients are able to go somewhere else while still being present in the process. The couch does facilitate reverie. Uh, having patients lay down, my, pa my chair is arranged so that my patients, if they turn their head, they can easily look at me, but if they keep their eyes forward, they don't have to be looking at me or preoccupied with what I'm how I'm responding, and they respond mainly out of the sound of my voice. But not all patients feel comfortable. I suggest the couch for some people if I think it's going to benefit them. Others take it up naturally, and others refuse it. I'm going to skip a couple of sections here. <laughs> This is a little example of what I think analytic therapy going well is like, <laughs> where there's a riffing off of one another, where somebody had, makes a statement and somebody else says, oh, that makes me think of this. There's an associative, shared associative process going on, just like in this, and they're, each one builds off one another. One person's in this excerpt, uh, Tommy em Emmanuel and Frank Vignola, uh, one person's playing the rhythm while the other person's playing the lead and then they trade off. It goes back and forth. One, the analyst thoughts come to the foreground. It gives the patient something to respond to. The analyst is listening to the patient's response. It informs in some way what they've, the effectiveness of what they've just said. And it goes back and forth. And there is kind of a, in, even in this short excerpt, you can hear their amusement with one another uh, of that somebody has said something on the guitar that was a bit of a surprise. And you hear Emmanuel laughing at something Frank has uh, surprised him with. Hope, and hopefully that occurs because they're in a reverie state together. They both bring ideas about uh, Django Reinhardt's song, The Tears, which is what they're riffing off of. And they both bring their personal histories, but then they create something joint together around that, even, if, even though they have different histories with Django Reinhardt's tune, Tears, and what that means to them. The idea of reverie, uh, where is this? If we think of the, there being uh, an analytic theater, and we never see each other fully clearly, imagine this, the, instead of the screen being at the front here, and two people sitting over here watching the screen, 
Imagine that the screen is a piece of translucent plastic, kind of opaque white plastic. So light comes through the screen, but it's not in somewhat shape, but the shape is kind of diffuse. And in the analytic theater, the therapist is projecting their images onto this side of the screen. The patient is projecting their images onto this side of the screen. And from a Jungian perspective, the objective psyche, the archetypal influences are in are being present as well in this interaction. So we can imagine that as another projector attached to the ceiling, or you could have I could have imagined it coming up from below and projecting down also light and image into this translucent screen so that the amalgam, the final uh, image that's being seen is somewhat different from each side and that it's a blurring of these three inputs into this. You could expand it further and say there's cultural influences, things like that, family influences, society influences. But to think that neither, no party in the room is seeing things clearly as they are. The analyst or the analytic therapist advantage is that they've sat in the room longer and they have some idea about how these light and images and colors bounce around in the room, so it's a little bit easier for them to orient, but they're not an objective observer, they're a participant observer in the reverie state. I'm going to skip some slides here. Here's what Jung says about reflection. Reflexio is a turning inwards with the result that instead of an instinctive action, there ensues a succession of derivative contents or states which may be termed reflection or deliberation. Thus, in place of the compulsive act, by which he means acting without reflection, there appears a certain degree of freedom and in place of predictability, a relative unpredictability as to the effect of the impulse. There's some other things in the Jungian world. You mentioned active imagination. Also, Jung's notion of non-directed thinking that he speaks about in volume five, which is imagistic, more primitive, more affectively connected. Freud talked about something similar as evenly suspended attention. Winnicott referred to it as primary maternal preoccupation, the preoccupation of the mother with the infant that the infant never really leaves the mother's mind at some point. Kohut talked about it as empathic attunement, and Bion referred to this reverie state as the container and the contained. So the mother's mind was the container for the baby's mind that needed containment. Marilyn Matthew, a British Union analyst, said it so beautifully. She said, reverie is both a process and a state of mind. It is reverie that extends Psyche's vision beyond the door and windows of our minds into the cathedrals of our souls. Now, to do reverie effectively, one has to separate a bit. This is the analytic ego, also known as the working ego, the, the observing ego. And basically, the analyst has to be able to split themselves, not splitting in a destructive, defensive manner, but split themselves in the, in, in the service of the analysis into an analytic ego that watches, observes, reflects, and a participating ego that experiences what it's like to be in the room with the patient. Oh, it's getting hot in here. It's heating up. Oh, wow, I felt that come into the room. That sort of thing. Wow, I feel really nervous. You know, these are thoughts spoken internally, not externally necessarily. Or a different way of looking at it is there's the analyst ego, the patient, and the analyst participating ego. So reverie and interpretation go hand in hand. 
reverie is the activity of the analyst that leads to interpretation. Now, by interpretation, I mean something specific. It's not a statement, every statement made by the analyst or the therapist to the patient. It is a statement made by the therapist about the patient's unconscious experience, which has been digested and thought about by the therapist, ideally processed through the reverie. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. Uh, and in it connects together statements, behavior, or states of the patient that have a common source unknown to the patient. So something simple like uh, every time the patient begins to talk about their father, they have a little catch in their throat. Okay, They may not even notice the catch. So the first step might be, have you ever noticed that when you speak about your father, your throat tightens up? And then they might say, no, I hadn't ever noticed that. Could I ask yeah. you, could you share any thoughts about how you think about whether or not to make an interpretation? Well, that may be something you observe, but whether or not you make an right. interpretation. Well, I go into all of that detail in the book that's coming out. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, there's, there is the feel of the room. Is it? There's an intuition. Is it the right time? There's a thought about, uh, I use a notepad a lot exclusively. Every patient I have has a steno notepad with their name on it, and I'm taking notes continuously throughout the session. And I'll often write down my interpretations before I say them uh, because I want to have a feel of them first. So that's my way of getting, how is this? It's kind of like my way of, saying it aloud in my own mind of, how is this going to really sound out loud? So there's a kind of a feeling my way into it. Uh, often I'll see the situation emerging in what they're talking about, and so I might have several exchanges before I offer the interpretation. I'm thinking about the patient's readiness for the interpretation. You know, I'm sure you've heard it in, in your training, but... Uh, stay a half a step ahead of where the patient is, not a full step ahead or many steps ahead. You have to have a thought about what the, e the patient's ego can tolerate. Uh, there's been relatively innocuous things that I've said that seem to have blown things up, uh, sometimes that for the better and sometimes not for the better. Uh, you know, it's it's just a matter of feel, timing, uh, whether you feel like you've captured the essence of something, uh, and then whether the patient's ready to hear it. By providing a hypothesis about the source, the therapist is making an inference that goes beyond the actual material at hand providing meaning to the patient's material and creating an unknown, an experience of being understood. Ultimately, this allows the patient to begin to reflect on their own experiences. In other words, by reflecting, you're teaching patients how to reflect themselves. For example, if you, like, make a, an analogy between how they're speaking about their boss and how they're speaking about this friend that they've become an alienated with, you're drawing a comparison in a way that they might not have the capacity to draw. You're able to, you're helping them be able to lift things up out of the soup and make inferences about how they're related. Whether it's on a thematic basis, whether it's on an affective basis, whether it's on a behavioral basis, these are all patterns that we're trying to help uh, the patient see. You know, it's kind of like those kids' games that we all used to play at some point, the connect the dots, and you started connecting the dots, and you didn't know quite what the image was going to be, but as you connected the dots, the image slowly emerged. Basically, we're pattern detectors, and what we're trying to do is help the patient learn to recognize and identify their own patterns. And so sometimes we're maybe 
hopefully two or three dots ahead of the patient in constructing that, but then we're revealing the connection between the dots that we've observed to them, and then that helps them become better reflectors on their own process. And some patients have very limited capacity. Uh, I'm seeing a patient I, who reacts very concretely to most of my interventions, and I think I've been seeing her for six years, and I interpret along the way, but she doesn't do much with them at all. And it just seems like every week she comes in, and sometimes she, there's been phases where she's come in as many as three times a week, sometimes twice a week, but usually once a week. Anyway, she just comes in with a new variation on her life history, and it doesn't look like she's done anything with anything that we've talked about, but she comes because she feels heard. And, the, and my relational presence gives her something. But after six years, I was bowled over this summer uh, because she started to remember things that I had said, could recall them in moments of tension, anxiety, stress, or distress, interpersonal conflicts with her husband, remember them, alter her response to her husband because of that, and then remember to tell me about that in the next session. So her capacity to do something with the interpretations I've altered has expanded in a way, and was expanding in a way that I couldn't see until it actually came into the room. It, it's often very mundane like that, to the transformations that are occurring. is simply the capacity to utilize the experience So I don't often tell my patient what's happening in my reverie. I'll use something from my reverie to say something to them about what I think is happening in them. And I'll give a quick example. Ogden says, as is the case with other highly personal emotional experiences of the analyst, he does not often speak with the analysand directly about his experiences, but attempts to speak to the analysis analysand from what he is thinking and feeling. That is, he attempts to inform what he says by his awareness of and groundedness in his emotional experience with the patient. So here's the example. With one patient, I was aware of a desert scene in my mind as the patient was speaking. She's not using any references to desert, but it felt deserty to me. So I could have simply shared the image and said, as you're talking, I'm having a strong image come to me of a desert. Now to me, many people would have, many people working analytically would feel comfortable saying that. And there's nothing necessarily wrong, but for some patients that might be too much. Too much intrusion of my interior imagery or my interior affects for that patient. For me, it didn't feel sufficiently metabolized as the image was still too much my image. I needed to translate it into words associated with the patient. Instead, I chose to say, in what you're describing, I have a strong sense that everything feels rather dry to you, as though you're out in a desert with nothing to drink and have no hope of quenching your thirst with anything around you. Now, to, can you see how I've taken the desert imagery, but I've not given it to her unadulterated? I've woven the imagery of a desert into what she's talking about. You're also projecting. Hmm? You're projecting too. I wouldn't say I'm projecting. I'm say, I would say I'm reacting to the imagery that's emerged. Now, it's possible that I could project in that situation, but based on my how the, the imagery em, emerged to me felt like a response to her rather than a response from my experiences. And her reaction to that, if it was simply projection, she wouldn't have felt seen, heard, or connected to with that intervention. Yeah. But yes, you're absolutely right. There, there can be the danger of projecting... Uh, you know, like uh, 
Nathan Schwartz Lant is a good example. He'll use really graphic stuff from his own reverie that I, I don't agree with utilizing. Uh, you know, and often it's, uh, it can be stuff that's rather graphic aggression or rather graphic sexuality. And he just shares the image directly, and I don't find most of my analysands wouldn't be able to tolerate that kind of intrusive imagery, and I'm not sure that it serves the function he feels it serves. Particularly this day and age. Hmm? Particularly this day and age. Yes, yes, absolutely. Was it? Yeah. found it really helpful to ask the client what their image is. Now, they can't always do it, but when they do come up with it's amazingly powerful. Oh, yeah. It gives a lot of context. Right. Is there a time, I mean, how would you differentiate between when you would use yours versus asking them to come up? Well, as you say, a lot of patients uh, are going to continue, even if you ask them, do you have an image about that? Yeah, I'd much prefer to work with somebody's image if they're able to provide one. Uh, Many patients, even if they're coming thinking they want analytic therapy, aren't able to respond symbolically, which is really what we're asking them to do when we ask them, uh, well, what image do you have of that? And they'll, and they'll respond, continue to respond in a rather concrete way. So I'm going to respond, I'm going to provide something from my imagery when I think they're unable to provide something from their own imagery, or where I think that my image is going to complement their image, but expand it in some way, in a way that they haven't been able to consider before. So if they're producing images, and those images, they're affectively connected to those images, and they're working productively with those images, I'm going to stay out of the way. In other words, I'm going to let their process continue to unfold until they hit some sticking point. You know, and people can be working, and all of a sudden they teeter over the edge, and they're back into whatever complex they're in, and they're no longer in a symbolic mode. And I'll, and then I'll intervene with something from my psyche. So, tr reverie, I think, can be anything. It can be archetypal imagery. It can be something about the transference or my countertransference. It can be a somatic feeling. Uh, it can be an aesthetic response, oh, this is beautiful, oh, this is ugly, an ugly moment or a beautiful moment, uh, or an awkward moment, that's an aesthetic judgment. Uh, it can be a thought, a cognition, it can be a particular affect, it can be an image, it can be almost anything. And that's actually what I want to do is cast my net as broadly as possible to what I let in when I'm sitting with somebody because the very thing that I keep out is probably the thing I need. So like one patient, and it only happened with one patient, there were particular times that I would get this cold shiver down my spine, and I couldn't stop the whole session. I would feel like I was literally sitting under an air conditioning duct. And I kept thinking about what's going on here. You know, it only happened at certain times, it only happened with this patient. And then as I sat with it over a number of months, I realized every time I feel that, I've shifted positions and I'm now colluding with the, one of the patient's complexes, usually her victimization complex, where she sees the world as things being done to her and her being powerless to have any impact on those things. And when I would move into a particular position of empathizing with that, I would begin to get this cold shiver. And so it became, so that's the, that's the somatic reverie. It's coming through my body. It, with her, it, 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 number one, it helped me recover. So as soon as the uh, shivering would start, I would realize, okay, I'm in the collusion again. Uh, I'm not helping her see her way out of the complex. I'm helping her stay in the complex, actually. And I would find a way to shift gears. And I would take, uh, you know, it might be something simple like 
uh, you know, you seem to feel as though the only way to see the situation is that something's being done to you, and you seem to feel as though you have no uh, alternatives in this situation, and perhaps not even any sense of responsibility for how this situation has unfolded. Well, that's a movement out of that victimization complex. But it also sensitized me kind of looking forward of being able to anticipate those situations better and not fall into it as frequently. And there's an important piece about you sort of allowing that to play out for yourself so you didn't sort of preempt it, uh, you know, too, too much getting into t t trying to interpret it early on. Right. You didn't know. Right. And you sort of just had to, just had to wait. Right. Until you could be clear to you. Mm -hmm. So sort of the judgment call of when to speak into that. Right. There's a example that I give uh, that I literally held something for eight years with one patient because I didn't know what was happening. I knew it bothered me, but I didn't know what was happening or what I didn't have anything to offer the patient. So the scenario is that this patient would come in uh, and cry profusely and get mascara all over her face and would wipe her hands with her face, even though there's a tissue box sitting right next to her. And then she would either wipe it on her slacks or wipe it on my pillow that sits on the couch. It was the pillow that created the problem for me because I found that objectionable and I had to keep going and having the pillow cleaned. So it annoyed me. Uh, but I could have said, hey, would you mind not wiping your hands on my pillow? And she would have followed that, she, but it would have been a prohibition and she wouldn't have known anything about herself from it. So I just kept watching it, holding my annoyance, being aware of it for eight years. Now, if this is a very accomplished person who despite difficult circumstances rose to be an executive for multi-million dollar companies. Didn't even, had one year of college. Created an impression that she had finished college, so she got hired, was very successful. Uh, one day, so she eventually decides to go back to college because that would have been a lifelong dream to finish her degree. So she goes back to college very accomplished person. She walks in one day in tears. And I say, what's going on? Because it's immediate. She, she bursts into tears as soon as she walks in the room. And I go, what's going on? And she says, I'm only a third of the way into the semester and I've already filled up my notebook. Okay? So she's bought a spiral-bound notebook, you know, that the sheets don't tear out of. And... I say, what do you mean? She said, I've got this notebook that I bought to take notes in for my classes, and it's already full, and it's all, only a third of the way through the semester. And I'm going, what's going on here? And so I actually respond rather, but the light bulb goes off. I'm going, when it comes to her, she can't see the resources that are available to us. And I'm thinking of the Kleenex box. So I say to her, you know, some people buy a notebook for each class that they're taking. And the astonishment on her face, she goes, really? Now, this is an accomplished person who does many complex financial transactions but she can't figure out how to buy more than one notebook. Can't even conceive that it's possible to do that. It doesn't, there's an obstacle in her mind. And so I say, some people buy more than one notebook. You have trouble seeing what's possible, what's available to you for your use, just as you can't see the Kleenex box 
that sits next to you that's available for your use when you cry. And she looks at the Kleenex box and she said, eight years in now, has that always been there? And I said, yes. Now, I didn't have to prohibit her. She's never once done the same thing again. She knows the tissue box is there. Now, it's not just about the tissue box. It's opened up something in her that's fundamentally different. She can look at the world differently and think, what in the world is available for my use? Now, that's an issue of timing as well as understanding. But sometimes understanding takes a long time. But if she hadn't come in in tears in that day with this difficulty around this notebook, I would have never figured out what was going on with the Kleenex box. Okay. I've got a, one of the things that I did in trying to think about reverie was to think about it as music and image. I think you all are getting the idea of, about what reverie is about, but when I was first thinking about it, I tried, what is reverie? Uh, and since music is important to me and Im image is important, these are just a couple of, I've got a number of these, but I'll just share one or two since we're running short on time, maybe just one, uh, that came to me in response to certain patients. And this one I call shadows.
So I think it's a way of letting our patient's material work on us. When a therapy process begins, we usually don't know what's happening. We try to orient ourselves, try to listen, hoping for a sense of where the person is, what the issues are, what their conscious agenda is for coming into therapy, and what the underlying complexes or conflicts are. However, things are often murky, shrouded in fog, misty, opaque, or obscured. Glimpses are sometimes fleeting and uncertain. Yet this is the time and conditions under which our curiosity is engaged and learning always begins. As the fog clears, potential dangers and pitfalls are revealed. Gradually over time, a bigger picture of the psychic situation begins to unfold and present itself. In the observing psyche, as a reflection of nature, we are trying to be aware of patterns, shifts, textures, and transitions landscapes within the patient's psyche, our own psyches, and the space we jointly inhabit or create. Skip through some of the Knowing and not knowing. This is part of the analytic attitude as well. Wilfred Bion says we must approach every session without memory or desire. Now, he knows literally we can't do that. It's a stance towards the material of, not letting something that we know from yesterday or from last week or the month before to obscure what might be coming to the forward today. He goes on to say, every session attended by the psychoanalyst must have no history and no future. What is known about the patient is of no further consequence. It is either false or irrelevant. If it is known by the patient and analyst, it is obsolete. The analyst should a aim at achieving a state of mind so that every session he feels he has not seen the patient before. Finally, he says, in every consulting room, there ought to be two rather frightened people, the patient and the psychoanalyst. If they are not, one wonders why they are bothering to find out about what everyone knows. <laughs> So this comes to the paradox of knowing and unknowing. So we have to remain unknowing long enough to know what we don't know. But once we know something, then we have a responsibility to say something to the patient. A lot of times uh, in working with candidates who are in analytic training, I'll have them actually transcribe an audio recording of their actual session and bring it into the supervision. Sometimes I've read transcripts where the entire session is them asking questions. Now, questions are fine and necessary, but in doing so, they're not offering anything to the patient of their own psyche. And it's a mutually influential, intersubjective experience. And so we have a responsibility to listen until something coheres in our own mind, and then we have a responsibility to find some way to speak about it. I'm going to try to find this. Oh, okay. For the analyst, analyzing is not an alternative to being helpful. It is the analytic way of being helpful. Now he's speaking about these other interventions like suggestion, advice giving, problem solving, etc. And he goes on to say that when we fail to analyze, we actually interfere with what might come later. I'm trying to get to uh, another set of, I might just pop out of this, and then we'll have a because again, image often, I'll start restart here, uh, and just speak a little bit about <clears throat> something called analytic contact. And here, here, this is my basic orienting tool. It's kind of like Schwartz Salant's thing of leaning into the pathology, leaning into the complex. This is a guy named Robert Waska, who's a modern Kleinian out in California, and he says, Analytic contact is the result of the interaction between the analyst's efforts to work psychoanalytically 
and the patient's psychological capacity and willingness to participate in the process in a relatively open manner. The interaction of influences provides the greatest opportunity, uh, this interaction of influences provides the greatest opportunity for psychic change and growth. So there's a lot in that very short statement, meaning that the analyst may have the capacity, but the patient doesn't. They both can have the capacity, and then the work goes well, or the patient has the capacity and the analyst doesn't, or the therapist doesn't. So here's how I think of Waska's image is, think of the patient as the subject of analysis, or the folk, we can say within a patient are many foci of analysis, many places that we focus on. And the analyst stance can be moving away from that neutral status quo or homeostasis, or moving towards the subject of analysis. So it's all, analysis isn't this monolithic thing. It's analysis is always carried out in a series of moments. So in Waska's model, if the patient is open, ha utilizes relatively limited defenses and resistance, and the analyst has good analytic technique and a good analytic attitude, then analytic contact is likely. The, the subject of analysis can be engaged. If the patient is closed, defended, and resistant, but the analysis, the analyst has good technique and attitude, analytic contact is possible. If the patient is open and their defenses are limited, but the analyst is non-analytic in his orientation, contact is possible but unlikely because the patient can't do their own work for themselves. They need an assistant to do that work. If the patient is closed and defended, and the analyst is non-analytic in their orientation, analytic contact really isn't possible except for the intervention from uh, the objective psyche. And this is an image of what I think we're trying to do. This is uh, a sculpture in Philadelphia by a guy named Zenos Frudakis. And it's such a, I think this is the state that patients often come to us in. If we think of this wall as kind of their psychological encumbrances, the limitations that have been created by their life experiences, by their complexes, and that it's a gradual moving outward, breaking free from these psychological encumbrances. So that's how I kind of visualize for me mentally what happens in analysis, is we're hoping to achieve this state with the patient. But even if we achieve this state, that's quite an accomplishment. It's even more evocative when you see it up close and you see some of the features that uh, you can see how in the beginning the, 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 the being is somewhat featureless. They blend into the wall. And in this second panel, the figure has begun to take on some features, particular in the face. The body becomes a little bit more defined. This you can actually begin to feel the separation. And in this one you can feel the relief and the joy that comes from the removal of encumbrances. This would be what Jung would call the transcendent position, that they have transcended these previous circumstances and are now able to operate in a new way. So we're almost out of time. Let's close with that image and just see if there's, we've got about five minutes, and see if there's any responses or discussion that we'd like to have to... Um, I forget, it's now actually, it was uh, a headquarters for a company called PKG, and they commissioned the statue. He, he really does remarkable work. He does both figurative work like this and more accurate representational work. Uh, 
but he's got a number of sculptures that are not like this, but in this mode of representing an experience. And it was uh, originally by a company called PKG, and they uh, essentially uh, donated the building, and it's now a charter school. Yeah. Hmm? Um, looking at that, I couldn't help but um, see the embeddedness in light of um, possibly something you're going to teach us <laughs> in, the, uh, in our lecture uh, series the next two days, and that is the function of language. Yeah. And the you know structuralist, post-structuralist ideas about the nature of the psyche. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, and so that's kind of exciting to me. Yeah. You know, when you showed that, I, I knew that this was what it was all about, and I didn't want to preempt what you were going to say, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's fascinating to see what we do in that life. Right, exactly. And this is actually, you, the whole sculpture is a metaphor, which is what we'll be right, talking right. about. Uh, and if I can find uh, the passage... Because Fredakis actually makes, uh, if I can find his words here. Oh, I don't have the words. Uh, I don't have his words in this passage. Uh, but he's he has a nice statement about this, and it's connected. It was connected to his own creative process and the encumbrant working through his own encumbrances that inspired the uh, the sculpture. But I'll so this comes to mind with a patient of mine who at the time was in his 60s when he said this. Uh, he who was a pianist who was. Uh, in his 10th year of analysis, and after being a performer and an accompanist for a number of years, had started to compose music for the first time since his undergraduate musical education 40 years ago. In reflecting on this new development, he said, we've rid my mind of so much garbage that I'm finally free to be me and to be creative and to let pretty things come into my mind. <laughs> Well, Mark, All right. You may not be a pretty thing, but we're glad you came out. Oh, I'm not? <laughs> Gosh. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right, thanks everyone for the warm reception. This actually marks the 15th time I'm giving this presentation, so I feel quite blessed to have given it so many places. And this is such a warm environment. You've got really a great thing going here, and uh, I hope you're appreciative of that. It sounds like uh, there's such a warm feeling connection amongst everyone here. While this presentation is going on, about 60% of it is actually not me speaking. About 60% of it is blues performances by blues men and women, both well-known and slightly known. So blues is a body music, and it's okay to be tapping your toes, rocking back and forth in your seats, and if you want to get up and dance a little bit, that's okay too. So the blues has been a significant companion for me since I was about 13. Actually, the blues is responsible for me standing here today, literally. When I came out of the Army, I was still quite young, 30 years old, kind of square, you could say, and not great at uh, emoting my emotional affective life. Now, when you apply for analytic training, at least in the interregional, you go through two days of very intensive interviews, both individually and with groups of analysts. And they're not really interested in knowing what you know. I knew a lot of stuff already. They were interested in who I was as a person and what I could do with that. Could I access it or not? I actually applied one time uh, 
1991 and got turned down, they said I was a little bit too green, too young, and my sense was in between the lines was you can't quite bring it up. So the next time I applied was two years later, and Stevie Ray Vaughan had just died about a year before in a helicopter crash in Wisconsin. And uh, his band, Double Trouble, reformed to form uh, a group called Archangels. And they composed a song called See What Tomorrow Brings about Stevie's death and its impact on them. And I would get so broken up listening to that song. Each time I talk about it, I still get broken up. And so I put that song, this was pre-digital, 1993, all they had was cassettes then. So I put that song on a cassette and I tucked the cassette player in my pocket. And before each one of those interviews, I'd listen to that song, I'd get all broken up inside, and then I had no trouble bringing my emotion to the surface during those interviews. So without Stevie, without the blues, I would not be standing here today. They would not have let me in. So the music is about hearing and resonating with the pain, suffering, joy, or sadness in the voice of the blues singer. The understanding of the blues comes through the direct experience of the music rather than through the intellect. Understanding the blues is similar to Carl Jung's perspective on images. He says image and meaning are identical. The pattern needs no interpretation. It portrays its own meaning meaning. In light of this, my aim is to let the musicians speak for themselves as much as possible tonight. Before we go further, I'd like to begin with a song by Robert Johnson, who is generally considered the greatest bluesman who ever recorded. He wasn't the first bluesman to be recorded, nor did he ever achieve much fame or recognition during his lifetime outside of those who heard him play at their local juke joints, street corners, and house parties. He lived from 1911 to 1938, dying at the age of 27 as a result of drinking whiskey that had been poisoned by the jealous boyfriend of a woman he'd taken an interest in. During his life, he recorded 29 songs during two different recording sessions in 1936 and 1937, Dallas, Texas. However, it wasn't until the re-release of Johnson's recordings in 1961 that he came to have tremendous influence on the emerging folk and rock movements. The montage of photographs which accompanies the song is comprised of images of blues singers, past and present, both well-known and obscure. The first and last images are the only known images of Johnson. I've 
The word the blues is derived from the term blue devils, which referred to contrary spirits that hung around and created sadness. I believe it's the capacity of the blues to speak at an archetypal level about universally felt experiences that give power to the blues for both the performer and the audience. Classical scholar Maud Bodkin speaks about the archetypal themes in poetry which stir the emotions of the reader. The music of the blues is the only genre specifically co uh, created for the evocation of an emotional response. In fact, the phrase the blues refers to both the music and a feeling. While all forms of music create a connection on an emotional level, it is only with the blues that this becomes the primary focus of the creative act. A lot of people wonder what is the blues. I hear a lot of people saying the blues, the blues. But I'm going to tell you what the blues is. When you ain't got no money, you got the blues. When you ain't got no money to pay your house rent, you still got the blues. A lot of people talk about, I don't like no blues, but when you ain't got no money and can't pay your house rent and can't buy you no food, you damn sure. 
talk about the life of a human being, how they live. The blues sound is generally raw and primitive. It has some basic but fluid forms. It's called up out of the prima materia of life and has never lost touch with the base elements of human ex existence. The origins of the blues reflect its austere beginnings, with the early blues performers relying only on guitar, harmonica, and vocals to communicate their message. The overarching themes are emotional and spiritual rather than rational. Some of the primal essence of the blues is portrayed in the following informal front porch video of Belton Sutherland filmed by musicologist Alan Lomax. Just like a union, they 
got no darling The early influences of the blues originate in West Africa, transported to America by African slaves. In West Africa, there is a term, the griot, which is used to refer to a tribal singer, but also refers to a tribe's archive of musical stories, which preserve the, the tribe's history and culture. The blues carries on this tradition of musical lore with timeless songs that are continuously remade because of the emotional depth and wisdom they possess. The griot singer commonly accompanied himself on an instrument referred to as a halam, or in other African dialects, the banjo. In this video excerpt, you can hear the monotone drone of their one-stringed instruments, which remains an important characteristic of Delta blues, like you just heard with Belton Sutherland. These repetitive drone-like patterns or riffs that create a hypnotic pull beneath the singer's words. Also present are the call and response patterns between singers that became a common characteristic of the African American church. commonalities are kind of astonishing, really. The first generation of African slaves sang African songs and chants, possibly similar to the ones just heard. White slave owners repressed traditional African drumming and worship of African deities for fear that those influences could incite revolts. Westerners also considered African music primitive because it emphasized rhythm rather than harmony and melody. It seems likely that this reaction occurred because rhythmically based music appeals more directly to the body and encourages movement. Thus, the blues might be considered the shadow or antithesis of Western musical form. By the second generation, those African songs were quickly being replaced by work songs with the difficulty, difficult conditions of their harsh new environment as the focus. These songs, often referred to as Arhulis, eased the passage of time during work and helped coordinate their collective efforts.
Dr. Cornell West, Harvard professor of African American studies and also instructor at Harvard Divinity School in the, doc in the documentary Chasing Train, said, black music was the black response to being terrorized and traumatized. It spread some soothing sweetness against the backdrop of a dark catastrophe. As John Spencer puts it, only the very specific sociological, cultural, economic, psychological, and political force forces fa faced by working class African Americans, forces permeated with racism produce the blues. Only the complex web of racist oppression suffered by blacks at the hands of whites produced the blues. Regardless of the many types of suffering with which the blues deals with in the manifest content of the songs. Similarly, in the process of analytic therapy, we frequently observe how the repressive and suppressive influences of the psyche operate similarly to the oppressive forces within a particular collective culture, and how these forces can create the conditions necessary for the development of the blues and its manifestation in the form of grief, depression, worry, and loneliness. Just as great emphasis is placed on the importance of emotional expression in analytic therapy as part of the healing process, the blues might be seen as a means of transcending the immediate experience of oppression through creative musical expression. The Arhulis also became adapted to the work life in the prisons and on chain gangs. These brutal institutions, places such as Mississippi State Penitentiary, also known as Parchman Farm, or the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, eventually made their way into the emerging mythology of the blues in songs such as Parchman Farm Blues. <laughs>
you can hear in, in the lyrics that uh, he's almost making an existential statement, boiling down all of his existence to this one question, how long until I can change my clothes, that the existence was so brutal that it narrowed his attention onto one simple experiential act. As you could see, some of these fields that they would work in went on beyond the horizon. I mean, you couldn't see the end of the field, and they would be out there from daybreak until sundown. Bucka White was actually a resident at Parchman Farm, so he, he wrote the song from firsthand experience. It's impossible to identify when the unique pattern of musical form, now labeled the blues, first emerged. However, most evidence suggests that it originated in the Delta Cotton country of northwest Mississippi during the late 1800s from the work songs of former slaves, sharecroppers, and chain gang prisoners. In contrast to the thematic patterns found in West African story songs, which focused largely on collective themes and concerns, the music of the blues is typically sung from an individual's perspective, but about issues and emotional experiences common to all. For example, lost love, joy, sexuality, rage, sadness, and grief. It speaks of oppression, addiction, migration, the outlaw, and the trickster. Stephen Diggs asserts that the emergence of the solo performer of the blues and his focus on individual experiences was a result of the introjection, the taking in of the eye or ego of the West by the rural, unskilled African American. A moving example of the immediacy of this individual experience is seen in Death Letter Blues performed by Sun House. <laughs> Yeah, 
Okay, um, it starts, uh, I got a letter this morning, uh, I got a letter this morning, uh, got a letter this morning, huh? Hurry, hurry, the gal you love is dead, uh, second verse is, the second verse is, I packed up my suitcase, I took off down the road, by the time I got there, she was laid out on the cool and board. I walked up right close. I looked her in the eyes. Uh, I said, uh, let's see, uh, this good old gal got to lay here to judgment day. No, yeah, I, I walked up right close. I looked in her eyes. I said, this good old gal got to lay here to judgment day. Must have been 10,000 people standing around her burying ground. Uh, I didn't know I loved her till they laid her in the ground. Um, I walked in my room. I, bent, I bowed my head to pray. The blues came in and drove my spirit away. Um, yeah. Yeah. Life. My my sister. My mother. My good gal. And my wife. Yeah. The blues philosophy expressed through the music includes the idea that the blues is something to be accepted, not something to be gotten rid of or fixed. The blues is experienced, lived through, and survived, not conquered or overcome. Contrast that to our contemporary attitude. One hopes to eventually feel better, but the intent is to acknowledge and cope with the deeply visceral experience of the blues. Most often, the listener has the sense that the singer is communicating observations rather than complaints. Always underlying the effort to survive the blues is the assumption and acceptance that the blues will return again, later to be dealt with again the ongoing cycle of the fall and redemption, death and resurrection, the mythologem of the great round. This is reflected in the title of a song by Muddy Waters, There's No Escape from the Blues, and also in the song Hard Times Ain't Going Nowhere by Lonnie Johnson, who sings, people raving about hard times, I don't know why they should. If some people was like me, they didn't have no money when times was good. The same attitude is reflected in Jung's comments in answer to Job. It is far better to admit the affect and submit to its violence than to try to escape it. The violence is meant to penetrate to a man's vitals and he to succumb to its action. He must be affected by it, otherwise the full effect will not reach him. But he should know or learn to know what has affected him, for in this way he transforms the blindness of the violence on the one hand and of the affect on the other into knowledge. The blues philosophy is implicit in the fo following video of Big Mama Thornton who engages the blues with strength, quiet dignity, and intensity. Europe. This is a song I wrote, made famous by me and Janice Yapper. I'm I wrote this song called Ball and Chain. I hope you like it. Sit by my window.
I get goosebumps or tears or both each time I watch that. That is something. Charles Keel, in his book Urban Blues, makes an important contribution to blues scholarship by identifying the close parallels between the role of the bluesman in the African American community and the role of the African American preacher. He provides insight into the importance of psychological commitment on the part of the audience and how that relates to the capacity of the music to affect an emotional shift in the audience. Building on these insights, Keel proposes that the role of the bluesmen is more of a belief role rather than a creative role and more priestly than artistic. In this next late career performance by Coco Taylor, we can feel the deep psychological commitment to the experience she is singing about and the full engagement of her audience. What we want to do right about now is get right on down with the blues. Are you ready for the blues? I say, are you ready for the blues? Because we're going all the way down in the basement. been warned. You've been warned. Don't mess with Coco. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of reverie in the blues. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of reverie in the blues. And there's a video coming up of a of an actual uh, Mississippi juke joint, and I think you'll see some of that there as well, or at least significant experiences of participation mystique. Despite the frequent focus on suffering, there are other facets to the blues which create a tension of opposites for the singer and the audience. 
blueswoman Von Zula Hunt says the blues are a sad thing and a rejoicing thing. A good example of this tension of opposites, which as you're aware Jung focused on quite a bit, this tension of opposites of the blues can be heard in the lyrics to T-Bone Walker's Stormy Monday, where he sings, The eagle flies on Friday, and Saturday I go out to play, invoking the listener's anticipation of payday and the associated pleasures and excesses which will take place on Saturday night. But as the song continues, Walker sings, Sunday I go to church, and I kneel down and pray, and this is what I say, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy on me. In making this movement within the song, Walker juxtaposes the sacred and the profane. Within the reality of the blues, good and evil, love and hate, staying or leaving, coexist side by side without an experience of internal contradiction. Many blues performers such as Sun House, Reverend Gary Davis, Blind Willie Johnson, and Mississippi Fred McDowell included both blues and spiritual tunes in their repertoires. Often these spiritual songs are referred to as gospel blues, as in the following example by Boyd and Ruth May Rivers. Nothing but fine, my boy.
Now they're doing that in their living room. Can you imagine what that was like at the front of a church? <laughs> wow. Often the blues is a celebration of life, living, lust, sensuality, and joy, as in the following two examples by Howlin' Wolf and Bonnie Raitt.
That was a tribute concert to Stevie Ray Vaughan at Austin City Limits after he had died, and she's playing with Stevie Ray's ba band Double Trouble there, playing one of Stevie's songs. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know who else recorded it. I, I recognized it, but I can't remember who it was. But we'll get to another example of that soon. Okay. Um. <laughs> and maybe that will be satisfying. While the African diaspora initiated the original genesis of the blues, the Great Migration fueled the evolution of the blues. The Great, Great Migration was the mass movement between 1915 and 1960 of about five million southern blacks to the north, midwest, and west in search of economic prosperity and civil liberty. As many blues singers moved away from their southern rural roots, their themes shifted to the concerns of their new urban environment, and their sound became electrified to rise above the noise of the cities. B.B. King exemplifies this shift to electrified instrumentation and a more sophisticated style, yet his music remains grounded in the same prima materia of everyday emotional life. In the following performance, you'll be able to see how King accents the emotional tone through the interplay between his voice and his guitar Lucille, how he subtly integrates the guitar as a second aspect of his voice, creating a dialogue between word and musical note.
BB got his start on Beale Street, as you know. In addition to being a performer, he was also a disc jockey at WDIA in Memphis, Tennessee. It is in the power to transcend boundaries of individual and group experience that the blues speaks and act most powerfully. Building on the work of Carl Jung and concepts such as participation mystique and the unus mundus, the one mind, Jungian analyst Eric Neumann uses the phrase unitary reality to describe experiences in which the boundaries and distinction between individuals and between individuals in the world become blurred, resulting in an experience of a shared reality. Such experiences are common to the blues. By introducing the new concept of unitary reality to the discourse of analytical psychology, Neumann hopes to address what he perceived as a pejorative attitude towards psychological experiences in which individual subjectivity becomes blurred. Such experiences have tended to be interpreted as being more primitive or implying a diminishment of consciousness. Neumann preferred to interpret such experiences as potentially expanding our knowledge of the field within which we are embedded. The theories of Jung and Neumann helped identify broader interconnectedness between individuals in the world, both seen and unseen, known and unknown, that we now see paralleled in the field of quantum physics and in the concept of quantum reality, in which all experiences and events are inextricably interwoven. Neumann defined unitary reality as a reciprocal coordination between world and psyche, a coordination which is based on the archetypal structure which embraces both, or of which both are partial aspects, and which leads to an emotionally toned unitary experience. The blues is an, a manifestation of the archetypal field that constitutes unitary reality. Blues musician Little Whit Wells says, you know, the blues is a trance music. If it can't take you there, it ain't worth the effort. <laughs> and if folks can't get there, well, I guess it's not meant for them. This blurring can occur between music, musician and the music, between performer and instrument, and between audience and performer. This close but relaxed synchrony can be felt between husband and wife performers Susan Tedeschi and Derek Trucks during a performance of Rollin' and Tumblin' Blues at the White House.
This shared experience, the unitary reality between audience and performers, is vividly depicted in the following film rec recorded at Junior Kimbrough's Juke Joint near Chulahoma, Mississippi. The song depicted in the film is over eight minutes long, so I've edited it down to about four minutes. <laughs> Now, did you see there was only one person in that room not having a good time? <laughs> only one person resisting the force. 
Not getting with the groove. When a blues musician refers to him or herself as a blues person or a bluesman, he is not only referring to the type of music he plays, but also the type of life he has led and the attitude he has about life. It's an orientation to life in which the surrounding world is seen as being alive and insists on being engaged with. It is in this last sense that the blues begins to comment upon or amplify what Jung called the anima mundi, or the world soul. An awareness of the world soul can be detected in many blues songs, such as T-Bone Walker's Mean Old World, where he sings, This is a mean old world to live in by yourself. Or The Sky is Crying by Elmore James, performed here by Albert King, where the tears of the singer and the tears of the world run together. <laughs> This is another long one, so I had to clip that one a bit short. As I've outlined above, attending a blues performance is a shared experience of the unitary reality or participation mystique of blues consciousness. The blues performer and the blues audience are both making an internal reference about what it is like to have the blues and realizing the other one also knows. Most often, this reference is made through the lyrics of a song with support provided to the ritual by the performer's instrumentation and gestures. However, at times, the experience of the blues is simply communicated by moans, as in this in the rendition of Rollin' and Tumblin' by Babyface Leroy, Muddy Waters, and Little Walter, or in Howlin' Wolf's introduction to Moanin' at Moonlight. <laughs> have some close parallels to the role and activities of the shaman. As we've seen, particularly with Howlin' Wolf in that early uh, video we saw of him sitting and holding the dollar bill, or the $20 bill, many shamanic elements have relevance to the experience of the blues performance and the blues myth as well. Noted mythologist Mercy Eliotti identifies a number of specific, specific characteristics of the shamanic role, such as the shamanic calling, the initiatory sickness and initiation, the obtainment of shamanic powers, the shamanic cosmology, and the shamanic cure, which was often facilitated by the use of trance. 
Shamanism is an aggregate of religion, magic, art, ritual, and performance, which falls within the domain of unitary reality, just as the blues does. Jungian analyst Robin Van Loben Sells, who is Don Kalshed's wife, in investigating common characteristics of shamanic practice, identifies eight primary attributes which most shamans utilize in their shamanic role. Gesture, mask, sound, silence, rhythm, repetition, respiration, and movement. Really, mask is the only one that bluesmen don't incorporate there. Most, if not all, of these attributes are consistently utilized by blues performers. The descriptions of shamanic practice and explanations of shamanic modes of healing provide a compelling explanation for the appeal and psychological power of the blues and the bluesmen. The blues artist, by willingly entering into the state of blues possession, and by using his creative imagination to depict some aspect of daily life that he and the listener can connect to, transforms that experience and creates a third thing, which alters how the original stimulus for the song is perceived or experienced. In alchemical terms, the listener is then also inducted into the process of transforming the painful or mundane into something richer. The listener becomes the soarer mystica to the bluesman adept. This is literally a depiction of the alchemical process by which the prima materia of daily life becomes transformed through the experience of unitary reality. We'll turn to a very informal juke joint performance by R.L. Burnside in which Burnside using an amalgam of his voice, tone, and words. The sway of his body and the expressions of his face creates an inductive connection with the audience, but one which constellates a variety of reactions amongst those gathered. In fact, I think this is the one that I, the first song I performed tonight. <laughs> That's actually the full length of that video. It doesn't, uh, there, there's not another part of that that exists actually. It's important to recognize that the influence of the blues extends well beyond individual experience. The blues has been shaped by and has shaped the collective culture of the United States and the world. The blues has been in an ongoing dialogue with jazz almost since their mutual inceptions. Without the blues, there would be no soul, R&B, rap, or hip-hop. The blues has also been a significant impact on country music. And without the blues, there would be no rock and roll. In fact, Robert Johnson, the itinerant, impoverished, illiterate grandson of slaves from rural Mississippi, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986 
as an early influence on rock and roll. The blues were the foundation for many of the early British invasion bands of the 1960s, such as the Rolling Stones, the Animals, Led Zeppelin, the Yardbirds, and Cream. The sound they were after was explicitly based on the blues. This trend is also seen in the American side of the ocean, perhaps never so clearly as with a young man from Tupelo, Mississippi named Elvis, who in 1956 covered a Big Mama Thornton song, which she originally released in <laughs> For those of you who are interested in blues, the guitarist in both of the Big Mama Thornton bands is a young buddy guy before he became well known on his own. As we begin to move towards a conclusion, I invite you to slip into the blues world of Skip James, who of all the early bluesmen, created perhaps the most otherworldly atmosphere with his songs. This song, Hard Time Killing Floor Blues, performed here by Chris Thomas King, was first recorded in 1931, and yet it retains the capacity to fully infiltrate our psychic landscape, bringing his suffering into communion with our suffering. <laughs> Baby! 
Hopefully this has served as an introduction to some salient features of the blues. In our increasingly isolated and technologically engrossed culture, there are few and fewer opportunities to move into these shared experiences of unitary reality in which the bubble of our individualism is pierced and we're able to move into felt relational connection to our environment and those around us. The blues allows us to move into a deeper communion with our own emotional life, especially the more difficult emotions that are often shunned in our relentless pursuit of happiness, material acquisition, and activities designed to occupy time rather than expand soul. Often it is only by moving into and through sadness that we can be released into the experience of joy. The blues facilitates that process. In this regard, the bluesman, by communicating feelings in song that resonate with the listener, serves as a modern-day shaman who heals through the ritual of music. The blues originated in experiences of trauma, oppression, and enslavement, but now serve to liberate our emotional lives and facilitate a deeper union with our environment and those around us. Robert Johnson, Big Mama Thornton, Muddy Waters, and Howlin' Wolf, all have something significant to contribute to the care of our soul. So we've got about 10 minutes or so, approximately. Shall we have a little discussion about this? And Owen? Yeah, I was wondering, um, you, you, uh, you didn't, we didn't hear say Steve Urich, but um, do you think that the blues translate differently with cultural experience such as uh, a white performer versus black or even uh, you know, other I think it, it's a difficult question. Uh, I think it translates and I think it opens up something for other cultures that perhaps they don't have access to. Uh, it was interesting the first time I presented uh, this in Zurich, the one Mike was at, and my my host or an MC or whatever you want to call her in, introducer for the evening was a woman, an older woman from uh, the institute there who had lived her life in Switzerland and obviously came from a very different culture. And uh, she came up to me the next day and she said, I don't know what happened exactly, uh, 
but I had a very disturbing dream. And it w but she wasn't complaining about it. She said, I know that whatever I saw last night moved something deeply in me. She didn't have words for it, but in her culture, which is kind of a, uh, in, uh, an introverted, kind of quiet, um, I would say a private culture, it really moved something in her. And it, it's interesting, when I, when I presented it at, uh, in Houston, uh, it was the most mixed racially audience uh, that I've had in presenting this. Uh, and one uh, African-American woman came up afterwards and said, can I hug you? Uh, and she said, uh, this is the most, uh, I forget her ex the, the adjective she used, but essentially the most uh, sensitive treatment of something from her culture by something, someone out of her culture that she had experienced. Uh, yeah. If I could just add to that, I inspired the question. I was reflecting as I listened to some of this on my experience of the performance that I saw. I think of Robert Johnson of Crossroads, mm -hmm. and um, and of course Cream's rendition. Yeah, very different. And but uh, not not uh, there. There's also a um, an aspect which translates well yeah you know even though it's clearly a different cultural experience and i would think you know that that um, even a person that comes out of the tradition of the mississippi blues uh would appreciate what the what cream did with that song. oh absolutely i know they did uh you know when you when you listen to the interviews of when uh, the Rolling Stones were coming over, and uh, none of the American audiences knew who these guys were, you know. And they're coming over, and they're saying, like, "Take us to the House of Muddy Waters. Take us to Chess Records." And they're going, "They're the people that are." They didn't know. They didn't know. And so it's through. It was literally through the appreciation of these blues guys in the early 1960s and them promoting and saying, go find these records, go find these guys, go find these women. Uh, and that's what really resurrected, essentially by the end of the 1950s, as rock and roll was taking over in America, a lot of the careers of these guys were dying out. And uh, Rolling Stones and Cream and these other bands resurrected them, and they had another really good 20-year run after that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first 150 pages of Keith Richards' autobiography is all about that. It's really great reading. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah, you need to enjoy it. Uh, any more comments on uh, gospel and blues and how they work together or don't work together? Well, I think that, uh, you know, like I said, there in, in the in the blues and gospel traditions. Now there are there were certainly people in the African American church who did not approve of the blues and didn't approve of. They called it the devil's music, and they didn't approve of musicians, and they thought they were somewhat shiftless, and perhaps they were. Uh, but uh, I, I think what they're using the same chord structures in these spiritual songs uh, and they're singing for me from the same place the same place in their heart uh, and i think you know, for me i make no distinction between boyd and ruth may rivers singing uh you know wrapped up in jesus in their front room you know and uh, coco taylor singing about swinging a bat at her, this woman who's her competition. Uh, it's just, sung, you know, it's about the emotion, uh, and sometimes that emotion is about love, and sometimes that emotion is about God. Now, I always thought, or I guess a musician told me this, that the difference between blues and a bluesy song is that blues has 12 bars. Actually, blues is sometimes eight bars, sometimes it's 12 bars, sometimes it's 16 bars. Uh, John Lee Hooker 
uh, was notorious for not uh, counting measures and he would expect his band to follow along whenever he changed chords. <laughs> uh, and like uh, a lot of the Mississippi, uh, North Mississippi Hill Country Blues like the R.L. Burnside and the Jesse May Hemp Hell are one chord vamps. Uh, and so they're, they're just repeating a riff over one chord and so there's no way to classify it as a 12 bar or 8 bar they just go until they've run out of lyrics, uh, you know, because they're playing essentially the same riff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tonight, when you were mentioning the bylines, how did you fit him as necessary? Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, I, 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 it was probably the BB uh, King video, and you know, they're just giving little facts on this BBC radio show that they were. Uh, Showing, and I, I, I forget exactly what Steve the record. Walker. <laughs> T Bone Walker said that he liked Frank Sinatra. Okay, and that that would fit because T Bone was a very sophisticated blues man, and I'd highly recommend listening to his songs. And he could play all the jazz chord changes, and he had a very sophisticated style that actually BB copied a lot of his stuff, copied a lot of his way of approaching and orchestrating songs. Uh, and so it doesn't surprise me that T-Bone Walker would uh, look up to Frank Sinatra, who was, I don't know whether he did his own arrangements or whether he had a musical director that did his arrangements, but he had really sophisticated jazz arrangements to his uh, songs. All right, well, thanks for coming out tonight and uh, enjoyed having a and hope to see a few of you out tomorrow morning. Well, and my thanks to Mike for the initiation of the inv invitation and to John and the board for uh, going along with that. I appreciate it. I've had a great time here this weekend and Really appreciate the warm reception you all have given me. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, this is this for the people who came to the um, cultivating the analytic attitude presentation yesterday. This act, this presentation is actually normally part of that whole presentation when I have a longer time period. So this is very integral to that same process. But it's also part of the process, part of the presentation that if you're not a therapist, if you're not a, an analyst, or don't have any desire or intention, you're just interested in Jung's ideas and Jung's way of thinking, this is the part of that lecture that really applies to everyone's life. So this seminar focuses on the metaphorical qualities of the human mind. The emphasis on metaphor and analytic therapy is one aspect which distinguishes it from other forms of therapy. Analytical psychology in particular, of all of the analytic therapies, has the most highly refined relationship to metaphor. And we'll go into that in more depth as this unfolds. The deep relationship with metaphor is one of the greatest strengths of analytical psychology. This is from Jose Ortega y Gassat. So many things fail to interest us simply because they don't find in us enough surfaces on which to live. And what we have to do then is to increase the number of planes in our mind so that a much larger number of themes can find a place in it at the same time. Right now we're in a uh, an atmosphere in which there's pressure to reduce the number of planes in our mind. <laughs> Thought, reflection, depth, complexity are all under attack. This presentation is the opposite of that. This is opening up to complexity, opening up to depth, opening up to different levels. 
metaphor is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as the, a figure of speech in which a name or descriptive term is transferred from some object different from but analogous to that to which it is properly applicable. It derives from the Greek verb metaphora, which refers to transfer or transport, to change by carrying. So one thing is carried from one area to another. That in itself, carry, is a metaphor. The transformative potential of metaphor depends on both similarity and difference, both distinctiveness and connection of its components. Often we think of myths, fairy tales, religious motifs, and alchemical themes primarily as systems of symbolic material or archetypal material, representations of the collective unconscious. But at a, the most fundamental level, all of these things, fairy tales, myths, alchemy, religious motifs, they're all metaphors. Whatever else they are to you, whether they're a matter of personal religious faith, they also operate as metaphors. To put it a bit more simply, a metaphor is a figure of speech, although it could also be an image, in which a word or phrase literally denoting one kind of object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a likeness or analogy between them. For example, the ship plows the sea is a metaphor which reveals the similarity between the prow of a ship passing through the water and a plow passing through soil. So this isn't a new idea. Aristotle in De Poetica, 335 BC, says, to do metaphor well is to discern similarities. So yesterday we were talking about analytic therapists are pattern detectors. This is part of those patterns. Metaphor can be defined as the utilization of one conceptual imaginal domain to map or articulate the characteristics of a different conceptual imaginal domain. In the use of metaphor, there is a juxtaposition between different domains resulting in a transfer of meaning from one to another. Another way of thinking about metaphor is that it serves as a bridge from one realm to another, linking the two realms in a way not previously seen. So today, more so than yesterday, I'm going to depend on the audience for participation in this. So what comes to mind when we hear the snow blankets the ground? Sleeping. Anyone else? Protection. Okay. Suffocation. Okay. Covering up. Covering up. Hiding. Hiding. Yeah, comfort. Okay. Anything else? Cold. Hmm? Cold. Cold. Okay. So what we have so far is sleeping, protection, suffocation, covering, hiding, comfort, beauty, cold, pristine, enhancement, and uniformity. And so you can see that the associations, this is what Jung would call an association, is what it comes up. If, we, if this was a dream, we would be do, gathering the associations to the dream right now. Some of the associations are to more associated with the snow itself, and some of the associations are more associated with the image of blanketing, there weren't many associations to ground, interestingly. So the ground seemed left out of the associations that we gathered here. Even hmm? hidden. hidden. It could be hidden. Yep. So it says something about the completeness and thickness, 
with which the ground is covered by snow. The metaphor invokes the image of a blanket on a bed. It might evoke in the speaker or the listener something about warmth, protection, and slumber until a period of awakening. These become the associations which form the underpinnings of the way in which snow covers the ground. From this emerges an image of the earth sleeping and protected by the snow cover until it's awakening in the spring. So you can see there's even more levels that are possible here. Without realizing it, metaphor shapes our development, the way we perceive the world. It prepares us for action. It molds our artistic endeavors and so on. Metaphor is ubiquitous. As a guy named, uh, two authors, Lakoff and Turner, say, metaphor is a tool so ordinary that we use it unconsciously and automatically. It is om omnipresent. Metaphor suffuses our thoughts no matter what we are thinking about. Metaphor allows us to understand ourselves and our world in, no, in a way that no other modes of thought can. Now, Lakoff and Turner are philosophical cognitive neuroscientists. So they study how the brain works, how language is formed, and also develop philosophies about language based on that research. As a woman named uh, Vivona says, metaphor joins the new with the known, lending a sense of familiarity to the unfamiliar. This is another one of these cognitive uh, scientists in a book called The Poetics of the Mind. Uh, Raymond Gibbs says, human cognition is fundamentally shaped by various poetic and figurative processes, and these processes develop very early in children. In other words, metaphor is literally shaping the way the mind works. A metaphor is a figure of speech, yet it is not limited to the linguistic realm. The fact that language, actions, art, and religions can be metaphorical points to the fundamental importance of the metaphorical function for the mind. Metaphor is not only a phenomenon of language, nor even one of thought, but of mentation, which includes thoughts, desires, and feelings. So it really is all-encompassing. To illustrate Borbley's point about art serving as a metaphorical function of the mind, I'd like us to take a brief look at a visual metaphor that actually lacks representation. In this case, the Rothko Chapel in Houston, Texas, which opened in 1971. So the chapel has an angular postmodern simplicity of design. And all of the Rothko uh, consulted on the construct, the architectural details and painted all of the paintings that are in the chapel. And all of the paintings look like this. They surround the entire room and the only thing in the chapel are these simple wooden benches. Here's a lit the what would be called the altarpiece. And here's another closer view. The paint No, actually they're not blank. <laughs> but that's an interesting uh, observation or, or reaction. And that was my first reaction in being in the Rothko Chapel. They do look like, uh, they actually look less varied in person than they do in these these photographs because of the way the, the, uh, the lighting of the photograph is actually putting more light into the image than actually exists there. They actually look at first glance, rather uniformly black and unvarying, okay? But the experience is, the longer you sit with them, the more texture you see and the more gradation of hues from black to purple to blue, 
that are actually in the paintings, but it doesn't reveal itself to you except over time spent with the painting. You literally have to sit in front of these paintings 10 or 15 minutes before you start to see these t details in terms of the hue and the texture. So what do you think is the intention, the metaphor, the artist Rothko, Mark Rothko, is attempting to get at? The invisible and the visible. Okay. Okay. Slowing down. Okay. Silence. Silence. It is very silent in the chapel, and the chapel evokes silence. Yeah. Mystery. Mystery. What some people call hermeticism. The occult, the, the hidden within the, wor uh, the world. Back here. Uh, I've been here, and I felt a sense of, like, kind of universality and inclusion there, because there are no there that make you feel as for excuse it to a particular Mm-hmm. And next. Um, attention or looking again changes experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that takes us right into quantum physics and the Heisenberg principle, the, the Heisenberg observer principle, that the observer in the experiment changes the outcome of the experiment. Simplicity? Invites contemplation. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it, that there, it, the metaphor is not communicated through a representation. It's created through an, ex, in this case, it's created through an experience. It's rather fascinating. Here's what some people have said about this. Uh, the paintings are huge foreboding canvases which seem at first glance to be mere black panels. Upon further inspection one sees the varying shades within the darkness and the different kinds of black and different textures on the canvas. Nevertheless the overall impression of featureless darkness is unmistakable. Only with time spent sitting in front of and in relationship to the paintings do they gradually reveal gradations of hue and texture. Rothko's paintings represent isolation, solitude, and hermeticism. However, these elements are not conveyed by an image but through experience. Meditating on the paintings creates a metaphorical experience. As the author of a book on the chapel, Sheldon Nottleman, writes, the beholder experiences himself or herself as an infinitesimal speck in an immeasurably greater cosmic vastness. The work seems to afford no point of imaginative entry. In other words, nothing to guide your fantasy about what's there. Instead, the frustrated viewer is thrown back upon himself, as if to say the answers you seek aren't to be found out here in a painting or your external world, they are within you. Surrounded by this impenetrable fortress of paintings, the viewer is left with nowhere else to retreat than inward. Arnold Modell, who's a psychoanalyst, refers to metaphor as the bridge between knowledge and feelings, and that it is fundamentally an embodied experience, not just language. In other words, a lot of times when language is talked about, it's talked about as though it's this abstract, disembodied, only logical, analytical thing. But as Modell points out, it's not. Metaphor is an emergent property of the mind. Metaphor is rooted in the body in two senses. Metaphor is used to organize bodily sensation cognitively. In other words, our body is giving us all of these impressions that need to be organized. And the mind is forced to organize them. It doesn't have a choice. So the body is actually leading the way. It's creating the impetus for metaphor to be formed by the mind. It's not disembodied. It is a reflection of embodiment. 
Isn't that, though, because earlier you talked about, what was it, Bodley or? Borbley, yeah. And how metaphor uh, kind of shapes it. But from what I read Lakoff, I kind of thought it was the other way around. It's the, the very nature of being embodied being. Uh, it's almost, a, it, 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 as an emergent property, something that almost becomes a necessity mm -hmm. because of the inability of us to fully describe. It's, it's almost like something that has to point towards it. And I was wondering if this is similar to what you was talking about, the imaginal quality of the mind. Mm -hmm. I believe it was in volume in his collected works, Volume 5. Uh -huh. uh, I think it, he's talking about that very nature, that imaginal quality. Of the mind. Yeah, he talks about that as the non-directed thinking. Uh, and we'll, I think I've got the definition of that in, in this presentation. But actually, uh, Lakoff uh, sees it very much as a reciprocal back and forth process, that the body organizes the mind and the mind organizes the impulses of the body. And they're in an ongoing, you could say, dialogue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and that each one, in a sense, is an impetus for the other. And that's kind of very Jungian in and of itself, is that particularly the way Jung views the dialogue between the consciousness and unconscious aspects of the mind. And that he sees the unconscious as very rooted in the body, that ultimately the deepest unconscious is in the body. And he refers to this uh, sometimes as subtle body experience but that also there's this communication with psyche that's around us, not just psyche that's in us. And that's part of this notion of the metaphor is not only is the body organizing the mind and the mind organizing the body, but that the metaphor is also used to mediate between the inner world and the outer world and to form meaningful relationships in the mind to organize the impetus from the outer world. In an earlier uh, quote, he said um, something to the effect that his uh, uh, metaphor operates also uh, beyond thought. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure what that means. So he's in in that case, he's making the he's broadening the concept of thought to include that thought isn't just cognition, that, cog that thought includes, broadly utilized, includes uh, sensation, desire, and affect as well. And that's consistent with uh, Wilfred Bion's line of thinking, where he uses the term thinking throughout his writing, but he's not talking about cognition, he's really talking about the term we would use as experience that is inclusive of somatic experience, emotion, and thought. Is that similar to Hellman's idea of idea? I'd say it's different because Hellman's not, from my reading, not very interested, in, much interested in the body. Uh, <laughs> he's interested in the image and how we're in, interacting with the image and that images are connected to idea. But I think it's a more uh, detached sort of philosophical reading of idea. Uh, but I would confess that I'm not a in-depth Hillman scholar. I've definitely <laughs> read half a dozen of his works, some of which uh, I was really affected by, like Dreams in the Underworld, I think is a magnificent work. Uh, okay, to go on with uh, a little bit more about what... Oh, I didn't finish this one. Uh, metaphor is used to organize bodily sensation cognitively, especially affects. And secondly, metaphor is rooted in the body as it rests on the border between mind and brain. The metaphorical bypasses the intellect and reaches more deeply, making connect, uh, connections on an emotional and imaginal level rather than solely cognitive. In other words, we, with metaphor done well, we have a sense of insight, an aha, 
but the aha comes actually after the experience. We first have an experience and then we go, oh, I see. I see the relationship. But the intellect is actually following along after. Modell goes on and he says, we unconsciously interpret our affective world by means of metaphor in preparation for action. Now what's interesting about this statement is this is almost identical to one of Jung's definitions of archetype and their function. Because he says archetype is a preparedness for action. In other words, it, archetype kind of unconsciously primes our pump to react in a certain way. So it's not that, j just to use a more instinctive uh, image, and Jung uh, makes instinct and archetype almost synonymous. Uh, in fact, he says archetype is the spiritual equivalent of the body's instinct. So if we think of flight or fight, we don't have to think about those because Jung would say we're archetypally primed to respond in one of those two directions in response to danger. So that's what he means by preparedness to action. If we take something like the hero archetype, that's a preparedness to respond in a particular way to a certain given set of circumstances somebody else might be taken more by the victim archetype and pre be prepared to respond in another sort of way with a different set of behavioral responses, a different set of affects, a different set of self-perceptions and perceptions of the world. The hero archetype suggests to the experiencer this is a situation that can be overcome. The victim archetype suggests to the experiencer, this is a, uh, an experience that I'm going to have to submit to. Now there's a whole discussion brewing in analytical psychology about whether there's a necessity to have the notion of the collective unconscious. There are a number of theorists that right now writing that this same phenomenon that we observe and articulate as archetypal can also be explained by emergence theory. That because we're human beings, we're going to tend to organize experiences in particular ways and that our human beingness, our DNA makeup, is going to channel us to organize experiences in some particular ways and that there's no need for the notion of a collective unconscious. And this is a pretty hotly debated subject right now. As a clinician, uh, I don't feel a need to come down strongly on one theoretical position or the other, the collective unconscious or the emergent state of archetypal phenomenon, because the experience of it, wherever it's coming from, is the same to the person experiencing it. Nathan Schwartz Salant says, trauma isn't stored as history, it's stored as myth. So we could substitute the word metaphor there, actually. Trauma isn't stored as history, it's stored as metaphor. And this relates to that thing I mentioned yesterday by Aldous Huxley. Experience isn't what happens to a person. Experience is what we do with what happens to a person. How we've taken it in, how we've internalized it, how it shapes our perception of ourselves and our perception of the world around us. So what he's saying is we do some, even with trauma, we don't store it as I saw my best friend get shot, I experienced this rape, I experienced this catastrophic car accident. That's the historical aspects of it. We create a narrative, a metaphor, to create some sense of meaning, either to our benefit or our detriment, 
around that. We create a story that we, in a sense, tell ourselves unconsciously. We may not be telling ourselves a story. That story might just happen. That, but we, we, we. I understand what you're yeah. Saying, but also, at least my image was that sometimes that story overwhelms. Yeah. That is an archetypal pattern. Right. We then. We don't have a. We don't have a choice about some of the fundamental aspects of what's going to be included in that story. Because it, it gestalts it in a way. Right. Right. It shapes the, the, the possibilities of what the story is going to become. Right. Unless you're involved in a delusional or magical thinking process in reaction to the story that's happened to you, where you un... the, the defense of what's called undoing. Oh, that didn't happen to me, which sometimes happens. Or... You know, the, the story that's sometimes utilized around death, particularly in uh, Christian mythology. Oh, they've gone to a better place. Okay, that's a kind of way of coping with grief that is a way of undoing something about the catastrophe of death. So is that what shock is, if, if you're in some kind of uh, catastrophe or something in, in your immediate sense of shock? Shock? The lack of, the lack of story? No, I think uh, that's a, just a somewhat different process. And when we talk about shock, we're usually talking about the defense of dissociation. And dissociation is utilized when an experience is too overwhelming to contain at the moment. And so we find a way to separate ourselves psychologically from the lived experience of that moment. And that's when people talk about shock, they're actually saying, you know, if the person's saying I'm in shock or somebody is saying they're in shock, they're usually observing the experience of dissociation, which those of you came to Don Cowshed's lectures uh, when he presented here, that was, that's the primary defense that he's talking about in both of his books, is dissociation. So, so I got this. So, Salant's uh, saying that the myth is, is how you score the shock? Right. Organize it? Yeah. Yeah. How you organize what's happened to you. Uh, that's later than being shocked. Right, right. Right, first you just have a reaction, and sometimes that's, that reaction is overwhelming and you dissociate. Uh, but then at, over time, you begin to create a narrative. And again, sometimes these narratives are beneficial to survival and to finding, we do have to find some sort of meaning even in catastrophic events and the people that are able to find meaning in catastrophic events do better than people who don't find any meaning in the event at all. Uh, I was working with a, a woman who had had, who did not have any recall uh, initially and came in thinking she was coming in to deal with grief over her mother's death. And within a few months, we realized she wasn't here to deal with grief over her mother's death. Uh, she was there to deal with abuse by her father, uh, that she had largely, she was aware of feelings of uneasiness with him, lifelong feelings, but it quickly became apparent that... Uh, she started to access a number of memories about abuse by her father and including sexual abuse and physical abuse and uh, over a number of years we worked through that and then she has this dream in which she has an eye appear under her left breast now she's an artist so she paints this image and I don't, in, I'm, I don't interpret the image for her. She was uh, uh, 
very adept at doing this work in depth, and I was kind of the facilitator for it rather often than the interpreter. And she said, uh, unprompted by me, she said, I think the I is the wisdom I've, I've achieved from working through this abuse. I understand the world differently now. I have a third eye that I didn't have before. So she was able to assimilate and metabolize these abuse experiences and feel that something deeper, richer, stronger emerged in her in response to them. And I would say the way she's lived her life has affirmed that that exists in her. It wasn't a story she was making up to make herself feel better. It was a story that emerged from within her in working through the material. So you're saying, like, in a way, healing comes through restructuring or recreating the myth? Yeah. Yeah, rewriting the narrative in some way, not with an intentional, uh, let's find a better narrative, kind of like, Essentially what cognitive behavioral therapy would do is that's an irrational thought or that's a negative thought. Let's find a, a, a narrative that rewrites that and gives you a better thought. Analytic therapy doesn't work that way. It tries to find what psyche is helping guide you towards. And in this case, psyche revealed a new way to her of thinking about what had happened to her that could also was consistent with actually how her self-structure was changing. Uh, and speaking of dissociation, uh, it was the, the dissociation was very clear in her. I didn't know exactly what it was at first, but she had, a, if, if, if everybody can see my eyelids, she had a way of falling into this place where her eyelids did like that. Her eyes would roll up a little bit and the eyelids would flutter. That's actually a sign of dissociation. And at first, that's part of what tipped, that's part of what tipped me off that something else was going on. And as I brought that to her attention, she began to notice that. I began to reflect it back to her when she wasn't aware of it, and we were able to work with those dissociative experiences because at that moment, I knew something was getting split off from her experience, and we were able to regather moments of affect, somatic states, feelings uh, that she might have breezed past if she didn't have that signal that was cueing us in. Yeah. Um, could we say that um, I'm thinking of uh, Jung, but also uh, some postmodern uh, structuralist thinking, maybe Lacan, that uh, which I don't understand real well. But you and me both. The, the idea that the symptom, is, uh, the symptom then would be um, evidence of a fragmented narrative. Yes, or. Uh, In other words, an incomplete narrative. The myth is not complete because much of it remains in the unconscious. The symptom is evidence that it's there. Jung would say, uh, I don't know if this is exactly a, a, a clear response to your question, but Jung would say the symptom is evidence of the complex. That Jung said symptoms are a, 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 a evidence, a sim the symptom is evidence of the neuroses. He equated complexes with neuroses. And that, so he's, he's saying, always look for what the symptom, the meaning of the symptom is. The symptom is not something to be gotten rid of, it's something that reveals. And you, you could say a, a faulty narrative, an incomplete narrative, a dysfunctional narrative, in some way, something's become distorted, is no longer functioning to the whole of the psyche. Or to even take a broader view of it, you could say symptoms are the things that interfere with the individuation process. Or it also stimulate. Hmm? Right, if they're, if they're notated. Yeah, if they're notated.
Yeah, if they're dealt with. Sim the, the statement that I think somebody over here asked was, uh, symptoms are the obstacle to the individuation process. So, hmm? Yeah. Yes, they can be. Again, it, it depends on, Jung says, Jung says uh, whether something is a symbol or not, and a symptom can be dealt with symbolically or non-symbolically. Jung says whether something is a symbol or not is dependent on the, attitude, the conscious attitude of the perceiver. So we have to have a receptiveness, this is something we talked about yesterday, a receptiveness to seeing the symptom as a symbol rather than as something concrete, you know, depressed mood, low energy, loss of sexual drive, loss of interest in uh, previously uh, interested in activities. These are all the diagnostic criteria, and most people want to come in being rid of those. And, you know, from an analytic perspective, we say, of course you do. But to do that, we have to first understand what the symptoms are conveying. So, you know, somebody who has writer's block, that's a symptom. Somebody who has fear of authority figures, that's a symptom. You know, they want to work through that. They want to be rid of it. They don't want it to impinge their life. Uh, somebody who has OCD, their symptoms clearly impinge their life. And as long as they deal with their anxieties that drive the OCD behavior in a concrete way, then the symptoms never change. So a common OCD symptom, let's say, is leaving the stove on. Okay, and then the person, I had one patient, this was one of their OCD symptoms. She had, it took her like 45 minutes to get out of the house every time she left the house because she had to go back and look at the knobs on the stove, put her hand on the eyelets. Thank God she never did that while it was actually hot. Uh, but it would literally, she would go back and check the eyelet, you know, 10, 12 times. And so getting out of the, out of her house in the morning, and this was just one thing that she would focus on. It included all of the lights in the house, all of the faucets in the house, all of the, uh, the coffee maker had to be unplugged. There was an extensive list, and it was grueling for her just to get out of the house to go to work. And then grueling to leave work because she couldn't leave work without checking the coffee pots. She could leave work without checking the lights because she felt that this, the, somebody else was responsible for the lights, the janitorial staff, so she didn't include that in her repertoire, but she did not include the coffee pots because she was the person responsible for making coffee at work. So it took her a while to leave work, too. Now, as long as she thought, yes, there is a very real danger to the, the stovetop being left on, she couldn't transform those behaviors. When she began to entertain the possibility that that fear was related to a different fear that she wasn't aware of, and we could begin working with that fear, then this fear about the stovetop began to diminish. And then eventually she came to me and she, uh, she had purchased uh, one of these rocks that have a little saying etched in them and the rock said, breathe. And she, she, uh, she had found it at some art fair or something, and she brought it home, and she was telling me about looking at it, and then she realized, I'm breathing. For the f I'm aware of being able to breathe for the first time in my life. And then she looked at me very earnestly, and she said, is this the way other people feel? And I said, Yes, many people do feel this way. And she burst into tears and she said, I never knew that this was even a possibility. That's the transformation. The old American Lung Association that was to breathe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. 
So this leads right into what uh, metaphor is transformational. Borbley again says growth entailing learning and creativity with new category searching and new priority setting is impossible without the metaphorical function. To relate metaphorically to the demands of life means to live creatively, to be free of compulsions and obsessions stemming from earlier unresolved conflicts. Now naturally there's growth and creativity that can occur apart from obsessions and conflicts. This isn't to say that's the only time metaphor is useful, but in terms of working through constrictions in life, metaphor is essential. Lichtenberg says, a metaphoric experience emerges during an exploratory psychotherapy when a word, phrase, gesture, image, or story invites, triggers, or stimulates affect-laden associations by the patient and the therapist that move treatment forward. So he's talking about associations kind of like we were doing earlier with the snow blankets, the ground. But more informally, like somebody uh, telling a dream, and I might say, what does that make you think of? Or I might say, that makes me think of. And then the patient responds, oh, that, I think of that. No, I don't think of it that way. I think of it this We're associating together. It's a mutual associative process. And that's what Lichtenberg is talking about here, where both parties become engaged in something, a word, a phrase, a gesture, an image, or a story. Back to Vivona, she says, indeed, the words of the poet elevates to art are at work in psychoanalysis all of the time as a source of therapeutic action. These are primarily psychoanalysts. Now we'll go to uh, the Jungian analyst, Edward Edinger, and this one's a bit longer. But it's so powerful, I think, that I mention it in almost every presentation I give. Analogy, a form of metaphor, is a process of relationship, a making of connections by as if. The alchemical texts tell us that analogy corpifies or coagulates the spirit, embodies the spirit. That is what makes alchemy so valuable for depth psychology. It is a treasury of analogies that corpify or embody the objective psyche and the processes it undergoes in development. The same applies for religion or mythology. The importance of analogy for the realization of the psyche can hardly be overestimated. It gives form and visibility to that which was previously invisible, intangible, not yet coagulated. Concepts and abstractions don't coagulate. The images of dreams and active imaginations do coagulate. They connect the outer world with the inner world by means of proportional or analogous images and thus coagulate soul stuff. That's from his book, The Anatomy of the Psyche. Metaphor is at the very core, this is kind of my main uh, point here in this whole presentation, metaphor is at the very core of analytical psychology and the analytic attitude. Terms like myth, image, imaginal, or mythopoetic are all based on the notion of metaphor. Jung says the psyche is mythopoetic, meaning the psyche creates myths, and myths are metaphors for ways of being, understanding, and experiencing. Metaphors originate from an in-between place, a place between body and spirit, and therefore have the capacity to engage and integrate not only feeling and thought, but also soul. Without metaphor, there's little possibility of something coming alive. Even theories are, me are metaphors. For example, the self is not a thing. It is Jung's metaphor for a particular set of experiences. Jung's notion of complex is not a thing. 
to call it a thing is what's referred to in philosophy as reification. It's a metaphor, but metaphor allows us to see, feel, and speak about a living connection between elements of experience. So even these things like shadow, anima, animus, we refer to them as things, or sound like we refer to, but they're really a set of experiences that happen to organize along predictable patterns. And it's useful to have a shorthand, like the term shadow, so that we don't have to say the aspects of yourself that you've disowned, the aspects of yourself that are not fully developed, the aspects of yourself that you would prefer the outer world not see, that's a big mouthful, right? So we instead we use the shorthand, the shadow. But it's an experience, not a thing. But it's useful to talk about it playfully as though it is a thing. That's the as if quality that Edinger mentions at the very beginning of this. Making connections by as if. So Joseph Campbell in one of his talks says uh, people misunderstand um, the use of the term metaphor. So when we say John runs like a deer, we don't think that John literally is a deer. They're making an analogous comparison between the way John runs and the athleticism, speed, whatever other associations you have to what a deer runs like. Here's what you were referring to, Tom. Uh, Jung speaks about two kinds of thinking in symbols of transformation. Directed thinking, which is conscious, logical, verbally structured through language, and non-directed thinking, which he refers also to as fantastic thinking or subjective thinking, which is more associated with unconscious processes, is more archaic and more imagistic and we would also say more affectively laden. Now, interestingly, this is almost identical to the way Freud describes the two kinds of thinking. He talks about secondary process thinking, which is almost identical to what Jung calls directed thinking, and primary process thinking, which is almost identical to Jung's notion of non-directed thinking. Although, for Freud, Primary process thinking has a little bit more pejorative tone to it, like we want to stay away from primary process thinking and dwell in secondary process thinking more, whereas for Jung, it was more of an appreciation for how non-directed thinking complements our life and that we really need to be more connected to our non-directed thinking. The, uh, I was thinking about... Lakoff, one of his other books, uh, Philosophy in the Flesh. Uh, in, in it, being essentially this idea, focuses on the idea that as embodied being, that neurally, the way we're neurally wired, that even our directed thinking uh, has its rooted in unconscious and what he would call, that's the very reason we have metaphor and myth, because, for example, time, we can't, as embodied being, we can't comprehend time. Mm -hmm. And so we express it spatially, like uh, we have a lot of it, or we have a little, or it's short time. Or it's time. forward or behind. Right. Or we talk about it as commodity, like something we spend, lose, save. And the idea is that even what we direct, it's still rooted in that other, more what he largely calls unconscious. Mm -hmm wired embodied being and so it's still itself even metaphor yeah absolutely and interestingly uh like the neurological studies on this support uh this idea like the same areas of the processing areas of the brain uh that are activated if we see somebody digging with a shovel or we hear a sentence, Joe was digging with a shovel, our brains are activated in an identical way, whether we're hearing it 
or seeing it. So this is a, a, a good example, or even imagining it, even if some, but it, experimentally they have to provide the stimulus to know what the stimulus is. Uh, but they can document that it's the same either way. Same thing uh, with the activation of mirror neurons. We tend to, when the mirror neuron research first started coming out, these are the, the neurological aspects that seem, they don't create empathy, but they provide the neurological support for the experience of empathy. And when it first came out, it was very visually oriented, okay, and that you had to be making eye contact, face-to-face -face contact for the mirror neurons to be activated. That's what the researchers first, the research first suggested. As the research got more, uh, more sophisticated, then they realized the mirror neurons uh, get activated just hearing stories like about a mother and an infant connecting. The mirror neurons still get activated just by hearing a story about something that might get activated face to face. So our bodies are in the mix, whether we like it or not, just like the, uh, the, the plaque over Jung's house, uh, bidden or unbidden, God will be present. Uh, bidden or unbidden metaphor and the body are always present. Uh, this is one of uh, Antonio Damasio's books called Descartes' Error. Error. Uh, Damasio is a neuroscientist, and he makes the case that Descartes, who you know famously said, "I think, therefore I am," uh, created the mind-body split in the human species, uh, and that we see them as separate and distinct. And what his, his, the whole book addresses what he perceives as a problematic error in how we experience ourselves as a split between mind and body and that m mind things are going up on up here and that somehow they're s separated from the body and he's he's basically making the case uh, empirically through neuroscience research that no we're one organ it's simply a perception that's been created and the brain is the body not, there is no separation. Poor Descartes gets the blame for uh, <laughs> he brings Plato to his logical conclusion. Uh -huh. Like Whitehead, who has said uh, basically all philosophy the last 2,000 years are about footnotes to Plato. <laughs> I've heard that one, yeah. Okay. I can't see the clock this time. Um, so back to Jung and see, Jung doesn't actually talk that much directly about metaphor, uh, but I think it's implicit throughout his work. But he does say this very powerfully, an archetypal content expresses itself in metaphors. If such a content should speak of the sun and identify it with the lion, the king, the hoard of gold guarded by the dragon, or the power that makes for the life and health of man, it is neither one thing nor the other, but the unknown third thing that finds more or less adequate expression in all of these similes, yet to the perpetual vexation of the intellect remains unknown and not able to be fitted into a formula. Not for a moment dare we succumb to the illusion that an archetype can, finally, can be finally explained and disposed of. Even the best attempts at explanation are only more or less successful translations into another metaphorical language. We could take almost anything and say, okay, what's beneath that metaphor? And the person's going to respond with another metaphor. We're always translating, using one language to translate into another. For example, alchemy isn't useful in analytical psychology because it reveals some kind of secret knowledge. It's useful primarily because it's an immersion in, al in the alchemical text shapes the psyche of the reader. In other words, 
Jung, Jung was caught in this. The first time he tried to read alchemy, in memories, he reports this in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he said, it just seemed essentially like hogwash to me. It seemed impenetrable, incomprehensible. I threw the books down in frustration. Twenty years later, when he's working with Heinrich Zimmer on The Secret of the Golden Flower, he starts, you know, he's 20 years older. He's not in his early 30s anymore. He's in his 50s. He's got a bit more patience. He's got a lot more clinical experience, a lot more work with dreams. And he's able to understand the metaphors better that are conveyed in alchemy. He, he, was, he consulted uh, James Joyce, the novelist, consulted with Jung about his daughter. His daughter was psychotic. And he took her to Jung and asked Jung to evaluate her to find out whether there was any hope. And as, as you may know, Joyce was a tremendously dense writer who used metaphor extensively so extensively that it was hard to track the metaphors. Joseph Campbell wrote, Finnegan's Wake isn't even Joyce's densest work, but Joseph Campbell wrote an entire book that's like 250 pages long called A Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake <laughs> <laughs> in order to track the metaphors and characters that Joyce was using. So anyway, the punchline is Jung writes back to Joyce and says, your daughter is drowning in the waters that you swim in. Would you tell me what Jung means by the new impression? Sure. Varying impressions on whether it's make-believe, whether it's I would say, uh, first of all, Jung, it's not Jung's original idea. He takes the idea from an uh, author named Rudolf Otto, uh, and it's from a book, I think about 1910, called The Idea of the Holy. And uh, so Otto actually introduces the term numinous in that book, and it it's not make-believe. Jung doesn't consider it make-believe. He uses it to refer to a certain category of experience. Number one, it has to be an experience which transcends one's individuality. That's first and foremost. Sometimes that's referred to as a sense of greater than, greater than one's own individual experience. Most often, it is associated with spiritual tr experiences, powerful spiritual experiences, the, the experience of meeting God, talking to God, feeling like God is speaking to you, feeling like you're being led by God. But standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon and being overtaken by the vastness of that, feeling infinitesimal in relationship to that, feeling something of uh, the overarching grandeur of uh, the age of that, all of those would also be classified as tr uh, numinous experiences if the Grand Canyon strikes you. If you walk up and you think, oh, this is an interesting hole in the ground, that's not a numinous experience, but few people can go to the Grand Canyon and not feel struck by the numinosity of that experience. Uh, you know, going into uh, the cathedral at Chartres, uh, you know, something like that. Even if you don't believe traditional religious beliefs, you're struck by the beauty of the structure. Uh, you know, things like that. I think that uh, you can have numinous experiences, uh, I'm trying to think of, there, there's a uh, John, John Martin, Catholic priest, 
who writes a number of books. And uh, Chris Tippett was asking him uh, what his practice is. And he said, my practice is trying to find the numinous in the most mundane things of everyday life. <laughs> You know, so he says, I can look out the window as I'm driving and notice somebody's posture and be moved by it. Uh, and somehow also be, feel a connection to the interconnectedness of all beings. And that can be something simple can be numinous. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes when I'm playing guitar, I'll get stuck in kind of just playing the same three notes over and over again, and there's something mysterious or intriguing to me about that three combinations of notes and the rhythm of just playing those same three notes over and over again. And that strikes me as numinous. Uh, and I ran across some research on uh, Neanderthal uh, flutes were that they made out of bird bones. Uh, and these are like 30,000 years old. And what's interesting about these flutes is they make up a perfect diatonic scale. Okay? Now, Neanderthals didn't know anything about musical theory. <laughs> right? So, now what makes it even more interesting is they had taken bone marrow they had drilled some holes that were not correct for the diatonic scale, and they had filled those holes back in. They had patched them over so they would no longer sound. So they were obviously in search of a certain combination of sounds that was present somehow innately in their ear that they were listening for. Now there's something numinous to me about thinking there's some innate qualities of music that human beings are going to respond to and others they are not going to respond to. Or that we're more primed again, uh, to use that phrase. I would say the experience of color is a sensory uh, a sensory constrained thing, it's our effort to communicate our experience of color is metaphorical. And it, that's actually some interesting research as well is, uh, I forget what culture it is in Southeast Asia, there's a culture that has no blue, okay? So they have no words for the color blue. And there's uh, some research that's been done on these people and just the removal of one word for one spectrum of the color scheme changes the way they view the world. Not just around what, how do they process blue, they literally don't see blue. So not having the language then shapes perception. It, the, more you, the more you move into this stuff, the more fascinating it is. You know, the complexity of how we're shaped and how we shape our perceptions. So we have to find ways of communicating the color blue. So like a simple thing of, now we've come to associate blue with royalty and purple with royalty, okay? Now there's a, like for the color purple, there's a simple reason why purple became a royal color, is when they first developed purple, there were a certain set of mollusks off the coast of Spain that were, there was a limited region, and that was the only way they knew how to create the color purple in dyeing. Because it was limited, the, the, the royals, you know, set out a decree that said other people couldn't wear purple because the color was in short supply for the, the act of dyeing. That's how we came to associate the color purple 
with royalty. Now there's been this book, uh, The Color Purple, uh, not the movie The Color Purple, but the, uh, the book, When I Grow Old, I'll Wear Purple. So now we have an association, or the writer had an association to wearing purple wasn't appropriate for a woman of a younger age, but now that I'm older, I have permission to wear purple. So there, yes, the metaphors are embedded in our color experience and how we try to uh, articulate that. Did you have another idea about that? For me, there's a watercolors seem very healing. Uh huh. And I'm not taking the time to research that, but there's something about watercolors. Right? Well, I think a lot of people have that response. Uh, pers you know, I haven't done any research on that or thought deeply about it myself either. But I think part of it is the diffuseness and the way the color, there's not a sharp edge between the transitions between colors. It's fluid. And so I think there's something about the fluidity and perhaps something about uh, the connection. Uh, you could say at some times it looks, in watercolors, look like somebody has been crying on the paper. And so I think there's an association unconsciously that gets made to tears and the solution of our feeling states that somehow we unconsciously link to watercolors in a way we don't link in the same way to acrylics or to oil-based paints. But that's just my off-the-cuff. I was thinking more green and blue, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But regardless of what color is being utilized in watercolors, there is this watery quality to them. There's their flow. It feels like nothing's really fixed in the image in the same way that oil paints and acrylics fix the image. The watercolor somehow feels like it's still moving. So there's a metaphor. Now we're going from image and color to movement. The, the movement across domains of experience. Shall we take a, we, should we take a 10 minute break? All right. So just to finish up uh, with this alchemy slide. So basically the idea is whatever else you do with alchemy, whatever else Jung was doing with it, that over time, the reader of alchemy begins to move more fluidly in the world of metaphor. Metaphor is at the root of other activities Jungians tend to be interested in, such as sand play therapy, which is expressive, but ultimately relies on the creation of visual metaphors through the use of the sand tray and the available objects you're creating visual metaphors for something that's going on internally. And then the patient and the therapist work together to form some sort of interpretation of what's appeared in the sand tray. And that is another translation from one, from a visual metaphor to something in language. The tarot, some unions like to do tarot readings that's a metaphor. They give you a template. So this is a, these are typical three card readings. Some people, some readers interpret this as past, present, future. Some interpret it as uh, the problem or the context, the problem and the focus. They've got all sorts of different ways, templates to apply over these three card readings. Well, there's nothing to say that that's what is actually going on, they're forming a metaphor to interpret the images of the cards through, and the cards themselves are metaphors. Astrology, same thing. You're using this n metaphor that what happens in the, the orientation of the stars and the planets impacts individual destinies, individual unfolding as lives. It's a metaphor. 
All of these systems, regardless of the other things they may be associated with, all rely on metaphor. However, metaphors are not only associated with manifestations of the collective unconscious, they also manifest and are utilized constantly, both consciously and unconsciously, in dreams as well as everyday life and language. Our everyday speech and the speech of my patients is filled with metaphor. The weight of the world is on my shoulders. I feel trapped. It feels like somebody is standing on my chest. It feels like my head is in a vice. It's a real pain in the neck. I've got my back against the wall. It feels like I'm moving through molasses. I'm swimming against the current. I can't get my juices flowing. I've got a black cloud hanging over me. It feels like I'm being buried alive. It seems like I've hit a brick wall. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. I'm tied up in knots. I feel like I've been hit by a freight train. The wind has really been taken out of my sails. It looks like you've seen a ghost. It permeates all of our efforts to communicate. And some of these obviously are so well used that they've become more signs rather than metaphors. They've lost some of their numinous quality, we could say, because they're so frequently used. But underneath, there, it is a translation of an experience into an image from another domain. Metaphor is the process which also allows sacred texts, music, art, poetry, dance, and film to move us. It is the process which brings imagination alive. For example, the soliloquy from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. Now Hamlet would not live so powerfully in our souls if he had said, I have a conflict, instead of to be or not to be. It's the particular composition of Shakespeare's metaphorical language, choices, rather than stark linguistic meaning, which brings Hamlet's statement to life, allowing it to inhabit our imaginations. The first sentence relies on six simple one-syllable words that initially sound almost childlike, yet it communicates at great depth about the fragile line separating life and death. With the ensuing question, declaration, that is the question, Hamlet pulls us into deeper water, narrowing down all questions into one existential choice, one universal predicament which we are all confronted with. Metaphor is also what brings the parables of the Bible to life, such as the parable of the workers in the vineyard or the parable of the mustard seed. C.H. Dodd says, the parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into active thought. So again, back to engagement. We've been talking about a bit about these books by Lakoff and Johnson, either together or separately. These are some of the titles, Metaphors We Live By, Philosophy in the Flesh, The Meaning of the Body, The Body in the Mind, and More Than Cool Reason, which is actually by Lakoff and Turner. And they bring together cognitive science, linguistics, neuroscience, and philosophy to demonstrate convincingly that almost all human experience, including bodily experience, is mediated by metaphor. It's not image that mediates, as James Hillman attributes, attributes, or the symbol, as Jung attributes. It is metaphor. Images and symbols are metaphors. Even language is metaphorical. 
This is the deep power of metaphor. It allows novel recombinations of meaning. That's what you were referring to earlier, Mike. Uh, recombining old ways of understanding old meanings into new meanings. It is a property of the mind, soul, and psyche that is uniquely human. We can't say that any other species utilizes... Uh, it now appears that some other species do have some capacity for language. Uh, but it doesn't yet appear that any of the other species that have utilized language utilize metaphor. I have a question. Yeah. You just said, in, uh, uh, I believe it's quoting Blackhawk, mm -hmm. that um, uh, metaphor was um, emphasized and uh, symbol was as if uh, symbols were something other than metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 it was a little bit ago, but yeah. I, I can't pick it up. That Hillman at, attributes uh, it, it, it significance or importance to image, and Jung attributes, he largely talks about the importance of symbol, and all I'm doing is making the uh, pointing out that there's an underlying, more fundamental level that they both belong to, which is metaphor. Uh, it seems to me, however, that. Um, uh, Jung's notion of symbol is defined metaphorically. Yeah. Yeah. And so not everything is a symbol, but all symbols are metaphors. Okay. So it's which class, which is the broader class of experience is all I'm getting at. Okay. Yeah. There's a metaphor for metaphor that keeps coming into my head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a sense, you know, the idea, you know, this this bridge, the being able to transport over, mm -hmm. the, and so I just keep thinking the very, very metaphor for that itself mm -hmm. as as a bridge. Yeah, we need a metaphor for metaphor, right? <laughs> and bridge is one of the useful metaphors to explain metaphor. Yeah, it's an endless regress. Uh, So it is a property of the mind, soul, psyche that is uniquely human, a neurophysiological process that has become associated with language, but it's an experience that is first of all a somatic experience, hence the frequency of bodily-based metaphors like I'm going to blow my top. Uh, it, again, it seems like the body demands to be expressed in metaphors to anthropomorphize something. Uh, uh, in the somatization, you know, and it, it's very interesting how culturally bound it is. So you're talking about like Chinese medicine. Um, see, in the West, where we have more of an interest in individual psychology than they did in the East, and so there was, a, for many reasons, uh, there was less of a tendency to talk about how you feel about certain things. So a lot of what uh, symptoms that you see in the corpus of Chinese medicine, um, emotional and cognitive affective things actually become somaticized. Mm -hmm. So even the, and, and so those, those syndromes that we talked about um, are, um, they, they all become somatizations in a sense, very seldom talked about as affect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's interesting things culturally like, uh, Hawa Kawai wrote a book in the early 80s called The Japanese Psyche. And he speaks to that same thing, is that in Japan they didn't have a notion of a self as center of individualism in the way we do in the West, as, as the unique expression of individual, not identity like ego identity, but this deeper sense of who one is and who's directing one's movement through life, which Jung calls the self. But Kawhi says the Jung's notion of the self didn't translate well in Japanese culture where the self was much more connected with sense of family primarily. And so uh, to do things, uh, for example, that were shaming to the family were 
almost like self-damage if interpreted through a Western <laughs> lens. And so he had to re-translate Jung for the Japanese culture as the emptying out of the self-center. So the self wasn't something to be unpacked and discovered and developed as it was in Jung's work. It was something to empty out, uh, to take things out of so that the original whole, uh, the original sense of wholeness was expressed through emptiness. And actually now it's changing in China, for example, as they develop a much more robust middle class that has now psychoanalysis and analytical psychology are the two fastest growing forms of therapy. Therapy in general isn't widely utilized in China that it was suppressed and seen as uh, going too individualistic and going against the grain of the Communist Party. And so just like, at, at, just as in at one point, Western music influences were completely outlawed in China. You know, you couldn't play uh, classical music from Western composers. Western instruments were outlawed for a period of time. Uh, there's a movie made about that uh, called The Red Violin that has a chapter where the violin's in China and it's having to be hidden under the floorboards that speaks to this period of time. Uh, but now with the rise of the middle class and the softening of the communist rhetoric, now psychoanalysis and analytical psychology are the most rapidly growing uh, forms of therapy in China as they begin to discover individual experience on a more fundamental level. So there's this hunger for this un understanding and talking about themselves in new ways that have been difficult to even find the language for previously are now emerging. So there's all of these institutes that are creating training programs in China trying to meet the demand. So let's go to a little bit more experiential thing. And it, this is a short clip. And just hold in that phrase in, in mind, Edinger's and Jung's phrase, as if, when you watch this. Let's play with this a minute. And first, let's just, what are the elements? You know, Jung has this uh, model for dreams that he adapted, and then Marie-Louise von Franz applies it to fairy tales, but he breaks it first down into the elements, the characters, what's the action. So what are the elements that the... Uh, 
the person who created this is you relying on to create the metaphor? How is what's the medium that the metaphor is being communicated through? Mirror, okay. Dance. So let's let's even get more abstract than that. Let's just say movement. Black and white versus color. Yes, the transition from black and white to color. Okay, and we'll make that a subset of this. Music. Music. Man and child. Man and child. Two fig. Yeah, the two actors. Man and boy, child. And well, let's make that a subset of this. Okay, anything else? Right. Some of the time. So there's times that they're moving in unison. So let's in unison. And then there's some times that they're moving, let's call it opposition. Push pull, okay? Other slash self. Okay, now we're moving into somewhat more theoretical terms. In and out of the frame. In the frame, okay? So the frame is the main metaphor there, and in and out of is the action that's occurring in relationship to that. Anything else? It's amazing, isn't it, how much power is in this little two-minute or minute-and-a-half video? It means the clothing. Clothing, okay. So what's your association to what's what strikes you about the clothing? He was partly business attire, but he's coming apart. Okay. And to be honest, I can't remember what the clothing was. Okay. Suspense. Formal versus versus more informal. Even more. Hmm? The, the, that more like the more grown up attire versus the child's mm -hmm. attire. Okay, so we can call maybe call that an elaboration on this man, boy, child gets expressed through that. Anything else? I don't have anything hard and fast I'm looking for here. But yeah, you can see all of these things that you've articulated and the metaphor, there is kind of one unifying metaphor from a Jungian standpoint. We might call this an illustration of a child complex, okay? So the notion when we're speaking of a child complex, we don't speak about a child having a child complex. We have we speak about an adult having a child complex. Which and what do we mean by that? We mean that there is a part of their psyche that is still expressed and experienced with more childlike characteristics or dominated by feeling states that are more associated with events that happened in their childhood rather than their experiencing in adulthood. But when they're experienced, they feel as though they're being experienced again now. So I think what makes this so effective for a Jungian is this notion of the as if. It conveys implicitly that the child isn't literally there because we've got this frame or mirror that separates them.
And yet, there's a movement across or through the frame that takes place, and there's a confusion in the man's face and somewhat in the boy's face about which side of the mirror we're supposed to stay on. And is this part when the boy grabs the man's face and the man looks back quizzically, am I you or are you me? Are you, am I in you, are you in me? This is all of this as if quality of when we speak about complexes, this is what I hope my patients begin to get a sense of about their own interior life is that there's like a drama, again, a, now we're shifting into a different metaphor, a drama going on inside. And if they can get some glimmer that's somewhat like this about their interior life and then how that shapes their experience of the world and themselves, then we've really brought something to life and they're able to engage with themselves in a different way. So like the illustration I gave yesterday was a patient who dreamed about a man in a dark suit that had a list of rules on the wall and he wouldn't let her lead, leave the building because she hadn't followed the rules. And then from there on in our analysis, the man in the dark suit became a more metaphorical stand-in for her father that was much more evocative because it was her metaphor rather than simply a label for a relationship that she had. The label itself didn't bring something alive, but the image of the man in the dark suit brought her father into the room in a much more vivid, embodied sort of way because it was connected to the smell of her father's suits. And we know that the sense of smell is the most powerful and the most archaic of all our sensory processes. That the sense of smell evokes the greatest and earliest response. So, our, for example, our, our, our first uh, sensory sensation of our mother is not a visual one, it's an olfactory one. Okay, we're going to do another film genre or clip here, and this is a montage of images from the... 1975 film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. As you're watching, think of the various levels of human experience depicted in the montage of the film. What are the characteristics of experience being expressed metaphorically? Chief, I got the move. I got him, Chief. 
Give it up. Now, just warming up. Warming up. Warming up. This will be the one. All right, so this time, don't think so much about the individual scenes per se, but the metaphorical arc of the four scenes together and try to think of like just one word aspects of experience that get captured in these four scenes. Okay. Leadership. What was that one? Triumph. What was the last one? Emotion. 
Imitation. And let's find that there. No. And let's link these two. The illusion. Say more about that one. Illusion? Yeah, what what you're thinking of in terms of what's the illusion? So perception. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially back then. Uh, well, and again, uh, I think we're seeing an attempt to restore that sort of framework and also a counteraction, not just to the Trump phenomenon, but this whole thing about uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment is a counter move that's occurring at the same time. There's this other effort to restore this older way of uh, interacting with the power structure. And so it's interesting that we're having these cross currents simultaneously going on. And perhaps I would assume that they are related that perhaps if Trump hadn't come into the presidency that perhaps the Harvey Weinstein and the fallout following that wouldn't have happened in the same way. There were a couple of others, and they're kind of like, uh, in, in some way, the power structure thing is a little more subtle in the image. It's Nurse Ratchet looking over uh, the scene, and you'd, it's, it's more in these scenes anyway. Obviously, it's more overt in other scenes of the movie, but in these scenes that I've selected, it's more implied. Other things are more implied, uh, like fear, for example. Billy, uh, who's a frightened of Mac's efforts to break out of the normative aspect. Um, despair. Hope. Resilience. Strength is their obstacles. Joy. Rebirth. Thinking specifically of chiefs. Uh, escape into uh, this new life. So it's quite in, look at the, the depth of the associations to the metaphor and how uh, all of these metaphors, probably when they're mentioned, resonate on some level, but not all of the metaphors occurred to each of us, that there were, and yet there's what, 30 adjectives uh, to describe this 10 minute segment out of a uh, two hour movie. I think that's really the, the power of the metaphor that if you just looked at these individual scenes, you wouldn't get the whole thing, but taken together, they formed this kind of whole of uh, the notion of not just literal imprisonment, but psychological imprisonment. Um, some of these others like, uh, and that largely, even though they're in a literal prison, a little literal asylum actually, 
much of what's occurring is occurring because of what they do with the experience in their mind. And that it takes somebody who isn't in that frame of mind to help them move out of the status quo that they're currently in. And so in a sense, you, we could say that Nicholson acts as the metaphorical catalyst in this scenario. And that what we're looking for, whether we're working through individual complexes, working through things in our life in therapy, implicitly, even going the notion of going to therapy is a hope for a catalyst that moves us out of from one state into another. Or if we work creatively and we're sitting in front of a typewriter with a blank page or standing in front of a canvas that's pure white or standing on a stage and the music comes up and we're waiting to interpret the music through dance and we're not feeling in our bodies on that particular moment. Or we sit down to write a poem and we can't find the muse. Those are all sorts of restrictions and imprisonments, however temporary they may be. Or like uh, Findakis, sculpture that I showed yesterday called Freedom was his effort to work through his own creative blocks by imagining what the creative block looked like. So poetry is one of the places where metaphor is most powerfully experienced. Robert Bly in his book Leaping Poetry writes that fear of experience and a pedestrian movement of the mind results in blocked love, energy, boredom, envy, and joylessness. -ness, joylessness. But that great art has as its center a long floating leap, which invokes risk and moves into experience. He goes on to say that some works, especially poetry, have may have several leaps inside a single work. This is from a book called Leaping Poetry. A po poet who is leaping makes a jump from an object soaked in unconscious substance to an object or idea soaked in conscious psychic substance. Some arc of association which corresponds to the inner life of the objects so that anyone sensitive to the inner life of objects can ride with him. The links are not private, but somehow bound in nature. Leaping is the ability to associate fast. Think back to Aristotle's quote, to do metaphor well is to see similarity. And leaping is the ability to associate fast. Vivona says, the experience of hearing a good poem or a good interpretation, she's referring to analytic interpretation, is of being understood and at the same time seeing something new about oneself that has been articulated by someone else from within that person's own experience. The change that can happen on hearing such language we call insight. Insight is not only knowledge, not only content, it is an experience of resonance with another person's vision of things. Put more poetically, William Carlos Williams says, It's difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for the lack of what is found there. However, there's a fearsome aspect to poetry. Jane Cooper, in an introduction to Muriel Rekheiser's book, The Life of Poetry, says, Why is poetry feared? Because it demands full consciousness. -ness. It, asks, it asks us to feel and it asks us to respond. Through poetry, we are brought face to face with our world and we plunge deeply into ourselves to a place where we sense. Are there any Spanish readers, speakers in the audience? Would you mind helping me out with something? 
Can I put you on the spot? I have two? Okay. I'm going to ask you to read from those, and I'll tell you the number as we go through, if that's okay. Okay, let's begin with number 15. These are poems by Antonio Machado. And Amy's going to read it in Spanish first, and just so you get the cadence and sound of the language, and then I'm going to read it again in English because I don't speak or read Spanish. Number 15, yeah. Last night I had a dream, a blessed illusion it was. I dreamt of a fountain flowing deep down in my heart. Water, by what hidden channels have you come? Tell me, to me, welling up with new life I never tasted before. Last night I had a dream, a blessed illusion it was. I dreamt of a hive at work deep down in my heart. Within were the golden bees, straining out the bitter past to make sweet-tasting honey and white honeycomb. Last night I had a dream, a blessed illusion it was. I dreamt of a hot sun shining deep down in my heart. The heart was in the scorching as from a fiery hearth. The sun in the light it shed and the tears it brought to my eyes. Last night I had a dream, a blessed illusion it was. I dreamt it was God I'd found deep down in my heart. So, we don't need to analyze the whole poem. Just throw out what are the metaphors that jumped out to you. Just the ones that stuck. Illusion. Illusion. Okay, a blessed illusion it was. Anything else? At night, At night? meaning in the, dark. in the dark. Yeah. So this came in the dark. Flowing water. Flowing water. Okay. So yeah, the the first the first uh, stanza is about the the water and these hidden channels. Although it's interesting, isn't it, that it, the water isn't named. Uh, it's implied. A fountain flowing, so we assume that there's water. Channels that we assume carried water. Welling up. So it's using all of the actions of water without even needing to mention water. The sun, light. So light and sun is another metaphor that hot sun, heat, scorching, fiery, sun, light, hearth. hearth. And yet the tears also bring back the water. And then there's the image of the beehive, straining out the bitterness of the past, but not just straining out, making something of it. 
Okay, let's do number 16. Has my heart gone to sleep? Have the beehives of my dreams stopped working? The water wheel of the mind run dry? Scoops turning empty, only shadow inside? No, my heart is not asleep. It is awake, wide awake. Not asleep, not dreaming. Its eyes are opened wide, watching distant signals, listening on the rim of vast silence. The heart is a beehive, the heart is a water wheel. It's what makes the honey out of experience. Mm -hmm. Although what now it's being used in a different way to suggest emptiness, the dryness of something turning, but there's nothing inside. A fear, anyway. And actually, many patients that I see come with a fear that if we go deeply, they'll discover that there's nothing inside. Anything else? What does it mean to listen on the rim of the vast silence? Reminds me of the last scene, or nearly the last scene in the movie Life of the House, where his, um, where Kevin Klein's character, George, is uh, de deceased, and he's like he's speaking to his son. He says something in effect of, uh, "I'm on the edge, listening. Mm -hmm. With every crash of every wave, I hear something I never heard before." Mm -hmm. Um, the story of Elijah in the cave comes to mind. You know, he talks about there was a great wind and God was not in the wind. There was a great thunder and God was not in the thunder. And there was a great uh, yeah. earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. But then he heard the sound of sheer silence. He wrapped his face in a mantle, stepped out of the cave, and a voice came to him. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Like sitting on the rim of the silence it is reassuring that mm -hmm. the silence wouldn't be overwhelming mm -hmm. or dangerous. Mm -hmm. there, there's and Joe, you had something? Uh, I'm trying to remember that quote. Oh, okay. The one from Keats. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking about sitting. Uh, sitting. Uh, oh, about negative capacity. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, to, it, it's uh, in a letter to his brother, uh, and he's talking about uh, being able to converse without the need to chase after uh, annoying uh, conclusions, something to that effect. That, and then he termed that negative capacity, is, is the capacity to remain with the unknown. What I'm particularly attracted to is the, this crossing of domains. Silence doesn't theoretically have a rim. So that imposes a physical experience, a geographical experience onto an auditory domain. But it does it, it, does it in a unique way that it makes perfect sense on some level. Oh, of course there's a capacity to sit on the rim of a vast silence, except if we took it literally and just took the, li ling the linguistic meaning of it, it doesn't make sense. It is a nonsensical sentence. 
yet in the, in the context of this poem, it makes perfect sense that also reveals something that we wouldn't normally, I wouldn't normally uh, acquire that metaphor on my own. I wouldn't think about there being an edge to silence. I could think about there being an end to silence or a beginning of silence because those silence is kind of has a temporal quality. It begins and ends, at least in the way we process it. But I don't think of it as having a rim. But it, it implies a, a depth kind of a deepness that I, when I was on the rim, I looked down. There, there's another element of it. So, and if you go to the deep stillness, Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a spatial metaphor again. I mean, you can the idea of talk about the, the duration of silence as, as the, using the time metaphor, which is spatial. Mm-hmm. And still, this is another spatial metaphor, but because in the absence of the silence is almost the negation of something. So, how do you perceive a silence in absence of the sound? Uh, in some other way, but you give it its own. So you give it a spatial metaphor. Yeah, yeah. Almost the expanse of emptiness. You mm-hmm. that enough to to create a, a felt sense of negation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Isn't that sort of what Rothko's meaning? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly the same thing. You're sitting on the rim of something not illustrated. Mm-hmm. Illustrates. Yeah. Yeah, we, we could definitely say that uh, Rothko's rep, uh, way of presenting that was an exercise in negative capability. Uh, did Roth, did, was the very design of the structure itself also by Rothko? I, the, I, don't, I think he was consulted on the design, but I don't think he was the architect. Because the very interesting in the structure it's almost, is it octagonal? I, it's semicircular. It's, it seems like yeah, it yeah, 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 octagonal. It, it makes me think of cardinal points mm-hmm. and the north, west, south. Is, uh, it has almost a very uh, spatial metaphor, almost as a, uh, as a uh, metaphor for uh, the world itself. Mm-hmm. And it, Direction north south, you know, mm-hmm. and you have up and down. Mm-hmm. It's very the, the spatialness of it, and then you have this apparent nothing. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting as you're talking. It's like the metaphor wants to keep working on us, or we want to keep working with that metaphor. That metaphors that are really alive keep working at us. Uh, I got exposed to Machado's poems in like 1989, and I feel like they still have the same liveliness for me that uh, that I first when I was first exposed. Shall we do one more poem by Machado? Let's. Can we do number 21? For whatever reason, Machado doesn't give titles to his poems. I don't. I haven't studied enough about the man to know why that is. (laughs) Yeah, 21. La mano que querías tener en sueños y todos los amores que llegaron al alma, al hondo cielo. Y ha de morir contigo el mundo tuyo, la vieja vida en orden tuyo y nuevo. Los yunques y crisoles de tu alma trabajan para el polvo y fallimiento. And is the magic world to die with you? The world where memory keeps life's purest breaths, white shadow of first love, voice that went to your heart, hand you wished in dreams to keep in yours, and all loved things that touched the soul, the deeper sky. 
And is your world to die with you, the old life you reshaped your way? Have the crucibles and anvils of your souls been working for dust and for the wind? So obviously on some level it's a movement, a a recollection of love, but it's also a, a kind of grief about what this love has meant to the individual, to Machado. It's interesting the metaphors he chooses for the conclusion of the poem crucibles and anvils, things that are ground or pounded, places where grinding or pounding takes place. Was the phrase white shadow? Yes, white shadow of first love. And is the magic world to die with you, the world where memory keeps life's purest breaths, white shadow of first love. So on the one hand, we can imagine that he's working out his grief about this lost love, but he also seems to be speaking about something he's concerned with losing in himself as though if this relationship ends or it has ended, will he lose contact with the things that this relationship has brought to life in him? Yeah, white shadow suggests that there's something ephemeral uh, but pure in this experience. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Cynthia, I'm sorry. It's interesting when I I presented uh, some poems of Machado in uh, the presentation I just gave in uh, Santo Domingo in September, and uh, naturally they were all Spanish speakers and I was the only non-Spanish speaker in the room, but we did the same thing. Uh, And the reactions afterwards, one person came up and said, I thought Machado was very much a man of his time. But when I heard you read him in English, I heard him in a different way. And this Spanish speaker was going to go out and purchase the English translations (laughs) because she felt like it allowed her access, moving from one language to another, to get at a different element of the poems. All right, now we're going to switch to something I call the neuroscience of metaphor. Jung discovered the power of metaphor through the study of dreams, the study of ancient texts and myths, and his own personal experiences, and through the thousands of sessions with his patients. Neuroscience, the study of the functioning of the brain, now shows one of the reasons why metaphor became such a central part of Jung's model of the psyche. Neuroscience demonstrates clearly that the the brain responds very differently to metaphor than to ordinary prose, the kind of thing we might read in a newspaper or magazine, as well as the kind of language that it's easy to fall into day to day and in therapeutic situations. Philip Davis from the University of Liverpool School of English was obviously drawn to the power of Shakespeare's speech. And he wanted to know why is it so powerful, apart from the notion of literary criticism or uh, art interpretation. He wanted to know, is there something else to this? So he elicited They have a a department of uh, medicine and neuroscience at University of Liverpool, and he approached that department and said, can we figure out a way to study the effect 
of Shakespeare on the functioning of the brain. So, with the aid of these brain imaging scientists, David conducted, Davis conducted neurolinguistic experiments investigating sentence processing in the brain. The experiments showed that when people are, the, are uh, wired up, they have different reactions to hearing different types of sentences. One type of measured response they called the N400, which occurs about 400 milliseconds after the brain experiences a thought or perception, and this is called a normal response. A P600 response, uh, and there, it just is the, the length of time it takes for this response to occur after receiving the stimulants, indicates a peak in brain activity 600 milliseconds after the brain experiences a different type of thought or perception. Davis describes the P600 response as the wow effect, W-O-W, -W, in which the brain is excited and is put in a state of hesitating consciousness. In other words, it's trying to hold on to something and make sense of it. So, essentially this top row is the functional MRI of a patient reading ordinary prose. This bottom row of images is somebody reading Shakespeare. This middle portion is what's called an electroencephalogram, which is basically measuring brainwave activity. Now what Davis wants us to pay attention to are two things in the electroencephalogram is the amplitude of the brainwave activity, how wide it is, and the density of it. So here you can see that the edges become quite less dense. That's when they're reading ordinary prose. Now what you want to see if, if the brain is active is you want to see wide amplitude and density. In other words, the brain's working harder and in more complex ways. And that's what this diagram shows. So you can see in comparison here to here, there's much more density of activity here, and the amplitude is actually quite a bit wider. Now, what you're looking at here, so this is the frontal view of brainwave activity, and you can see these crosshairs. These measure actually the center of mass of activity. Okay, you can see this is heavily skewed. The, the, these labels are actually reversed, unfortunately, in this image. This should be L and this should be R, meaning left and right. So you're looking at the left hemisphere of the brain here. It's far to the left side, meaning it ha doesn't have hemis. It's, there's not bilateral hemispheric activity. There's only activity largely in one, one side of uh, one side of the brain. The other thing you're looking at is the areas of the brain that are to the front and higher up are associated with higher level logical, rational activity. The lower you go, and the more towards the mid area of the brain you go, you're getting into more affective content. Okay? So here you can see by the crosshairs that it's very much centered on the frontal activity and relatively high up. There's, very, there's actually very little activity uh, going on in the mid and lower brain area. Would you say the sense that it's actually at the metaphor is reaching you at a more primitive, yes. deeper level? Yes, deeper level, more emotional and more primitive. Now this, okay, so you can see here that the, 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 the mass of action here is almost at the center and both hemispheres are activated. And this is actually the whole left brain, right brain thing that we hear is actually rubbish, okay? That's been completely debunked 
by contemporary neuroscience. It's not that some, the hemispheres aren't somewhat better, that the left hemisphere is somewhat better at rational analytical stuff, and the right hemisphere is more imagistic. That is true. But the notion that people are right-brained or left-brained is absolute rubbish because what that research was based on was a guy named Speary. And all of his research was done on people that had had an operation on their corpus callosum, which are the connections between the two hemispheres. So he was studying people that had no communication between the hemispheres of their brain. And that's where he came up with this left brain, right brain hypothesis. But when you put that into normal subjects that have an intact corpus callosum, it doesn't hold up any longer. So artists who are more right brained actually work more creatively and more artistically when their right hemisphere or their left hemisphere is also engaged. They've done studies on uh, math prodigies in Philadelphia that eventually go on to get, they, they, um, I can't, it's a GE scholarship or something like that, where it's a GE talent search. And so they try to actively go into all the public schools and try to tag who's going to be the brightest mathematician out of this group, and they put them through all sorts of tests once they're recommended by a teacher as being a possible subject. And then they did fMRI studies on these, and the, the kids who were the best at solving problems were not the left brain kids that had more activity in the left brain. It was the kids who had bilateral activation that could think creatively. So that's what you're seeing when, when any person reads Shakespeare, it activates a very different portion of the brain and the way the brain as a network is activated is bilateral. It's more towards the middle portion of the brain and moved back from the frontal activity. You know, the mention about the whole brain aspect, it reminded me uh, when I was in high school, I was doing like Algebra 2 or something like that. There was this problem I just couldn't figure out. And I was doing my homework before I went to bed, and I went to bed and had a dream that the dumbest kid in class asked me how to do this problem, and I told him. And in my dream, I'm like, that's it. I woke up, and sure enough, that was it. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be on the quizzes and, and tests. Uh, and, and it was, I, didn't, I couldn't solve it until that other aspect mm -hmm. engaged. And uh, the dumb part of me asked the other part <laughs> right. what the answer was. <laughs> right. I, I have that experience. I can't count the number of times I've had that experience when I'm, when I'm working actively on writing something and I can't quite figure out how to get a transition correct or I need a different metaphor. And every day at, in my office, I take a, like a 15, 20 minute nap at lunch every day without fail. And it is so astonishing how I wake up from that nap often with a new metaphor in mind or the way to make that transition it's really mind-boggling. So let's, let, let's listen to a little bit of what they're talking about uh, in terms of Shakespeare. So he makes interesting word combinations and misuses words in interesting ways. So how is this different than normal language? So Shakespeare takes adjectives and makes them into verbs. Thick my blood, the winter's tale. A pronoun is made into a noun, the cruelest she alive, from the twelfth night. A noun is made into a verb, he childed it as I fathered, from King Lear. These are the kind of things that 
uh, are called syntactic violations. But Davis' experiments show that instead of rejecting these, the brain accepts them and is excited by these grammatical oddities it is experiencing. While it has not been fully proven that we can localize which parts of the brain process nouns as opposed to verbs, Davis's research suggests that in the moment of hesitation brought on by the stimulative effect of the functional shift, the brain doesn't know what part to assign the word to. So that's the complexity. It's trying to sort out which category to put this in. What is at the heart of Shakespeare, he said, is the poet's capacity for lightning, uh, the, the poet's lightning fast capacity for forging metaphor that creates, quote, a theater of the brain. Now, again, to take this a little further, this sentence, a father and a gracious aged man, him have you enraged is nonsensical. Oh no, that's ordinary prose, I'm sorry. Ordinary prose. So the brain accepts it, but isn't excited by it. The next one, a father and a gracious aged man, him of you charcoal, is nonsensical, and the brain rejects it, still not excited by it. A father and a gracious aged man, him have you poured, Again, nonsensical, there's no metaphor in it, and the brain rejects it. The last one, a father and a gracious aged man, him have you matted. This is the one where, from King Lear where he takes an adjective and makes it into a verb. This is the one that would elicit that P600 wow effect response. Davis... Uh, Less in less scientific language, says that uh, reading Shakespeare is like your brain on a rocket booster. Or your brain lights up like a Christmas tree when it engages metaphor. So this thing that Jung made the center of all of his work, this focus on archetype, this focus on dream, uh, this focus on symbol, all of these things are intimately interwoven, and the central moving figure in that is metaphor. Reading poetry is especially beneficial because it causes readers to reflect on their own experiences and connect to what they've read. Now here's a little bit more interesting stuff. The somatosensory cortex. This is the part of our brain that processes texture. So what you're seeing here, the yellow and red sections are referred to as the somatosensory cortex. You can see they're all on the outer side of the brain. And these are the regions of the brain activated by sensory experience. If I touch this grill, I'm activating these areas of the brain because there's a particular texture. Same thing, anything that has texture to it is going to elicit a stronger response. Now the green areas are the regions of the brain activated by textural metaphor. Just hearing something that has a texture to it activates the same area of the brain that responds to touch. Now, it's a very simple thing. They, these are just two sample sentences. They had a number of these that had similar linguistic meaning that in ordinary speech, we could substitute one for other and we'd kind of have the same understanding attached. I had a bad day. I had a rough day. Pretty close in meaning, but one, the first one, does not activate the somatosensory cortex, then the second one does. So this is further support for the notion that metaphor activates the brain 
out of its typical response pattern when metaphor is introduced. That's why it's critical for us to listen below the surface communications of our patients, if we're therapists, and for the metaphor embedded within their speech, and why it's critical for us to speak in metaphorical language. In a sense, all effective interpretation is metaphoric because it makes a translation from one level of meaning to another. That's why supportive, affirmative, and reflective communications in therapy are beneficial to the relationship, but they're not transformative in and of themselves. Can you say that one more time? Okay, that supportive, affirmative, mirroring, reflective statements made by the therapist to their patient are facilitative of the relationship, but they're not transformative in and of themselves because they're not using the metaphor. So the warm, uh, supportive, accepting relationship is necessary, but it's not alone sufficient for transformation to take place. Now, metaphor doesn't exist alone. Metaphor is obviously connected to imagination, and like we talked about yesterday, for those who were here, reverie. Uh, which is simply kind of a dreamy state of mind uh, where instead of being focused on, like, let's say, I've got to go to the grocery store and I've got to make sure I get this and this and this, that's not a non-reverie state of mind. A reverie state of mind may mean you're focused on one thing, but other thoughts are permitted to come in, other sensations are permitted to come in. Like if you're laying on the couch and you don't have the TV on, but you're not sleepy, but you're resting. Or like if you're watching the clouds go by on a summer day and you're thinking about the shapes in the clouds, but those thoughts don't, don't push other thoughts out of the way. So metaphor, imagination, and reverie are three interrelated processes which underlie the analyst's fundamental stance in analytic therapy and create the potential for change in the analytic process and provide the foundation for creative experience. Imagination is the basic ability to form images or thought pictures, that is, links between the thing and the thought, hence the capacity to imagine, to visualize, to represent all that is experienced through either an image or a word. Furthermore, the, the images in one person can evoke via words images in the mind of the other person. Hence, it's both an individual and a reciprocal or intersubjective process. Modell says, metaphor evokes the construction of imagined possibilities. So that's the link between the two. Metaphor stimulates imagination or encourages us to move to an imaginal space, just like these exercises we did with the films. Henry Corbin, who wrote a well-known paper called the Mundus Imaginalis, says that imagination is the magical intermediary between thought and being that imagination is the incarnation of thought in image and the presence of the image in being. He goes on to refer to an imaginal order of reality that he refers to as the mundus imaginalis. To him, it's a visionary state, an intermediary state between waking and sleeping. It is a spiritual reality not located anywhere, but yet which envelops material reality. We might think of Neumann's term, unitary reality, from last night as being an equivalent sort of term. It is a world of image that is real, is as real as the world of the senses and that of the intellect. It has its own faculty of perception, imaginative power. It is distinct from uh, the Western notion of fantasy, which Corbin describes as nothing more than an outpouring of imaginings. It is a world of subtle bodies, a transcendental concept involving the relationship between mind and body or between pure spirit and material body. 
Now, the, the movie Inception is kind of a movie that tries to touch on the mundus imaginalis, where the levels of reality are blurred and that it's difficult to tell for the what they call the jumpers, uh, which whether they're dreaming or no longer dreaming. And because they're jumping back and forth between different levels, they don't know whether they've jumped back to reality or whether they're at a different dream level. And so it's a very creative imagining of this multi-leveled layers of experience that are always going on in and, us and around us, of which we're both part of and which we're in. And that's what I think Corbin is trying to articulate in this notion of the mundus imaginalis, the mind of the imagination. That kind of makes me think of Trump's butterfly dream. Uh, uh, Jones had dreamt that he was a butterfly fluttering among the garden, uh, and then he woke, and he wondered if he was Johnson who dreamt he was a butterfly. Ah. A butterfly dreaming he was Johnson. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a psychoanalyst recently deceased named James Grotstein, uh, and who was a, a kind of a, a reinterpreter of Wilfred Bion, who I mentioned earlier, and he's got a book called who is the dreamer that dreams the dream? You know, we think of ourselves as having a dream, and yet Grotstein's pointing out that there's a dreamer dreaming the dream within the dreamer. Reminds me of uh, Jung's sensation of the guru-like image mm -hmm. that we saw. I, I, was that in a dream? I believe it was. Yeah. Philemon? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so Jung took those experiences. That's, that's part of where he comes up with this notion of psychic reality. He tried to take Philemon's, um, the interactions with Philemon, not as facts of, oh, this is what I should do, but as real, quote, in quotes, interactions. It's hard to get away from this distinct, just like it's hard to get away from the mind-body split, it's hard to get away, find new language that no longer makes a distinction between real and imaginary if imaginary is real, right? That the level of imagination is a real experience. I always think of the one that looked kind of like a, a yogin sitting, mm. and um, in which Jung said something like, he was the dream of the yogin. Uh huh, and he like he puts that. the yogin on the on the square block of stone that sits in the courtyard at Bollingen. Yeah. Okay. I, can't, I can't remember if it's Adrian Corbin, but um, he wrote a book about uh, within the Sufi tradition, and I think he may be more particularly in the Shia Sufi tradition. Um, there, uh, an equivalent of two active imagination, which I believe he called create. No, creative imagination. Mm. I can't remember exactly the term mm -hmm. out of it, but um, he talks about an entire tradition uh, of that mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a, almost a practice that is very analogous to uh, active imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jung admits that he takes a lot of um, uh, his, his theory of active ad imagination from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, which is another meditative imaginal practice that's, you know, obviously couched in Christian theology, but it's still an imaginal exercise. Okay. Um, here's Shakespeare on imagination from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And as imagination bodies forth... The forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination. You know, there's, there's books out uh, that uh, articulate uh, Shakespeare's influence on language usage, and it's just astounding the impact that one person had 
and it's probably the only other bit of literature that has had as a profound effect on particularly Western culture is the Bible. There, there's, there's similar books about, you know, there's all of these phrases that are in our common usage that people have lost the connection that they originated in the Bible. Just everyday speech. Everyday yeah. speech. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna, we're starting to run down on time and I wanna get, I'm gonna skip this. Verena Cast, who has a wonderful book called Imagination is the Space of Freedom, uh, says the space of imagination is the space of freedom, a space in which an entirely natural manner, in an entirely natural manner, boundaries are crossed, space and time relativized, and the possibilities we no longer or do not yet have are made available to experience. While the space of imagination is the space of memory, it is also the primary, primarily the space of the future brought into the present and made relevant. In a way, that little vignette from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is about creating a space of freedom where there was pre previously only constriction, imprisonment, that even inside this imprisoned event, Mac's character created a space for imagination to exist. And that, that sentence as he's walking out of the shower room, at least I fucking tried. As though Shank Redemption, to talk about the uh, you know the character Red talking about the guy being institutionalized. Yeah, that the prison is now here. That they have been in the institution for so long that they can't help <laughs> but. Yeah, he says, "Man, I've been in this prison since I was 17 years old. I don't know any other way to be," and he's terrified of leaving the prison. And it takes this, again, like in that One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it takes a tremendous amount of courage for Red to decide to accept the invitation to leave. Marina Cast has a wonderful YouTube video on active imagination. Oh, okay. Okay. So look for that. Uh, Cast is a, an amazing uh, and generous woman. Uh, comment on first of all this in terms of the education in today's world where we see i think a tremendous amount of kids as add and we see that in the disease process where a lot of uh, a lot of imagination a lot of <coughs> that is undisciplined mm -hmm. we seemingly in culture have decided that uh, that's something we should medicate and get rid of mm -hmm. um I'm of two minds about it, um, you know, of whether there, there's certain things that go along with ADD that are potentially, uh, they, ADD itself, if you accept it as a diagnosis, uh, I have a son who's ADD uh, and I accept the diagnosis. I think stimulant medications are probably overprescribed for children who are not ADD that are simply a behavioral problem uh, and their activity and their lack of focus becomes problematic for the parents and the parents want a solution to that and they seek a medical problem with that. Uh, my son was not able to focus was not able to use the in, utilize the intellect he had available to him. Uh, and over time, when it's not addressed, either in some sort of uh, therapy or medically, there is a problem that develops socially. ADD kids are not good at attending to social cues. And when you fail to learn social cues. There's windows of opportunity in terms of developmental windows that just like language, if you miss the developmental window for language, you're unlikely to develop language. Studies on feral children bear this out. 
Um, so I'm of two minds. I agree that there is a rush to medicalize something, uh, but there are kids that certainly benefit from and need medication, but that also the medication has its own set of uh, side effects that are not pleasant. Uh, and my son resents aspects of that experience. He's no longer on, he's an adult and no longer on ADD medications. Uh, but I'm not sure that he would have completed school had he not had a period of time on ADD medications. Okay. I'm going to skip this. I want to go to the neuroscience of imagination now, just briefly. This isn't quite as involved as the other one. Okay, this is the typical active thinking mode. Okay, this is if you're planning your next project at work, planning a trip, you know, planning your grocery store visit. This is the brain in reverie without a specific, what they call this the task specific mode, TSP or TSM. Uh, and this is the DMN, the default mode network. And you can see that very different areas of the brain are activated in these two. It's activated in very different ways would be a better way of saying it in these two snapshots. Now, this is a, a kind of an artist rendering. This is, these two images are people who are suffering from PTSD. And these are the areas of the, uh, when they're, what happens to the default mode network with PTSDs, and these are normal controls. This blue area is the primary interconnective aspects of the brain, how the network is getting formed. So there's lo local areas of the brain that are active, but they need to be connected in order to perform their function. So these blue areas are kind of the connectivity areas, and you can see that um, in the PTSD patients, it's either non-existent or it's much more limited in people who have suffered trauma. Now, this isn't just personal traumas. This can also be natural disasters. Now, the problem is, is that we need time in the default mode network both to regenerate and to permit space for creativity. Even scientists who are doing very logical oriented work have to have time away from that work in the default mode network in order for that work to actually be creative. How are you defining default mode network? That's a term the neuroscientists came up with and what it, it's the, the, the brain at rest but not sleepy without a specific task in mind. So people who engage in meditation are usually activating the default mode network. People who engage in Tai Chi and yoga, who are fairly fluid practitioners of those things, who don't have to think much about the postures, usually move into a default mode network during activation, during their, their period of exercise, okay? Again, if we, hooked, if we managed to find a way to hook somebody up to an fMRI machine while they were watching the clouds, we would see the default mode network. If you were at the library doing research, we would not see much default mode network going on. So this is... Uh, connectivity dysregulation following earthquake. The findings were decreased functional connectivity means at the very least that the way in which these parts of the brain interact with each other has changed. These effects were observed at a time about 
25 days after the earthquake. So some of these things get regenerated and the fault mode network comes back online. But if we don't have space in our lives, you know, if we're always on our phones or our computers or in front of the television, we don't have space for the default mode network. And gradually over time, our capacity to enter into those states becomes compromised. The more time we spend in those activities, other activities that prevent that, we're essentially conditioning our brains to operate in a task-specific mode rather than a default mode. And what we have to do is be able to maintain a balance between those. So I was talking this morning with Roger uh, at breakfast, and um, you know I'm glad that I've got a job that requires me to be on it as a therapist. I'm unable to look at my phone or my computer for 50 minute segments of time, eight hours a day. Uh, so it builds in a space for me to be unaffected by that and to be only focused on what's happening in me and what's happening with another person. You say there's a relationship with the idea of the default mode and psychotherapy and specifically the emergence of insight or something? Yes, I would say that people who are the most affected by therapy and most transformed by it are the people who are able to move into a default mode network which is why I often suggest people lie on the couch, not look at me, because when they're looking at me, they are often more in a social interaction modality, which can still be very task specific. And they're processing my visual, their, their visual cues about my changes in expression. And lying on the couch looking forward allows them to move into more of a default mode network and simply lying down encourages more movement into the default mode network. So these are just a few suggestions for people who are therapists. Give permission to your patients to imagine, not explicitly, but by saying things like, can you imagine? Have you ever imagined? What would it be like if? Do you have an image that comes to mind when you feel this way? Do you have an image that comes to mind when you think about this? Can you go to a place where? Where in your body do you? These are all ways of in inviting imaginal movement rather than why did you do that? What did you think about that? Those sorts of uh, wordings, languaging, questions, uh, doesn't invite the movement into the imaginal. When appropriate, use words which convey images, the language of the poet, not the rationalist. Try not to literalize or get too caught up in the surface meaning of the patient's words. Listen for the undercurrents, the, ex the, the meaning between the lines. Or as a guy named Theodore Reich said, listen with the third ear. Learn to stick with the image, play with it, twist it around, find other images that fit with it, and broaden it. Okay because I want to leave sufficient space. We're going to watch one, maybe two short films. Because, and just a trigger warning, these films are emotionally intense. Okay, They're not graphic, but they're emotionally intense. So if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, it, it, it might be better not to watch. I'm going to have to just do a quick... Which intrigues us to do so. Yeah. <laughs> do we want people to have paper have now? No. No, we don't need paper yet. Um, we're just going to talk, and we may not even get time to do the paper things. Oh. Is that... No, I don't want that to happen. Is that your guitar, by the way? 
Yes, that is. I have one just like this. The Gretsch Honey Dripper. Okay, I'm hoping, you know, when they went to Windows 10, uh, they completely messed with how to do videos. And I have to reset the screen to second screen only. Okay, there we go. And then I have to turn around and move the cursor <laughs> like this, which is disorienting. And then go over here and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we turn down the lights a bit? This is, these are two films by a woman named M. Cooper, who I was fortunate to meet when we shared a panel in New York at something called Art and Psyche. And this one is called A Confusion of Tongues. And it's based off of a paper that uh, Sandor Ferenzi wrote in 1927 about his pa adult patients who had experienced some sort of sexual trauma or physical trauma as children. It's not working. The frame isn't moving. And this worked perfectly naturally at home. Yeah. Let's try a different movie and see if that I think it's interesting the effect of the sound yes just oh I hope we can up. make this work okay okay at least we're back on this I even tried to embed these in the PowerPoint and couldn't get them to embed. Can you describe what happened? To the well, no, it's it's completely in effect um, because she mixes live drama with oil painting on glass and blends the. It's always blending in out of live drama with the oil painting, so you get this real sense of interaction between the effect uh, of the blurring of levels of reality and you're left very much with this feeling of I don't know what's going on and you're forced to hold this negative capacity uh, of what's happening. Okay, so we'll go on with out that and just talk a bit about cultivating the imagination, which Jung talks about, somebody's already mentioned, active imagination. Jung termed the, cultiva the active cultivation of one's relationship to one's inner world active imagination. His inspiration for active imagination seems to stem mainly from the work of alchemy and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. Much of this grew out of his own interior processes that resulted in the Red Book. However, he considered active imagination as an activity developed late in analysis to continue the dialogue with the unconscious after analysis ended. So here's just a few of his thoughts on active imagination. It is an undeniable psychological fact that the more one concentrates on one's unconscious contents, the more they become charged with energy they become vitalized, as if illuminated from within. In fact, they turn into something like a substitute reality. In analytical psychology, we make methodological use of this phenomenon. I have called the method active imagination. Ignatius Loyola also made use of active imagination in his Exercita. There is evidence that something similar was used in the meditations of alchemical philosophy. This substitute reality, would you say that that's 
uh, analogous to what Corbin was trying to do. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. He goes on to say that the imaginatio is to be understood here as the real and literal power to create images. The classical use of the word in contrast to fantasia, which means a mere conceit in the sense of insubstantial thought. Now I find uh, that some of my patients, I work in the South, and there's still a strong influence of the fundamentalist church there, and even the word fantasy is sometimes somewhat frightening for people. And they often have a, they make an equivalence between fantasy and sexual fantasy, as though all fantasy is sexual fantasy. As Verena Cass says, imagining begins with an image that preoccupies us. So this is a way I think we can bring this out of the analytic consulting room and into our daily lives is just simply attending to things that capture us even momentarily. Oh, I wish I had an image of it. I, when, when I was in Albuquerque uh, a few years ago uh, doing an evaluation on a psychoanalytic institute there, and I'm out for a morning run, and it's still dark out. And there's this dis... Uh, uh, this doll head that's sitting in the road by the curb, but looking up over the curb. And I'm jogging down this street, and it's like this image captures me so much so that I stopped and took a picture of it. Um, but it's, it's like it felt so strange to see this uh, beheaded doll head sitting on the curb, but looking up in what seemed very intently and in this kind of a little bit strange atmosphere in a town I don't know well, on a street I've never been down before, in the dark, the only other people out are the, peop the guys on a garbage truck going around empty emptying dumpsters. It was just so surreal. But that's a little, that's what she's talking about. Whether it comes from within, you know, through a dream or a fantasy that occurs, or something that happens in our exterior life that somehow feels like, I don't know why, but I'm connected to this thing. Another time I was uh, jogging down a street near my house and uh, the street has a canopy where both trees on both sides come and touch in the center. And I'm jogging down, and it's not fall quite yet, so most of the leaves are green, but as I'm jogging, this one leaf detaches itself and starts to spin to the ground in like a helicopter blade fashion, just like this. And on one side it was deep verdant green, and on one side bright yellow, on the underside bright yellow. And it was like a tunnel. All of a sudden I was running through a tunnel and all I could see was this one singular leaf. And I'm like in this moment, and then the leaf hits the ground, and all of a sudden it dissipates, and I'm no longer in communion with this leaf. It was such a strange experience. But those are the kind of things that I think we have to let work on us to be living life in an engaged way, whether it's poems that jump out to us, something about a particular rose in that particular arrangement of roses behind us. Often it's in I think in the specificity, uh, the uniqueness, the individuality of something that often we're brought up by. Uh, I love Francis Bacon's paintings because he represent he he confronts us with uh, a particular view of life that's distorted, but present in what we don't want to see. <laughs> Uh, so he uses the distortions of physical proportion in his paintings to make us look at 
these areas of life in a way similar to the way Lucian Freud does with his paintings that are hyper-realistic, where you see every blemish, every little crevice, every mole on the bodies of his models, and often his models are not attractive people. If you look, if you go home and you look up Lucian Freud and you look at the painting Big Annie, uh, it's, qu it's quite different to be, and Big Annie is naked, reclining on a couch. And it's quite different to be confronted with her corpulence that we wouldn't normally look at with such a close examining eye. Uh, is it kind of like cognitive dissonance? That's a good way of identifying, yeah, that things that create cognitive dissonance for us, I would say that's one of the qualities that can make something stand out to us. And if we move towards them rather than move away from them, that deepens something in us. So let's, um, we've got about, we're supposed to end at 1.15 or, okay. We've got enough time to do some of these exercises then. So if you'll grab something to write with, although this first one you may not have to write it. This is a fill in the blank metaphor. So we're gonna create some metaphors. And the first one is blue paint spilled on the road like, what comes to mind for you? You can use one word or several words, whatever comes up. Blue paint, oh, it's not on the screen, is it? Blue paint spilled on the road like. Okay. Yeah, we'll put these up on the board. Yeah, well you can just shout them out as you... Waterfall. Sky, what? Like blood. Now there, here's an association: blue bloods. Okay. Windy air. Windy air. <coughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Again, these these are not instructional. They're just to play with, to experience the play of metaphor. Canceled checks blank the subway like. Subway car. Oh yes, the subway car. Canceled checks blank the subway car like. Can't. <laughs> Wishes?
guilt? Ah, wordplay. Now, see, that's fun to that's complete somebody else. Cancel checks layered the subway car like it does. So it's interesting that the, the both canceled checks and subway car both have a kind of a strong pull in a way uh, perhaps even more so than blue paint spilled on the road like it seems like canceled checks and subway are pulling more strongly for certain types of responses and there was a, a kind of a greater variety of response to the first one than the second Graffiti blank the building, the abandoned building like. Street like old dress. I, I changed the word, but graffiti splattered the abandoned building with forgotten trees, or with broken trees. So we all have particular associations to graffiti, that it's a particular type of art, a particular type of expression that again pulls for certain things in, uh, we could say, darker, the dark, that graffiti suggests something darker in some of the responses that are appearing over here right now. Let's play a different game. This game is one sentence metaphors. So I'm going to give you three words and you come up with one sentence that includes all three words. Ballet, hot, gloomy. My marker awaits you. Ballet turns the cool, gloomy night hot. Oh, why not just hot? I mean, there's a, a, a shift in that from that the, uh, the ballet acting on the gloomy night that transitions to hot. It's hot is different than gloomy. And right. So the ball, we can feel the ballet working on the night, creating a transformation. The hot ballet dancer was despondent <laughs> The hot ballet dancer was despondent
on the what? Hot sweltering leaves. Go do it again. Breeze uh, danced through the leaves in a gloomy ballet. Yeah, so here it's interesting also that depending on what you, what the focus is, whether it's on the ballet, the hot, uh, or the gloomy, and kind of in the, what, what the focus is leading with, and you can see how it moves around depending on who's creating the metaphor. Psalm, song, captivity, drug. Drug me out of captivity. <laughs> How about drugs are the song of captivity? <laughs> Can you change the form of the word, like captivate? Yeah. Why not? Some captivated me like a drug. Ooh. Yeah, she asked permission to do that first, though. Okay. No, I wouldn't do something like this with a client. It's just an effort to. Uh, these these are exercises that often are done in writers' workshops. Uh, to just get people more fluid with working with metaphor, seeing how many different ways it can come in, how many different ways it can be approached. The effort, the emphasis is on the play with the metaphor so that metaphor, working metaphorically becomes easier, more fluid, uh, that sort of thing. Well, I mean, like the example provided by the workshop with uh, art Mm -hmm. Oh, it's conceivable, certainly. There's whole uh, art therapy, expressive art therapists use this sort of thing. They'll, uh, they'll, they've got their own language for talking about it, but they basically prescribe exercises in session to try to get at certain experiences. Uh, so they might say, and, and they'll, some people only work in one medium, like they'll have their office set up for painting or they'll have their office set up for drawing or they might have clay available, uh, things like that. Some people do uh, poetic, encourage their patients to do poetic work, but they try to keep the 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 at the emphasis on technique low so they try to create exercises 
that people can be expressive without being intimidated and frightened by producing something good. Uh, so they'll try to, they'll say, could, could you just put some color up on this paper that might express what you're feeling right now? Or if somebody talks about, uh, I'm feeling deep grief, but I don't have any words for it, and they say, well, could you paint your grief? Something like that. Music therapists do the same thing, except they use more of an improvisational technique and somewhat more of a leading technique in that the patient will be talking about something and then they'll give the patient an instrument often that doesn't require technical skill to play like something like a rhythm instrument for example uh, or something that uses mallets of any kind where they can just hit notes and they, there's not a technique uh, or a, a strong technique in creating the note and they'll, the music therapist will actually begin an improvisation often on the piano, sometimes the guitar, and then they'll ask the patient to respond to, Im improvisationally to the thing that they've played and then eventually they're moving back and forth together. And so those are kind of the, they're, they're at really asking their patients to uh, use metaphor through the medium of art or music to get at certain experiences. Now, I don't do that because I strictly uh, do interpretive analysis, and but I've got other ways that I think uh, that activate imagination, metaphor, uh, fantasy, and will uh, say, they'll tell me something and I'll say, do you have a fantasy behind that? You know, what, what do you imagine is going to happen if you were to do that? You know, somebody's taught, usually it's around taking on a new behavior in their life, for example. And they'll say, well, I'm frightened to go in and ask for a raise. And I'll say, well, tell me more about that. Tell, but I don't approach it from the logical side of why they're frightened. to go. I'm not interested in what they think about what the boss is literally going to say in response. I'm interested in what narrative they've created inside, and I've got ways of interacting with patients that encourage them to share with me that behind-the-scenes narrative that's influencing that. But if somebody brings in, I've had patients bring in their own materials, and sometimes they do artwork during sessions. Uh, Sometimes they'll bring in poems they've written or just songs that they've heard that they want me to hear with them at the same time. It comes in in all sorts of different ways. Okay. Let's do one more exercise and then we'll just wrap up. So... These are, it's called Metaphors Run Wild. Pick one word out of this list of words, and in three minutes, see how many different ways you can find metaphors to express that one word. So this is on volume, not quality, or quant this is on qu quantity, volume, of just to have an experience of how many ways can I express honor? How many images come to mind about honor? Sloth, knowledge, beauty, empathy, ignorance, wisdom, tranquility, or the void? You don't mean association. They could. I'd rather have you craft a metaphor that gets at one of these. Not simply associations, although you may have a metaphor in one of your associations. Similes okay. Similes okay. Okay. I'm not going to write down all of these, so let's just offer to blurt out uh, the first three on your list. Ocean of wisdom, fount of wisdom, the fertile ground of wisdom. Okay. Words like depth, span. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and empathy. Empathy is like soft butter waiting to melt the cold heart. Mm. Empathy was powder. Yeah. Empathy was like soft butter waiting to melt the cold heart. Um, empathy was music to her relationship with the dying woman. Um, empathy was the dance that brought two strangers together. Hmm. Lovely. I'll go. Uh, to have honor, no, honor is hard earned and easily lost. Honor cannot reside where power is in ascendance. Honor has lost its value in the city of half truths. Honor blesses as avarice derides. Wisdom. Wisdom. Why is Mm. Almost like a haiku. Mm -hmm. Yeah, haiku is a wonderful way to get into poetry because it gives you such a structure to help boundary the efforts that in some way that alleviates some of the anxiety. Honor. Uh, write the truthful letter mm. to vow. With human flowing wealth. Hmm. Yeah. Full space never fills, but always empties. Hmm. Lovely. All right. Well, let's take just a couple of. Oh, Joe. <laughs> you think you come to sloth. Sadness. Slow and careful, unique niche, niche, ecologically sound. Hmm. Interesting. So if we were a bit more slothful, we might. <laughs> yeah, this whole emphasis on uh, needing to have growth is quite uh, a problem to solve, isn't it? I just don't know the uh, I don't know the technical definitions. Somebody asked me about that earlier. Uh, like metaphor is. Mm -hmm. So like as a simile and metaphor is. I mean, if you want to get to the syntax. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then analogy is. So, it's a little more, see, I think they're all metaphorical in nature, so simile and analogy are close enough for me. Uh, I tried, I used to have those definitions in the presentation, and I took them out because it seemed like people got confused about them. Uh, so I haven't focused on, uh, and then there's another word, uh, and somebody may correct my pronunciation, metanoi me, which is, like metaphor, except instead of focusing on similarity, it focuses on uh, utilizing a characteristic as the whole of a thing. So like business executives wear suits. So then we shorten that to say suits to represent everything about business executives. That's metanoimi. And so like when... Yeah, white coats, the crown, to refer all, not just to the monarchy, but all activities of the monarchy and our, all possessions of the monarchy. Things like that, that are like, are, are using metaphor-like qualities. Uh, so I, I lump all of those things tragically together uh, in, <laughs> in one big thing, metaphor. All right, are there any closing comments or observations or? I have a couple of questions, um, just real quick ones. Um, Vavoda and Borbley, do you, um, I'm not familiar with them. Do you have their first names? And 
Yeah, they're in the psychoanalytic literature, but if you'll shoot me an email, and you can easily find me online, Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark Winborn.com, and shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to send those to you. And with the, uh, neuro, the neuroscience of metaphor, are those found on PubMed, or do you have a, can I, do you have like the information on, like a, can I email you for like the actual study? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Did I understand yesterday morning that you were going to send to Mike the information on therapeutic outcomes? Yep. Thank you. And have you published this paper? No, this one's not been published. Uh, no, but there's only... <laughs> they, there's only so much time in the day, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of things I'd like to publish, but I just don't have time to when I'm writing other things that uh, I'm getting published. Uh, yeah. So I do. I have written several things on aesthetics. Uh, I've got a couple of papers out on one's called the aesthetics of being, and one's called the aesthetic of the analytic interaction. Uh, and they're, they're not necessarily about metaphor, but aesthetics itself, in a way, is a, a, a metaphoric lens to look at uh, different experiences that we don't often think of therapeutically. We don't think of therapy as being aesthetic or non-aesthetic, uh, but there are very aesthetic elements that help, can help inform uh, the analytic process. Is that video with the frame the boy and the... YouTube. Um, I'm sure there's a title for it. I don't know whether I've saved the title. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Uh, it's done by... Uh, Again, if you'll send me an email, I'll send you the link. It's contemporary. Premier, uh, it's in French, but it's Don's Contemporain, the Mirror de Alexander Desplat. If you just put in, when I did it, to get it on YouTube, I just put in um, the ESTA video, and I did it in Man. Man in the mirror. Yeah. That's the video. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your interaction and your attention.